Chapter 8 After our exertions and our triumph the previous day, even Emerson was in no hurry to return to work. He allowed us to eat breakfast without mentioning more than twice that we were delaying him. Nefret's hair glittered and blew about as it always did after she'd washed it. She had spent quite a long time in the bath chamber the night before, removing not only dust and perspiration, but a more intangible stain. To a woman of her sensitive temperament, the mere touch of such a man would be a contamination, and I had a feeling she had, for obvious reasons, minimised the unpleasantness of the encounter. She looked none the worse for her most recent adventure, however, and as soon as Fatima left the room, she returned to the subject that we had left undecided the previous night. I promised Sophia I'd spend the afternoon at the clinic. There are several cases requiring surgery. I'll stop by the bankers before I go there and... No, you will not, said Emerson, spreading gooseberry jam on a piece of bread. I will go to the bank this evening. But, sir, the responsibility is mine, Emerson said. For once, Nefret did not continue the argument. Cupping her chin in her hands, elbows on the table, she studied Emerson intently. What precisely are you paying for, then? It's a large sum, as you said. Emerson was ready for the question and was able to give an honest, if not entirely comprehensive, answer. You remember what Russell told us the night we dined with him? It appears that he was right. Bordani is collaborating with the enemy. Side, or whatever his name may be, must be one of Wardani's lieutenants. What I hope to get for my money is the name of the German or Turkish agent with whom they have been dealing. Nefret nodded. That's what I thought. He would be a big fish, wouldn't he? Or she, said Ramses. I'm surprised, Nefret, to find you so ready to dismiss your own sex from consideration. Nefret's lip curled. A woman wouldn't hold such an important position. The Turks and the Germans and all the rest of the male population of the world think they're only good for wheedling information out of the men they seduce. After a moment, she added, Present company accepted. Hmm, said Emerson. We've known a few women who are good for more than that. What's the use of speculating? We will know tomorrow. Come and give me a hand, Ramses. I want to have a closer look at the statue before we leave for Giza. The statue stood where the men had left it, still swathed in its wrappings. After these were removed, we all stood in admiring silence for a time. The statue was an idealized image of a man who was also a god, and it radiated dignity. The sure outlines of eyes and mouth, the perfectly proportioned torso and arms, were in the best traditions of old kingdom sculpture. Some authorities believe that Egyptian art attained its highest perfection in this period. At that moment, I would have agreed with them. It's beautiful, Nefret murmured. I suppose it'll go to the museum. Undoubtedly, Ramses replied. Unless we can come up with something even finer that Quibble might be persuaded to take instead. No chance of that, Emerson grunted. If we had half a dozen of them, he might let us have one. We won't find any more, though. Don't you want me to take photographs? Nefret asked. Later. Collect your arsenal, Peabody, and let's go. I had to retrieve my sword parasol from Jamal, the gardener, who also acted as handyman. He was Selim's second or third cousin, once or twice removed. A slender stripling, as handsome as Selim, but without the latter's ambition and energy. I had explained to him about my parasol release sticking, and he had assured me it would be child's play for a man of his expertise to fix it. I tested it, of course, and was pleased and surprised to find that it was now working properly. Selim and the rest of the crew were at the site when we arrived. Nefret left us soon after midday, by which time the men had reached bedrock. The cut blocks lining the shaft ended there, but the shaft went on down into the underlying stone of the plateau. It cannot be much further, Selim said, hopefully. Like myself, he was getting tired of sifting endless baskets of sand and rubble, which contained not so much as a scrap of pottery. Bah! said my husband. It could be another two metres, or three, or four, or... Selim groaned. And, said Emerson remorselessly, 
you will have to set a guard tonight, and every succeeding night until we have finished with the burial chamber. After the find we made yesterday, every ambitious thief in the area will want to have a go at it. But we have found nothing else, Selim said. Only the statue. Yes, said Emerson. We went on for a few more hours without reaching the bottom of the shaft, glancing at the sun, from whose position he could tell time almost as accurately as he read a watch. Emerson called a halt to the work. When I expressed my surprise, for surely we now could not be far from the burial chamber, he gave me a sour look. We have an errand in the city, in case you've forgotten. I must say it would be a pleasant change to have one season without these confounded distractions. I ignored this complaint, which I'd heard often. And after we have done our errand, I inquired, giving him a meaningful look. I don't know what the devil you mean, said Emerson grumpily. I do, said Ramses, who just joined us. And the answer is no, mother. I've already told Fatima I'll be dining out this evening, alone. Oh, is that what you meant? Emerson beetled his brows at me. The answer is no, Peabody. Naturally, I did not intend to let them bully me. I bided my time, however, until after we'd bathed and changed. Nefret hadn't returned. After the customary squawks and squeals and misconnections, I managed to ring through to the hospital. She was still in surgery, where she'd been all afternoon. That was what I'd hoped to hear. She would return to the house when she was finished and was not likely to go out again. Long sessions of surgery left her wrung out physically and sometimes emotionally as well. When I joined Emerson and Ramses, I discovered that they'd arrived at a compromise, as Emerson termed it. We would all dine out together and then Ramses would go on to wherever he was going. It makes good sense, you see, Emerson explained. In what way? Pretending he hadn't heard, Emerson hastily got into the driver's seat. I ordered Ramses to sit in the tonneau next to me and subjected him to a searching inspection. He was looking very nice, I thought, except for a certain lumpiness about the fit of his coat. It could not be bandages. At his emphatic request, and because the healing process was proceeding nicely, I had reduced them in size. Are you carrying a firearm? I inquired. Good God, no. The last thing I want to do is shoot someone. Take mine, then. I reached into my handbag. No, thank you. He caught hold of my wrist. That little ladysmith of yours is one of the most ineffective weapons ever invented. I cannot imagine how you ever managed to hit anything with it. I usually don't, I admitted. But if someone has you in a death grip, a knife is more efficient. Anyhow, the trick is to put the other fellow out of commission before he gets hold of you. Mother, what else have you got in that satchel? It's four times the size of your usual evening bag. Before I could prevent him, he had inserted his hand. As I suspected, he said, pulling out a fold of rusty black cloth. You're not going with me tonight, so put the idea out of your head. How would it look for what Dunny to bring a woman with him? Tell me where you're going, then, and what you expect will occur. Very well. In my surprise, I inhaled a bit of my veiling and had to extract it from my mouth before I spoke. What? No argument? Since you already know more than you ought, said my son, it's only sensible to tell you what more you need to know. We three will be seen dining in public and leaving the hotel together. I will slip away, and you and father will go directly home. The rendezvous is the ruined mosque near Burkhardt's grave. Father knows the place, and you needn't come along to protect me. David will be there, in safe concealment. He refused to let me go alone. God bless the boy, I murmured. Let us hope he will, said Ramses. We went first to the bank, which was on the Sharia Qasr el Nil. The transaction did not take long. None of Emerson's transactions take long. When we came out, Emerson was carrying my satchel, as Ramses had termed it. A thousand pounds in gold is of considerable weight. It was only a short drive from the bank to the Savoy Hotel, where, as Emerson now condescended to inform me, we were dining. 
I did not ask him why, since he would have told me a pack of lies, and I had no doubt his true motive would become apparent in due course. The Savoy was favoured by the best people of Cairo officialdom, and by British officers. I believe that none of the persons present will ever forget the sight of Emerson striding into the Savoy, carrying a large black satin handbag trimmed with jet beads. Few men but Emerson would have done it. No man but Emerson could have done it with such a plum. After we'd been shown to a table, he put the handbag on the floor under the table and planted both feet firmly upon it. Are you trying to provoke someone into robbing us? I inquired. You might as well have held up a placard announcing we have something of value in that bag. Yes, said Emerson, opening his menu. Not much likelihood of that, Ramsay said. No robber would rob the father of curses, <clears throat> said Emerson, glowering at him over the menu. Another of Dowd's sayings, not one of his best. He beckoned imperiously to the waiter. After we'd got through the business of ordering our meals, he planted his elbows on the table and looked curiously round the room. Not all of the tables were occupied. The hour was early for the best people. The only ones I recognised were Lord Edward Cecil and several of his set. Catching Lord Edward's eye, I nodded, and the gentleman hastily wiped the grin off his face. "'Who are those people with Cecil?' Emerson inquired. I told him the names, which would be no more to my reader than they did to Emerson. "'And that fellow who's smirking at Cecil?' he asked. "'His name is Aubrey Herbert,' Ramsay said one of Woolley's and Lawrence's associates. He was once honorary attaché in Constantinople. You know him? Emerson demanded. I've met him. A spark of amusement shone in Ramsay's half-veiled eyes. I've been informed that he considers me frightfully underbred. The opinions of such persons should not concern you, I said indignantly. I assure you, Mother, they don't. May I ask, Father, what prompts your interest in him? I'm looking for someone, said Emerson. Who? That fellow Hamilton. You know him, don't you, Ramses? You can point him out. I don't see him, Ramses said. What made you suppose he would be here? He lives in the Savoy, doesn't he? I know. Emerson pushed his chair back. I'll send up my card. And off he went, fumbling in his pockets. Why this sudden interest in Major Hamilton? I asked Ramses, nodding at the waiter to serve the soup. There was no sense in waiting for Emerson, who would return if and when he chose. I don't know. I do hope he doesn't mean to quarrel with the Major. Why should he? The Major was somewhat rude at first, but Nefret said he was charming to her. Oh, dear. You don't think your father intends to warn the Major to stay away from her, or... No, I don't. Or perhaps it's the little girl. He might wish... Mother, it's surely a waste of time to speculate... Why don't you eat your soup before it gets cold? Speculation, I retorted, is never a waste of time. It clears away the dead wood in the thickets of deduction. Ramses retreated behind his serviette. Something caught in your throat? His father inquired, returning and resuming his seat. No, sir. Was the major in? Ramses was a trifle flushed. I hope he wasn't coming down with a fever. That we will discover in due course, said Emerson, beginning on his soup. He eats very neatly, but very quickly. He finished before me, and then resumed speaking. I sent up a message saying I was here and wanted to see him. The response to his message did not take the form he expected. Ramsay saw her first. He said something under his breath and directed my attention toward the door of the dining salon. It is only Miss Molly, I said. Why such bad language? I'm beginning to think of her as a Jonah, Ramses said. Nonsense, said Emerson, turning to smile at the dainty little figure. She saw us at the same moment and came tripping toward us. I could tell from her affected walk and her pleased face that she thought she looked very grown up. Her pink satin frock was so fresh she must have just put it on and the ringlets framing her face were held back with a circlet of artificial rosebuds. Clothing makes the woman, as I always say. In this ensemble, which was more suitable for a jeune fille than a child, she did appear older than her admitted age. 
It must have been her indulgent uncle who had authorised the purchase. Miss Nordstrom followed close on the heels of her charge. Her face was even more forbidding than it had been on the occasion of our first meeting, and I thought she looked very tired. "'I hope you're recovered,' I said sympathetically. "'Thank you, Mrs. Emerson. It was only a mild um, indisposition. "'You must excuse us for interrupting your dinner,' she went on. "'Come along, Molly, and don't keep the gentleman standing.' "'Can't we sit with you?' Molly asked me. "'As you see, we've almost finished dinner,' I said. "'Oh, so have I. Finished dinner, I mean. "'Naughty said I could come downstairs for a sweet if I drank all my milk. "'The milk here tastes very horrid.' "'She made a comical face at Emerson, who beamed down at her from his great height. "'Certainly, my dear. And uh, you too, of course, Miss... Um, "'Will the Major be joining us?' The waiter brought two more chairs, and we all shifted round, to the great inconvenience of all concerned. Miss Molly settled herself into her chair between me and Ramsay's with an air of great satisfaction. "'He can't,' she said. "'I hope,' said Ramsay's, "'he's not suffering from an elementary indisposition.' Molly giggled. "'An upset tummy, you mean? "'No, that was... "'The Major was about to leave for a dinner engagement "'when your message arrived.' Miss Nordstrom said, turning pink. He sends his regrets and hopes to see you another time. Ah, said Emerson. If he was disappointed, he hid it very well. In fact, if I hadn't known better, I'd have thought he appeared pleased. Miss Molly took her time about ordering a sweet, asking everyone's opinion in turn. She divided her attention between Emerson and Ramsay's, getting very little in the way of conversation out of the latter, which left me to entertain Miss Nordstrom. An uphill job it was, too. All she could talk about was how much she disliked Cairo and yearned to return home. The food does not agree with me, Mrs. Emerson, and it is impossible to keep a normal regimen with the child. At home, you know, one has complete control and a proper schedule for school hours, healthful exercise and visits with parents. The Major's hours are so erratic. I never know when he'll be here. And then he wants to be with Wally. Quite natural, I said. "'Oh, yes, no doubt, but it doesn't make for proper discipline.' "'She lowered her voice. "'I assure you, I'd not have allowed her to disturb you "'if he'd not given in to her pleas. "'I do not hold with such late hours for children, "'or with such rich food. "'The ghetto au rhum, which Miss Molly was devouring, "'certainly fell into that category. "'Her enjoyment was so obvious I couldn't help smiling.' "'A little indulgence now and then doesn't hurt a child,' I said. "'Miss Molly, talking with her mouth full, didn't hear this. "'Ramsay's did. He gave me a sidelong look. "'As Miss Molly chattered cheerfully on, "'I began to be a trifle uneasy about the time. "'Miss Nordstrom had declined a sweet, but had accepted coffee. "'The dining salon was now full, "'and several acquaintances stopped by to say good evening "'on their way to or from their tables. "'One of these was Lord Edward.' The son of Lord Salisbury, he was in birth and lineage the most distinguished of all the young men whom Kitchener had brought into the Egyptian civil service. He'd had no training for his position in the finance ministry, but by all accounts he had done an excellent job and was high in the confidence of the government. He also had a certain reputation as the wittiest man in Cairo. Making fun of other people is the easiest way to acquire such a reputation. What he and his set said about us behind our backs, I could only imagine. They would never have had the audacity to say it to our faces. Gravely and deferentially, he congratulated Emerson on the discovery of the statue, told me how well I looked, pinched Miss Molly's cheek, and asked after a fret. Miss Nordstrom got a condescending nod. Last of all, he addressed Ramsay's. I thought you might like to know that Simmons has been reprimanded and cautioned to behave himself in future. It wasn't entirely his fault, Ramsay said. No. Lord Edward raised his eyebrows. I'll tell him you said so. Good evening. We must say good evening, too, Miss Nordstrom said, after the gentleman had sauntered away. It is shockingly late. Miss Molly looked rebellious. I haven't finished my ghetto. I said briskly, 
you have had quite as much as is good for you. Run along with Miss Nordstrom. Good night to you both. And do give our regards to the Major, said Emerson. She's becoming something of a nuisance, I remarked, watching the young person being towed away by her governess. What's the time? Ramses took out his watch. Half past ten. Emerson hailed the waiter by waving his serviette like a flag of truce. Emerson, please don't do that. You told me I mustn't shout at the fellow. What else am I supposed to do to get his attention? Finish your coffee and don't lecture. I took a sip. I must say the Savoy's cuisine does not live up to that of Shepherd's. The coffee has quite a peculiar taste. Emerson, occupied with the bill, ignored this complaint. But Ramsay said, Mine was all right. Are you sure you didn't add salt instead of sugar? I don't use sugar, as you ought to know. May I? He took my cup and tasted the coffee. Not nice at all, he said, wiping his mouth with his serviette. Would you like another cup? No time, said Emerson, who'd finished settling the account. He bustled us out of the hotel and into the motor car. As we circled the Esbekia Gardens and headed north along the boulevard Clos Bay, Ramses pulled a bundle from under the seat and began removing his outer garments. No wonder he'd looked lumpy. He was wearing the traditional loose shirt and drawers under his evening clothes. While he completed the change of clothing, I looked back, watching for signs of pursuit. Nothing except another motor car or a cycle could have kept up with Emerson, and by the time we reached the Souk El Kashir, I felt certain we'd not been followed. Turning to Ramses, I beheld a shadowy form swathed in flapping rags. The smell had already caught my attention. Pinching my nose, I said, Why are your disguises so repulsive? Nefret asked me that once. He adjusted a wig that looked like an untrimmed hedge. It appeared to be grey or white, and it smelled as bad as his clothes. As I told her, filth keeps fastidious persons at a distance. I expect you and she would rather I rode romantically about in white silk robes with a gold-braided agab holding my kaffir. I cannot see what useful purpose that would serve. The kaffir would become you well, though, with your dark eyes and hawk-like features and... I'm sorry I brought it up, said Ramses, his voice muted by laughter. Good night, mother. He was gone before I could reply, jumping nimbly over the side of the car as it slowed. Emerson immediately picked up speed. After I'd folded Ramsay's good evening suit into a neat bundle, I leaned forward to speak to Emerson. How far has he to go? A little over three miles. He should be there in plenty of time. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. The Turk was late. Ramsay's lying flat beside one of the monuments had been there for some time before he heard the creak of wagon wheels. He waited until the slow-moving vehicle had passed before getting to his feet, and he was conscious of a cowardly reluctance to go on as he approached from an oblique angle, stepping carefully over fallen gravestones. Farouk and the others had already arrived, singly or in pairs as he had taught them. He watched the proceedings for a while through a break in the wall. The Turk was in a hurry, so much so that he actually took a hand in the unloading. He started and swore when Ramsay slipped in. Don't bother inspecting the merchandise, he growled. It is all here. So you say. There is no time. He heaved a canvas-wrapped bundle at Ramsay's, who caught it and passed it on to Farouk. Shall I open it, sir? Farouk asked. No, Ramsay said curtly. Get on with it. He went to stand beside the Turk. There's been trouble. Did Farouk tell you? I thought I should leave it to you, sir, said Farouk, in a voice like honey dripping. Ramses moved back a step. We cannot use Aslimi's place again. It was raided by the police last night. Every merchant in the Khan in Khalili is talking about it. The Turk emitted a string of obscenities in a mixture of languages. Who betrayed us? Who else but Aslimi? He's been on the verge of cracking for weeks. How did you get away from them, Farouk? You were surprised to see me here? No. Every merchant in the Khan knows the police left without a prisoner. 
Were you warned in advance? No, I was only very clever. He let out a grunt as the Turk passed a heavy box into his arms. I know the alleys of the Hoshashin as a lover knows the body of his mistress. They came nowhere near me. They? Ramses echoed the word. The police? Who else would I mean? No one came near me. That settles that, Ramses thought. If Farouk were loyal to Wardani, he would have mentioned his meeting with the Emersons and bragged of his cleverness in duping the formidable father of curses out of a thousand pounds in gold. He might be vain enough to think he could get the money without giving anything in return. Well done, Ramses murmured. A Slimy cannot tell the police very much because we did not tell him very much. But we must arrange for another drop. Do you know the mosque of Kasra el Ain? It's not much used except on Friday, when the dervishes whirl, and there is a small opening beside one of the marble slabs on the left wall as you go in. It's the one just under the text of the Ayat el Kursi. You know your Quran, of course? I will find the place. One more delivery. It will be the last. Is the time so close then? Close enough. The wagon was empty. The Turk got onto the seat and gathered the reins. You will be told when to strike. This time, Ramses did not try to follow him. He stood watching. It would have been below Wardani's dignity to assist with manual labor, while his men covered the loads with bundles of reeds. Assad edged up to him. You have recovered, Sir Camille? You are well? As you see. He put a friendly hand on the slighter man's shoulder, and Assad stiffened with pride. When will we see you again? I will find you. Ma'as-salam. He waited, with his back against the wall, listening to the creak of the cartwheels. Then he heard another sound, a roll of a pebble under a careless foot. His knife was half out of the sheath before he recognized the dark outline. Too short for Farouk, too thin for any of the others. Assad. He stood uncertainly in the opening, his head moving from side to side, his weak eyes unable to penetrate the darkness. Here, Ramsay said softly. Kabil! He tripped and staggered forward, his arms flailing. I had to come back. I had to tell you. Slowly, slowly. Ramses caught his arm and steadied him. What a conspirator, he thought wryly. Clumsy, half-blind, timid. And loyal. Tell me what? What Mukhtar and Rashad are saying. They would not dare say it to your face. I told them they were fools, but they... What are they saying? A great gulp escaped the other man that you should give out the guns now to our people, that it is dangerous to keep them all in one place, that our people should learn how to use them to practice shooting without attracting the attention of the police. It would be even more dangerous and a waste of ammunition. Damnation, Ramses thought, even as he calmed his agitated lieutenant. He'd been afraid some bright soul would think of that. He thought he knew who the bright soul was. What did Farouk say? He asked. Farouk is loyal. He said you were the leader, that you knew best. Oh, yes, right, Ramses thought. Aloud, he said. I'm glad you told me. Go now, my friend, and make sure the weapons get to the warehouse. I count on you. Assad stumbled out. Ramses waited for another five minutes. When he left the mosque, it was on hands and knees and in the deepest shadow he could find. The cemetery was not one of the groups of princely medieval tombs mentioned in the guidebook. It was still in use, and most of the monuments were small and poor. Crouching behind one of the larger tombs, he exchanged the old fakir's tattered dilk and straggling grey hair for turban and robe, and wrapped the reeking ensemble in several tight layers of cloth that reduced the stench to endurable proportions. He'd been tempted to abandon the garment and wig, but it had taken him a long time to get them suitably disgusting. He slung the bag over his shoulder in order to leave both hands free, buckled the belt that held his knife over his robe, and started toward the road. Even though he'd been half expecting it, David's appearance made him start, his hand on the hilt of his knife. A bit nervous, are we? 
David inquired, his lip curling and the distorted smile of his disguise. What happened to the gauzy pantaloons? I couldn't find a pair that was long enough. They went on in silence for a time, and then Ramsay said, I thought you were going to follow the Turk. I concluded it would be a waste of time. We need to know where he's coming from, not where he goes after he has rid himself of his incriminating load. He probably hires a different team and wagon for each delivery, and I doubt he stays in the same place all the time. You're protesting too much, Ramsay said with a faint smile. But I don't mind admitting I appreciate your standing guard. Farouk makes me extremely nervous. He affects me the same way, especially after what happened at Aslimis. You heard? Yes, the story is all over the bazaars. David's voice was neutral, but Ramsay's was painfully aware of his friend's disappointment. It's not over yet, he said. We caught up with Farouk and came to an agreement with him. He wants a thousand pounds in gold in exchange for what he called a bigger fish than Wardani. Father is to meet him tomorrow night. It could be a ruse. David was trying not to let his hopes rise. It could. But Farouk is an egotistical ass if he thinks he can trick an old hand like Father. He'll keep his word to hand over the money and give Farouk three days' immunity from pursuit. But first the innocent lad will spend a little time in our custody while we verify the information. It was typical of David that he should think first of the danger to someone else. The professor mustn't go alone. The fellow wouldn't think twice about knifing him in the back or shooting him. Where are they meeting and when? I'll be there too. Not you, no, Ramses went on to explain. His choice of a rendezvous was no accident. I don't know how much he knows or how much he's told others, but if something goes wrong tomorrow night, you must not be found near that house. I'm going with Father. Between the two of us, we should be able to deal with Farouk. The little swine isn't going to shoot anybody until he's made certain we have the money with us. The area between the edge of the cemetery and the city gate was an open field, used in times of festivals, now deserted. Pale clouds of dust stirred round their feet as they walked under a sickle moon through patches of weeds and bare earth. There was no sign of life, but the night was alive with sounds and movements, the sharp baying of pariah dogs, the scuttle of rats. A great winged shape of darkness swept low over their heads, and a brief squeak heralded the demise of a mouse or shrew. He'd grown up amid these sounds and rich, variegated smells, donkey dung, rotting vegetation, and he had walked paths like this one many times with David. He was reluctant to break the companionable silence, but ahead, the glow of those parts of Cairo that never slept, the brothels and houses of pleasure, were growing brighter, and there was more to discuss before they parted. He gave David a brief account of what had transpired at the rendezvous, and David described his new abode in the slums of Bulak. Biggest cockroaches I've ever seen. I'm thinking of making a collection. Then, David said, What's this I hear about a statue of solid gold? Ramses laughed. You ought to know how the rumor mongers exaggerate. It is a treasure, though. He described the statue and answered David's questions. But after David's initial excitement had passed, he said, Strange place to find such a thing. I thought that would occur to you. But surely it must have occurred to the professor as well. A royal fourth dynasty statue in the shaft of a private tomb? Even the most highly favored official would not possess such a thing. It must have been made to stand in a temple. Quite. They passed between the massive towers of the Bab el Nasser, one of the few remaining gates of the 11th century fortifications, and were suddenly in the city. It hadn't been thrown in, Ramses went on. It was upright and undamaged, and not far from the surface. The sand around it was loose, and the purported thieves had left a conspicuous cavity that pinpointed its position. David pondered for a moment, his head bent. Are you suggesting that it was placed there recently? That the diggers wanted you to find it? Why? It's a unique work of art, worth a great deal of money in the antiquities market. Such benevolence on the part of a thief. Oh, oh, good Lord. You don't think it could have been... 
I think that's what father thinks. He sees the dread hand of Sethos everywhere, as mother puts it. But in this case, he could be right. I'd been half expecting Sethos would turn up. Such men gather like vultures in times of war or civil disorder. He's been acquiring legal antiquities for years, and according to mother, he keeps the finest for himself. But why would he plant one of his treasures in your tomb? David emitted a gurgle of suppressed laughter. A present for Aunt Emilia? A distraction, rather, Ramses corrected. Perhaps he's hoping that a superb find will make her concentrate on the excavation instead of looking for enemy agents. Has she been doing that? Well, I think she may be looking for him. That is a damned peculiar relationship, David. I don't doubt she is devoted to father, but she's always had a weakness for the rascal. He has rescued her from danger on several occasions, David pointed out. Oh, yes, he knows precisely how to manipulate her. If she's telling the truth about their encounters, he hasn't made a single false move. She's such a hopeless romantic. He may really care for her. You're another damned romantic, Ramsay said sourly. Never mind Sethos's motives. In a way, I hope I'm wrong about them, because I'd hate to believe my mind works along the same lines as his. He could be one of the busy little spies in our midst, then. Perhaps even the man in charge. That isn't a happy prospect. David sounded worried. He has contacts all over the Middle East, especially in the criminal underground of Cairo. And if he is as expert at disguise as you... He's even better. He could be almost anyone, Ramses added, in a studiously neutral voice. Except Mrs. Fortescue. You're certain? The undercurrent of laughter was absent from David's voice when he went on. She could be one of his confederates. He had several women in his organization. Ramses knew David was thinking of one woman in particular, the diabolical creature who'd been responsible for his grandfather's death. She was out of the picture at any rate, struck down by a dozen vengeful hands. Possibly, he said. What about that bizarre Frenchman who follows her about? Could he be Sethos? Ramses shook his head. Too obvious. Have you ever seen anyone who looked more like a villain? He'd be more likely to take on the identity of a well-known person, Clayton or Woolley or... Not Lawrence, he's not tall enough. They skirted the edge of the Red Blind district. A pair of men in uniform reeled toward them, arms entwined, voices raised in song. It was long past tattoo, and the lads were in for it when they returned to the barracks, but some of them were willing to endure punishment for the pleasures of the brothels and grog shops. Ramses and David stepped out of the way, and as the men staggered past, they heard a maudlin, off-key reference to someone's dear old mother. David switched to Arabic. Why don't you ask the professor whom he suspects? I could do that, Ramses admitted. It is time you began treating your parents like responsible adults, David said severely. Ramses smiled. As always, you speak words of wisdom. We must part here, my brother. The bridge is ahead. You will let me know, Iwa, of course. Take care. Ma'asalame. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. When we reached the house, we learned from Fatima, who had waited up for us, that Nefret had returned an hour before. She'd refused the food Fatima wanted to serve, saying she was too tired to eat, and had gone straight to her room. My heart went out to the child, for I knew she must be concerned about one of her patients. I stopped outside her door, but saw no light through the keyhole, and heard no sound, so I went on. I put it down to nerves and too much rich food, and having rid myself of the latter along the roadside, I accepted a refreshing cup of tea from Fatima before retiring. Needless to say, I didn't sleep until I heard a soft tap on the door. The signal Ramses had grudgingly agreed to give on his return. I had promised I wouldn't detain him, so I suppressed my natural impulses and turned onto my side, where I encountered a pair of large, warm hands. Emerson had been wakeful, too. In silence, he drew me into his embrace and held me until I fell asleep. 
Somewhat to my surprise, for she was not usually an early riser, I found Lafrette already at the breakfast table when I went down. One look at her face told me my surmise had been correct. Her cheeks lacked their usual pretty colour, and there were dark shadows under her eyes. I knew better than to offer commiseration or comfort. When I commented on her promptness, she informed me somewhat curtly that she was going back to the hospital. One of her patients was in dire straits, and she wanted to be there. Only one thing could have taken my mind off what was to transpire that night, and we did not find it. The burial chamber at the bottom of the deep shaft had been looted in antiquity. All that remained were a few bones and scraps of the funerary equipment. We left Ramses to catalogue and collect these disappointing fragments and climbed the rough ladders back to the surface. I remarked to Emerson below me, There is another burial shaft. Perhaps it will lead to something more interesting. Emerson grunted. Are you going to start on it today? No. I stopped and looked down at him. I understand, my dear, I said sympathetically. Tis difficult to concentrate on excavation when so much hangs on our midnight rendezvous. Emerson described the said rendezvous with a series of carefully selected adjectives, adding that only I would stop for a chat while halfway up a rickety ladder. He gave me a friendly little push. Once on the surface, Emerson resumed the conversation. I strongly object to one of the words you used, Peabody. Midnight was not entirely accurate, I admitted. But it sounds more romantic than 11 p.m., eh? Emerson's smile metamorphosed into a grimace that showed even more teeth and was not at all friendly. That was not the word. You said our. I thought I'd made it clear to you that the first person plural does not apply. Must I say it again? Here and now, with Selim waiting for instructions... I indicated our youthful Rais, who was squatting on the ground, smoking, and pretending he was not trying to overhear. Oh, cut it, Emerson said. Daoud got the men started, and Selim descended the ladder in order to take Ramses's place in the tomb chamber, assuming, that is, that Ramses would consent to be replaced. After assuring me that David was still safe and unsuspected, and that the delivery of the weapons had gone off without incident, and that nobody had tried to murder him, he had rather avoided me. I knew why, of course. Injured and weakened as he'd been, he'd been forced to rely on me and on his father for help. Now he regretted that weakness of body and will, and wished he hadn't involved us. In other words, he was thinking like a man. Emerson was just as bad... I always had trouble convincing him that he needed me to protect him. Dealing with not one but two male egos was really going to be a nuisance. I took Emerson to the rest place, where he immediately began lecturing. I sipped my tea and let him run on until he ran out of breath and patience. So, what have you to say? he demanded. Oh, I am to be allowed to speak? Well, then, I grant you that if he is alone... You and Ramses can probably manage him by yourselves, always assuming he doesn't assassinate one or both of you from ambush as you approach. However, probably, Emerson repeated, in a voice like thunder. However, I continued, it is likely that he will be accompanied by a band of ruffians like himself, bent on robbery and murder. They could not let you live, for they would know you would... Stop that, Emerson shouted. Such idle speculation clears away the deadwood in the thickets of deduction, said Ramses, appearing out of thin air like the afrit to which she had often been compared. Emerson stared at him in stupefaction, and Ramses went on. Father, why don't you tell her precisely what we're planning to do? It may relieve her mind. What? said Emerson. I said, I heard you. I also heard you utter an aphorism even more preposterous than your mother's efforts along those lines. Don't you start, Ramses. I cannot put up with the two of you. It was one of mother's, as a matter of fact, Ramses said, taking a seat on a packing case. Well, father. Tell her, then, 
Emerson said. He added gloomily, It won't stop her for long, though. It'll be all right, Mother, Ramses said. He smiled at me. The softening of his features and the familiar reassurance disarmed me, as he had no doubt counted on its doing. Farouk is not collaborating with the Germans for ideological reasons. He's doing it for the money. We're offering him more than he could hope to get from the other side, so he'll come to the rendezvous. He won't want to share it, so he'll come alone. He won't shoot Father from behind a wall, because he won't know for certain that Father has the money on his person. We will frighten him off if we go in force, so we can't risk it. I started to speak. Ramses raised his voice and went on. I'll proceed farther by two hours and keep watch. If I see anything at all that contradicts my assumptions or that makes me uneasy, I will head farther off. Is that acceptable to you? It still seems to me one more thing. Ramses fixed intent black eyes on me. His face was very grave. We're counting on you to keep Nefret out of this. She will want to go with us, and she mustn't. If she were present, Father would be worrying about her instead of thinking of his own safety. And so would you, I said. Emerson had listened without attempting to interrupt. Now he glanced at his son and said, Ramses is right. In all fairness, I must point out that he acted as impulsively as Nefret, and he was lucky to get away with only a knock on the head. Ramsay's high cheekbones darkened. All right, it was stupid of me. But if she'd let me enter that room first, you can be damned sure Farouk would never have laid a hand on her. I'd probably do something equally stupid if he threatened her again. And so would you, father. Supposing there is a scrap, wouldn't she wade right in trying to help us? And wouldn't you fall over your own feet trying to get her out of it? I've heard of such things happening, said Emerson. He looked at me. No doubt you would accuse us of being patronising and overly protective. I do. You are. You always have been. But Emerson heard the note of hesitation in my voice, and for once he had the good sense to keep quiet. His blue eyes were steady, his lean brown face resolute. I looked from him to Ramses, whose unruly black hair curled over his temples and whose well-cut features were so like his father's. They were very dear to me. Would I put them at even greater risk by insisting on playing my part in the night's adventure? I was forced to admit that I might. I was also forced to admit that Ramsay's analysis of Nefret's character was not entirely inaccurate. Initially, it had struck me as being unjust and prejudiced, but I had had time to think about it, and incident after confirmatory incident came back to me. Some of her early escapades might be excused as a result of youthful overconfidence, such as the time she had deliberately allowed herself to be captured by one of our most vindictive opponents in the hope of rescuing her brother. But maturity hadn't changed her very much. She'd been a full-grown woman when she entered a Luxor bordello and tried to persuade the girls to leave. Then there was the time she had blackmailed Ramses into letting her go with him and David into one of the vilest parts of Cairo in order to retrieve a stolen antiquity. And the time she had single-handedly attacked a thief armed with a knife. The list went on and on. Emerson's description of Ramses might equally have applied to Nefret. She was as brave as a lion and as cunning as a cat, and as stubborn as a camel. And when her passions were aroused, she was as quick to strike as a snake. Even her hasty, ill-advised marriage. Very well, I said. I think you are being a trifle unjust to Nefret. She's got you and David out of a few nasty situations, you know. I know what I owe her, Ramsay said quietly. However, I continued, I agree with your proposal, not because I believe she cannot be trusted to behave sensibly, but because I know you and your father cannot. Ramsay's tight lips relaxed. Fair enough, <laughs> said Emerson. We scattered to our various tasks. It was after midday when Nefret turned up. I'd been sifting a particularly unproductive lot of rubble for several hours and was not unwilling to be interrupted. I rose to my feet and stretched. 
She'd changed to her working clothes, and I could tell by her brisk stride that she was in a happier state of mind than she'd been that morning. She was carrying a covered basket, which she lowered to the ground beside me. Not more food, I exclaimed. We brought a luncheon basket. You know Fatima, Lefret said. She thinks none of us eat enough. While I was bathing and changing, she made kunafe especially for Ramses. She says he's all bones and skin and needs to be fattened. Where is he? If he balks, we will stuff it down his throat the way they do with geese. And did even in ancient times, I said, smiling. Go and call him and Emerson to luncheon then. They are inside the chapel. Fatima had also sent a dish of stewed apricots and a sliced watermelon, which had been nicely cooled by evaporation during the trip. We all tucked in with good appetite, including Ramses. The kunafe was one of his favourite dishes, wheat flour vermicelli fried in clarified butter and sweetened with honey. Nefret teased him by repeating Fatima's criticism, and he responded with a rather vulgar Arabic quotation about female pulchritude, which clearly did not apply to her, and Emerson smiled fondly at both of them. "'Matters went well today,' he inquired. Nefret nodded. "'I thought last night I would lose her, but she's much better this morning.' She spat a watermelon seed neatly into her hand and went on. You'll never guess who called on me today. Since we won't, you may as well tell us, said Ramses. The next sea just missed his ear. His black eyes narrowed, and he reached for a slice of melon. I strictly forbid you to do that, Ramses, I exclaimed. You and Nefret are too old for those games now. Let them enjoy themselves, Peabody, Emerson said indulgently. Oh, Nefret, who was your visitor? Her answer wiped the amiable smile from Emerson's face. That degenerate, slimy, contemptible, disgusting, perverted, loathsome... He was very polite, Nefret interrupted. Or should I have said she? The fact that El Gabi prefers to wear women's clothing does not change his sex. Uh, uh, gender, Ramsay said. He looked as inscrutable as ever, but I'd seen his involuntary start of surprise. What was he doing at the hospital? Inquiring after one of his girls. Nefret's voice put quotation marks round the pronoun. The same one I operated on last night. He said he had sent her to us, and that the man who hurt her had been dealt with. Emerson had got his breath back. That crawling serpentine trafficker in human flesh... That filthy... Yes, Professor Darling, I know the words, too. And his taste in jewellery and perfume is quite dreadful. Observing from Emerson's apoplectic countenance that he was in no mood for humour, she threw her arm round his shoulders and kissed him on the cheek. I love your indignation, Professor dear, but I've seen worse and dealt with worse since I started the clinic. El Gabi's goodwill can help me to help those women. That is the important thing. Quite right. I said approvingly. Bah, said Emerson. Ramsay said, Well done, Nefret. The watermelon seed hit him square on the chin. My mind was not entirely on my rubbish that afternoon. I was racking my brain, trying to think of a way of preventing Nefret from accompanying Emerson and Ramsay's. A number of schemes ran through my mind, only to be dismissed as impracticable. The inspiration that finally dawned was so remarkable, I wondered why it hadn't occurred to me before. We dined earlier than was our custom, since I wanted to make sure Ramses ate a proper meal before leaving. It would take him an hour to reach Mardi by the roundabout routes he'd chosen in order to get into position unobserved and unsuspected. When the rest of us retired to the drawing room for after-dinner coffee, he slipped away, but, of course, Nefret noticed his absence almost immediately and demanded to know where he was. "'He has gone,' I replied, for I had determined to tell her the truth, instead of inventing a story she wouldn't have believed anyhow. Nefret jumped up from her chair. "'Gone? Already? Hell and damnation! You promised, my dear, you will overturn the coffee tray. Sit down and pour, if you please. Thank you, Fatima, we need nothing more.' Nefret did not sit down, but she waited until Fatima had left the room before she exploded. How could you, Aunt Amelia? Professor, you let him go alone? 
the bravest of men, I refer, of course, to my spouse, quailed before that furious blue gaze. Um, he said, <laughs> Tell her, Amelia. Nefret pronounced a word of whose meaning I was entirely ignorant and bolted for the door. I don't know where she thought she was going. Perhaps she believed she could intercept Ramses, or, which is more likely, perhaps she wasn't thinking at all. She didn't get far. Emerson moved with the panther-like speed that had given rise to one of Dowd's more memorable sayings. The father of curses roars like a lion and walks like a cat and strikes like a falcon. He picked Nefret up as if she weighed nothing at all and carried her back to her chair. Thank you, Emerson, I said. Nefret, that will be quite enough. I understand your concern, my dear, but you did not give me a chance to explain. Really, you must conquer this habit of rushing into action without considering the consequences. I half expected her to burst into another fiery denunciation. Instead, her eyes fell and the pretty flush of anger faded from her cheeks. Yes, Aunt Amelia. That's better, I said approvingly. Drink your coffee and I'll tell you the plan. I proceeded to do so. Nefret listened in silence, her eyes downcast, her hands tightly folded in her lap. However, she didn't miss Emerson's attempt to tiptoe out of the room. Admittedly, Emerson is not good at tiptoeing. Where's he going? she demanded fiercely. To get ready. I was not at all averse to his leaving, since it enabled me to speak more candidly. For pity's sake, Nefret, don't you suppose that I too yearn to accompany them? I agreed to stay here and keep you with me, because I believe it is the best solution. Her mutinous look assured me she was unconvinced. I had another argument. It was one I loathed to employ, but honesty demanded I should. There have been times, not many, one or two, in the past, when my presence distracted Emerson from the struggle in which he was engaged and resulted in considerable danger to him. Why, Aunt Amelia, is it true? Only once or twice. I see. Her brow cleared. Would you care to tell me about them? I see no point in doing so. It was a long time ago. I know better now. And, I continued, before she could pursue a subject that clearly interested her a great deal, which I was not anxious to recall, I am giving you the benefit of my experience. Their plan is a good one, Lafrette. They swore to me that they would retreat in good order if matters did not work out as they expect. Her slim shoulders sagged. How long must we wait? I knew then I had won. They'll come straight back, I'm sure. Emerson knows if he does not turn up in good time, I will go looking for him. He would do anything to avoid that. The following is from Letter Collection B. Dearest Leah, do you still keep my letters? I suspect you do, though I asked you to destroy them. Not only current letters, but the ones I wrote you a few years ago. You said you liked to reread them when we were apart, because it was like hearing my voice. And I said, I'm sorry for what I said, Leah, darling. I was horrid to you. I was horrid to everyone. You have my permission, formal written permission, to keep them if you wish. I would be glad if you did. Some day I may want, I hope I may want, to read them again myself. There was one in particular. I think you know which one. I'm in a fey mood tonight, as you can probably tell. I've put off writing to you because there's so much I want to say that can't be said. The thought that a stranger, or worse, a person I know, might read these letters is constantly in my mind. It's as if someone were lurking behind the door, listening to our private thoughts and confidences. So I will confine myself to facts. Aunt Amelia and I are alone this evening. The professor and Ramses have gone out. With the lamps lit and the curtains drawn, this cavernous parlour looks almost cosy, especially with Aunt Amelia darning socks. Yes, you heard me. She's darning socks. She gets these housewifely attacks from time to time. Heaven only knows why. Since she darns as thoroughly as she does everything, the stockings end up with huge lumps on toes or heels and the hapless wearer thereof ends up with huge blisters. 
I think Ramses quietly and tactfully throws his away. But the professor, who never pays any attention to what clothing he puts on, goes round limping and swearing. I take it back. This room is not cosy. It never can be. A fluffy, furry animal might help. But I can't have the puppies here. They chew the legs of the furniture and misbehave on the oriental rugs. I even miss that wretched beast, Horus. I couldn't have brought him, since he refuses to be parted from Sunia. But I wish I had a cat of my own. Seshat spends most of her time in Ramsay's room. Some day, when we're all together again, we will find a better house, or build one. It'll be large and sprawling, with courtyards and fountains and gardens and plenty of room, so we can all be together, but not too close together. If you'd rather, we'll get the dear old Amelia out of dry dock for you and David and the infant. It will happen some day. It must. Goodness, I sound like a little old lady, rocking and recalling the memories of her youth. Let me think what news I can write about. You asked about the hospital. One must be patient. It will take time to convince respectable women and their conservative husbands that we will not offend their modesty or their religious principles. There has been one very hopeful development. This morning I had a caller, none other than El Garbi, the most powerful procurer of El Wasa. They say he controls not only prostitution, but every other illegal activity in that district. I'd seen him once or twice when I went to the old clinic, and an unforgettable figure he was, squatting on the must of a bench outside one of his houses, robed like a woman and jangling with gold. When he turned up today, born in a litter and accompanied by an escort, all young and handsome, elegantly robed and heavily armed, our poor old doorkeeper almost fainted. He came rushing to find me. It seems El Garbi had asked for me by name. When I went out, there he was, sitting cross-legged in the litter, like some grotesque statue of ebony and ivory, veiled and adorned. I could smell the patchouli ten yards away. When I told the family about it later, I thought the professor was going to explode. While he sputtered and swore, I repeated that curious conversation. The girl I'd operated on the night before was one of his. He'd sent her to me. He'd come in person because he'd heard a great deal about me and he wanted to see for himself what I was like. Odd, wasn't it? I can't imagine why he should be interested. Did I call him names? I know a lot of good Arabic terms for men like him. And tell him never to darken my door again? No, Leah, I did not. Once I might have done, but I've learned better. It's pointless to complain that the world isn't the way it ought to be. By all accounts, he is a kinder master than some. I told him I appreciated his interest and would be happy to treat any of the women who needed my services. The professor was not so tolerant. What damnable effrontery was the least inflammatory of the remarks he made. When he wound down, it was Ramsay's turn. Someone who didn't know him well might have thought he was bored by the discussion. He was sitting on the ground with his back against a packing case and his knees raised and his head bent, devouring Fatima's food. Ramses is never a model of sartorial elegance, as you know. He'd been running his fingers through his hair to push it out of the way, and it was all tangled over his forehead. Perspiration streaked his face and throat and bare forearms, and his shirt was sticking to his shoulders. He raised his head and opened his mouth. You need a haircut, I said, and don't lecture me. I know I do. I wasn't going to lecture you. I was about to say, well done. Can you imagine that, Leah? Ramsay's paying me a compliment. You know what a low opinion he has of my good sense and self-control. I wish... I can't write any more. It's very late, and my hand is cramped from holding the pen. Please excuse the atrocious writing. Aunt Amelia's folding up her mending. I love you, Leah, dear. That concludes that excerpt from Letter Collection B. Chapter 9 When Nefret asked how long I meant to wait, I didn't know the answer. Farouk might be late, although an individual expecting to receive a large sum of money generally is not. 
and there would certainly be a heated discussion when Emerson insisted upon verification before payment. I did not doubt my formidable husband's ability to overcome an opponent, even one as treacherous as Farouk, but Emerson and Ramses would then have to bind and gag the young villain and transport him across the river to the house. The journey could take anywhere from an hour to two hours, depending on the available transportation. And precipitate action by Nefret and me would only confirm Emerson's unjust, for the most part, opinion of women. In order to discipline myself, I had turned to a task I particularly dislike, mending. Nefret read for a while, or pretended to. Finally, she declared her intention of writing to Leah. I ought to have emulated her. My weekly letter to Evelyn was overdue, but it was confounded difficult to write a cheery, chatty letter when I didn't feel at all cheery, and it was impossible to chat about the subject uppermost in my mind. We were both masking our true feelings. When Evelyn wrote me, she did not mention her worries about her boys in the trenches and her other boy, dear as a son, in exile so far away. I must also prevaricate and equivocate. It would only increase Evelyn's anxiety if she learned that David and Ramses were also risking their lives for the cause. Nor had I forgotten Ramses' warning to Nefret that the post would almost certainly be read by the military authorities, and his even more pointed remarks about the need for secrecy. I wondered what the deuce Nefret found to write about. Perhaps her letters to Leah were as stilted as mine to Evelyn. By half past one o'clock in the morning, I had mended eight pairs of stockings. Later, I had to discard all but the first pair. I'd sewed the toes to the heels and the tops to the soles, passing my needle in and out of the fabric without paying the least attention to what I was doing. After I'd run the needle deep into my finger for the tenth time, I bit off the thread and pushed the sewing basket aside. Nefret looked up from her letter. I finished she said. Is it time? We will wait another half hour. Nefret bowed her head in silent acquiescence. The lamplight gilded her bright hair and shone on her ringless hands, which rested in her lap. She had removed her wedding ring the day after Geoffrey died. I never asked what she'd done with it. I was trying to think of something comforting to say when Nefret looked up. They're safe, she said gently. I'm sure nothing has happened. Of course, I said. Twenty-seven minutes more. I began planning what I would do. At my insistence, Emerson had described the location of the house, which I had never seen. Should we drive the motor car, disdaining secrecy, or find a boat to take us directly across the river? Twenty-five minutes. How slowly the time passed. I decided the motor car would be quicker. I would send Ali after Daoud and Selim. At twenty minutes before two, the shutters rattled. I sprang to my feet. Lefret ran to the window and flung the shutters back. I heard a thump and saw movement, and there was Seshat, sitting on the windowsill. Curse it! I exclaimed. It's only the cat. No. Lefret looked out into the dark garden. They are coming. Like a butler ushering visitors into a room, Seshat waited for the men to reach the window before she jumped down onto the floor. Emerson was the first to enter. Ramses followed him and drew the shutters closed. "'Well?' I cried. "'Where is he? Where have you put him?' "'He didn't come,' Emerson said. "'We waited for over an hour.' "'They'd had time to accept the failure of our hopes,' though I could see it weighed heavily upon them. I turned away for fear Nefret would see what a terrible blow the news had dealt me. Her expressive face had mirrored her own disappointment, but she did not, could not, know how much was at stake. So it was a trick after all, I muttered. Emerson unfastened the heavy money belt and tossed it onto the table. I wish I knew. He could have eluded us that night. Why would he offer an exchange and then renege? Come and sit down, my dear. I know you've been under quite a strain. Would you like a whiskey and soda? No. Well, Ramses went to the sideboard. Would you care for something, Lefret? No, thank you. She sat down and lifted Seshart onto her lap. He told Emerson to come alone, I said, 
taking the glass Ramses handed me. If he saw you, he didn't see me. Ramses did not often venture to interrupt me. I forgave him when I saw his hooded eyes and the lines of strain that bracketed his mouth. He was wearing a suit of dull brown he'd recently purchased in Cairo. When I came across it in his wardrobe, in the process of collecting things to be laundered or cleaned, I had wondered why he had selected such an unbecoming shade, almost the same colour as his tanned face. I ought to have realised. With the coat buttoned up to his throat, he would be virtually invisible at night. I beg your pardon, I said. Please sit down. Thank you. I'd rather not. He removed his coat. I let out an involuntary cry of surprise. You're carrying a gun. I thought you never... Do you suppose I'd sacrifice father's safety to my principles? He unbuckled the straps that held the holster in place under his left arm and placed the whole contraption carefully down on a table. I assure you it wasn't an idle boast when I said Farouk could not have seen me. Darkness was complete before I reached Mardi, and I spent the next three hours roosting in a tree... There was the usual nocturnal traffic, the occupants of the new villas coming and going in their carriages, the less distinguished residents on foot. By the time Father got there, no one had come near the house for over an hour. My hero goes to bed at sundown. I could hear her snoring. Emerson took up the tale. Knowing Ramses would have warned me off if Farouk had played us false, I stood under the damn tree with my back against the wall of the house. Since I could not strike a light to look at my watch, I had no idea how much time had passed. It seemed like a year before Ramses slid down to the ground and spoke to me. How did you know the time? I asked Ramses, who was prowling restlessly around the room. Radium paint on the hands and numerals of my watch. It glows faintly in the dark. Nefret had been stroking the cat, who permitted this familiarity with her usual air of condescension. Now, Nefret said, perhaps this evening was a test to make certain you would meet his demands. That's possible, Ramses agreed, in which case he will communicate with us again. He swayed a little and caught hold of the back of a chair. Nefret removed the cat from her lap. I'm going to bed. The rest of you had better do the same. I waited until the door had closed before I went to Ramses. Now, tell me the truth. Were you hurt? Was your father injured? I did tell you the truth, Ramses said, with such an air of righteous indignation that I couldn't help smiling. It happened just as we said, Mother. I am only a little tired. And disappointed, said Emerson, who had lit his pipe and was puffing away with great satisfaction. Ah, all those hours without the comforting poison of nicotine added to my misery. Devil take it, Peabody, it was a blow. It will be a blow to David, too, Ramsay said. I don't look forward to telling... Mother, put that down. There's a shell in the chamber. My finger was not on the trigger, I protested. He took the weapon from my hands, and Emerson, who had leapt to his feet, sat down with a gusty sigh. Don't even think about borrowing that pistol, Peabody. It is far too heavy for you. Quite an ingenious contrivance, I said, examining the holster. Is this a spring inside? Ouch! As you see, said Ramses. Your invention? My refinement of someone else's invention. Could you... No, Emerson said loudly. How did you know what I was going to ask? I know you only too well, Peabody, said my husband, scowling. You were about to ask him to fit that little gun of yours with a similar spring. I strictly forbid it. You are already armed and dangerous. Speaking of that, Emerson, I'm having problems with my sword parasol. Jamal claimed he'd repaired it, but the release keeps sticking. I'll have a look at it if you like, Mother, Ramsay said. His momentary animation had faded, leaving him looking deathly tired. Never mind, my dear. I'll let Jamal have another try. Go to bed. As for David, let him hope a little longer. All is not lost. We may yet receive a message. I spoke confidently and encouragingly, but I was conscious of a growing sense of discouragement that troubled my slumber and shadowed my thoughts all the next day. Blighted hope is harder to bear than no hope at all. 
At breakfast next morning, Emerson asked Nefret to take photographs of the statue. I stayed to help her with the lighting. We employed the same mirror reflectors we were accustomed to using in the tombs. They gave us subtler, more controlled light than flash powder or magnesium wire. It took us quite some time, since, of course, long exposures were necessary. When we had finished and were on our way to join the others at Giza, Nefret remarked, I'm surprised the professor hasn't stationed armed guards all round the statue, by night and by day. My dear girl, how could a thief make off with something so heavy? It required forty of our sturdiest workmen to lift the thing. Nefret chuckled. It is rather a ludicrous image, I admit. Forty thieves, just as in Alibaba, staggering along the road with the statue on their shoulders, trying to appear inconspicuous. Yes, I said, chuckling. It echoed somewhat hollowly. At that time, the statue was the least of my concerns. Before we parted for the night, we had agreed on certain steps to be taken the following day. Ramses, who was still inclined to impart information in dribbles, explained that he and David had arranged several means of communication. He had on one occasion actually passed a message to David when I was present, for one of David's roles was that of a flower vendor outside Shepherd's Hotel. I remembered the occasion well. The flowers had been rather wilted. If we hadn't heard from Farouk by mid-afternoon, we would go to Shepherd's for tea, and after Ramses had seen David, Ramses would try to locate Farouk. He refused to omit even a dribble of information explaining how he meant to go about it, but... I assumed that the conspirators had ways of contacting one another in case of an emergency. None of this information could be imparted to Nefret. If she went with us to Shepherd's, I would have to find some means of distracting her while Ramses approached the flower vendor. David's disguise had been good enough to fool me, but her keen eyes might not be so easily deceived. As it turned out, my scheming was unnecessary. Shortly after midday, we received a message that threw all our plans into disarray. Instead of using basket carriers, as we'd done in the past, Emerson had caused to be laid down between the tomb and the dump site a set of tracks along which wheeled carts could run. As I stood watching one of the filled carts being pushed toward the dump, a man on horseback approached. I was about to shout at him to go away, when I realised that he was in the uniform of the Cairo police. I hastened to meet him. At my insistence, he handed over the letter he carried, which was in fact directed to Emerson. This would not have prevented me from opening the envelope had not Emerson himself joined us. He too had recognised the uniform. He too realised that something serious must have occurred. Thomas Russell might as well have sent along a town crier to announce in stentorian tones that the messenger was from him. The uniform was well known to all Kyrenes. I was told to wait for an answer, sir, said the man, saluting. It is urgent. Oh, <laughs> yes. With maddening deliberation, Emerson extracted a sheet of paper from the envelope. I stood on tiptoe to read it over his shoulder. Professor Emerson, I believe you can be of assistance to the police in a case which came to my attention early this morning. The evidence of your son is also required. Please come to my office at the earliest opportunity. Sincerely, Thomas Russell. P.S. Do not bring Miss Forth. I'll be there in two hours, Emerson said to the officer. Oh, no, Emerson, we must go straight away. How can you bear the suspense? He wouldn't have... Two hours, Emerson bellowed, drowning me out. The policeman started convulsively, saluted, banged his hand painfully against the stiff brim of his helmet, and galloped off. I'm sorry, Emerson, I murmured. Hmm, yes. You are sometimes as impulsive as... Ah, oh, Nefret, have you finished the photographing? No, sir, not quite. She was bareheaded, her cheeks rosy with heat, her smile broad and cheerful. Selim came rushing into the tomb and said there was a policeman here asking for you. Are you under arrest, or is it Aunt Amelia? Standing behind her, so close that the hair on the crown of her golden head brushed his chin, Ramsay said lightly, My money's on Mother. 
damned if I know what he wants, Emerson grumbled. He might have had the courtesy to say, assist the police indeed. No, I suppose we'd better go. We? Ramses repeated. You and I. But this must be about what happened in the Khan the other night, Nefret exclaimed. I wondered why the police hadn't got round to questioning us. We must all go. It's our duty as good citizens to assist the police. Emerson looked hopefully at his son. Ramses shrugged, shook his head and inquired, Precisely what do you think we should tell them? Ah, Nefret stroked her chin in unconscious, or perhaps it was conscious, imitation of Emerson. That is a good question, my boy. I am against telling the police about our arrangement with Farouk. They are such blunderers. We do not, at the present time, have an arrangement with him, Emerson interrupted. And this, my dear, is not a symposium. I will make the decision after I have heard what Russell has to say. Salim, keep the men at it for another two hours. You know what to watch out for. Stop at once if... My dear, he does know what to watch out for, I said. Why are you telling him again? Damnation, Emerson shouted. And off he stalked, bareheaded and coatless, alone and unencumbered. He had gone some little distance before it dawned on me that he was heading for Manor House, where we had left the horses. Nefret let out a mildly profane exclamation and started to run after him. Don't forget the cameras, Ramses said. You bring them. Curse it, he needn't think he can get away from me. Lips compressed, Ramses entered the tomb chamber and began packing the cameras. The ever-present grit and dust was hard on the delicate mechanisms. It would not have done to leave them uncovered any longer than was absolutely necessary. I hesitated for only a moment before following him. She cannot come with us, he said, without looking up. Mr. Russell specifically mentioned that we were not to bring her, but you and he are both being silly. She is a surgeon. She's seen horrible wounds and performed operations. I see we're thinking along the same lines. Ramses drew the straps tight and slung the case over his shoulder. It is one possible explanation for his failure to meet you, but it may not be the right one. Let us not look on the dark side. The way our luck has been running, it's difficult not to. The words were flung at me from over his shoulder. He had already started off. I broke into a trot and caught him up. There is no need to hurry. Your father won't leave without us. Sorry. He slowed his steps. After a moment of frowning concentration, he said, Were you included in the invitation? Not in so many words, but... But you're coming anyhow. Naturally. Naturally. We left for Cairo as soon as we had changed. Russell was waiting for us in the reception area of the administration building. If a bare, dusty room containing two cracked chairs and a wooden table could be called by that name. His face was set in a look of frozen disapproval, which cracked momentarily when he saw Nefret. No, he exclaimed loudly. Professor, I told you. He couldn't prevent me from coming, Nefret said. She gave him a smile and held out a small, daintily gloved hand. You wouldn't be so rude as to exclude me, would you, sir? For once, Nefret had met her match. Russell took her hand, held it for no more than two seconds, and stepped back. I could, and I would, Miss Forth. What the professor chooses to tell you and Mrs. Emerson hereafter is his affair. Police matters are my affair. Take a chair. One of the men will bring you tea. Come to my office, gentlemen. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. I asked you here, Russell said, his voice as cold and formal as his manner, because one of my men informed me you were present the night before last when we raided Aslimi's shop. Did you get a look at the fellow we were after? Yes, Emerson said. You followed him, didn't you? Yes, caught him too, Emerson added. Damnation, Professor! You have the infernal gall to stand there and tell me you let the fellow go? I told you when we first discussed the subject that I would not help you capture Wardani, but that I would attempt to speak with him and convince him to turn himself in. Emerson's voice was as loud as Russell's. Ramses didn't doubt that every police officer in the building was in the corridor, listening. It wasn't Wardani, 
Well, I didn't know that, did I? Emerson demanded indignantly. Not until after I'd cornered the fellow. As it turned out, he was one of Wardana's lieutenants. We um, came to an agreement. Would you care to tell me what it was? No, I may do after I've spoken with him. It's too late for that, Russell said. Come with me. They followed him along the corridor and down several flights of stairs. Being underground, the room was a few degrees cooler than the floors above, but not cool enough. The smell hit them even before Russell opened the door. The only furnishings were a few rough wooden tables. All but two were unoccupied. Russell indicated one of the shrouded forms. Damned inefficiency, he muttered. That one should have been bedded this morning. He's not keeping well. Here's our lad. He pulled the coarse sheet off the other corpse. Farouk's face was unmarked, except for a line of bruising around his mouth and across his cheeks. If he had died in pain, which he certainly had, there was no sign of it on the features that had settled into the inhuman flatness of death. His naked body showed no signs of injury, except for his wrists, which were not a pretty sight. The ropes had dug deep into his flesh, and he must have struggled violently to free himself. Russell gestured, and two of his men turned the body over. From shoulders to waist, the skin was black with dried blood over a patchwork of raised welts. After a moment, Emerson said, The Kobash. How can you tell? Emerson raised his formidable eyebrows. You can't. Why, man, it's an old Turkish custom. The marks left by a whip made of hippopotamus hide are quite different from those of a cat o' nine tails or bamboo rod. I've seen it before. Ramses had seen it too, once. Like Farouk, the man had been beaten to death. Unlike Farouk, he hadn't been gagged. He'd screamed till his voice gave out, and even after he lost consciousness, his body convulsed at every stroke of the whip. An old Turkish custom, and one Ramses would have experienced if his father hadn't burst on the scene before they started on him. The memory still made him break out in a cold sweat of terror, and it was one of the reasons why he had agreed to take Wardani's place. Anything that would help keep the Ottomans out of Egypt. Fingering his chin, Emerson added, Government by Korbash. Popular in Egypt as well. We outlawed the Korbash years ago, Russell said stiffly. Emerson shot out a series of questions. Any other marks on the body? How long has he been dead? Where was he found? Answer my question first, Professor. What question? Oh, that question. Emerson scowled. If we're going to engage in a prolonged discussion, I would prefer to do it elsewhere. He led the way back to Russell's office, where he settled himself in the most comfortable chair, which happened to be the one behind Russell's desk. Again, Russell left the door ajar. The ensuing dialogue, Ramses couldn't have got a word in even if he'd wanted to, got louder and more acrimonious as it proceeded. Emerson extracted the information he had demanded and gave a grudging, carefully edited account of their activities in the Khan el-Khalili on the night in question. Why didn't you tell my men about the back entrance? Russell shouted. Emerson glared at him. Why didn't they have the rudimentary intelligence to look for one? Confound it, Professor! Russell brought his fist down on the desk. If you hadn't interfered... If I hadn't, the fellow would have got clean away. He agreed to meet with me because he trusted my word. And because you offered him a bribe? Well, yes, Emerson said in mild surprise. As my dear wife always says, it is easier to catch a fly with honey than with vinegar. Unfortunately, it appears the other side got wind of his intentions. Not my fault if he was careless. Well, well, that's everything, I think. Come along, Ramses. We've wasted enough time assisting the police. Trying to do their job for them, rather. He got up and started for the door. Just a damned minute, Professor. Russell jumped up and went after him. I must warn you. Warn me, Emerson thundered. He whirled round. Ramses decided it was time to interfere. 
His father was enjoying himself immensely, and he was in danger of getting carried away by his role. Please, sir, he exclaimed. Mr. Russell is only doing his duty. I told you we oughtn't get involved. I might have expected you would say that, Russell said contemptuously. Thank you for coming, Professor. You are one of the most infuriating individuals I've ever encountered. But I admire your courage and your patriotism. Bah! said Emerson. He gave the door a shove. A dozen pair of boots beat a hasty retreat. Ramses lingered only long enough to breathe a few words and see Russell's nod of acknowledgement. Still in character, Emerson stamped into the waiting room, collected his womenfolk, and swept the entire party out of the administration building. Well? Lefret demanded. It was he, Emerson replied. What was left of him? Found early this morning lying in an irrigation ditch near the bridge. Dead approximately twelve hours. How did he die? Emerson told her. He didn't go into detail, but Nefret had an excellent imagination and a good deal of experience. Some of the pretty colour left her face. That's horrible. They must have found out he meant to betray them. But how? The most likely explanation, Ramses said slowly, is that he told them himself and demanded more than father had offered. Oh, yes, I know. It wouldn't have been a sensible move. But Farouk was arrogant enough to think he could bargain with them and get away with it. Being more sensible than he, they simply disposed of an unnecessary and untrustworthy ally, and in a manner that would have a salutary effect on others who might be wavering. An old Turkish custom, Emerson repeated. They have a nasty way with enemies and traitors. Cursing somewhat mechanically, he dislodged half a dozen ragged urchins from the bonnet of the motor car and opened the door for Nefret. As Ramses did the same for his mother, he saw that her eyes were fixed on him. She'd been unusually silent. She had not needed his father's tactless comment to understand the full implications of Farouk's death. As he met her unblinking gaze, he was reminded of one of Nefret's more vivid descriptions. When she's angry... Her eyes looked like polished steel balls. That's done it, he thought. She's made up her mind to get David and me out of this if she has to take on every German and Turkish agent in the Middle East. This ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. Hope springs eternal in the human breast, particularly in mine for I am by nature an optimistic individual. As we drove into Cairo, I told myself that Russell's summons did not inevitably mean the dashing of our hopes. Farouk might have been captured, and the end of Ramsay's deadly masquerade might be in sight. I tried to prepare myself for the worst while hoping for the best. Not an easy task, even for me. Yet the hideous truth hit harder than I had anticipated, Equally difficult was concealing the depth of my anger and despair from Nefret. She had only hoped we might do our country a service by destroying a ring of spies. She could not know that we had a personal interest in the matter. I had to bite my lip to control my anger, with Farouk for being stupid enough to get himself killed before we could interrogate him, and with the unknown fiends who'd murdered him so horribly. How much had he told them before he died? The worst possible answer was that Farouk had penetrated Ramsay's masquerade and had passed the information on to those who would not hesitate to dispose of Ramsay's as they had done Farouk. The most hopeful was that he had told them only of our arrangement with him. We could certainly assume that the enemy knew we were on their trail. The conclusion was obvious. We must go on the offensive. I remained pensively silent, considering various possibilities. They were provocative enough to take my attention off Emerson's driving for once. Are we taking tea at Shepherd's? Nefret asked in surprise. I thought you would want to return home so we can discuss this unpleasant turn of affairs. There's nothing to discuss, said Emerson, coming to a jolting halt in front of the hotel. But, Professor, the matter is finished, 
Emerson declared. We made the attempt. We failed. There were no fault of our own. We can do no more. Curse it, the damned terrace is even more crowded than usual. Don't these idiots have anything better to do than dress in fashionable clothes and drink tea? He charged up the stairs, drawing the fret with him. We never have any difficulty getting a table at Shepherd's, no matter how busy it is. The arrival of our motor car had been noted by the head waiter. By the time we reached the terrace, a bewildered party of American tourists had been hustled away from a choice position near the railing, and a waiter was clearing the table. I leaned back in my chair and glanced casually at the vendors crowded round the stairs. They were not allowed on the terrace or in the hotel, a rule enforced by the giant Montenegrin doorman, but they came as close as they dared, shouting and waving examples of their wares. There weren't two flower sellers, but neither of them was David. Poor David. I almost wished that the failure of our hope could be kept from him. There was no chance of that, though. By now he might have heard of it from other sources. Gossip of that sort spreads quickly. There is nothing so interesting to the world at large as a grisly murder. One of the disadvantages of appearing in public is that one is forced to be civil to acquaintances. I dare say that Emerson's scowling visage deterred a number of them from approaching us, but Ramsay's pacifist views hadn't made him persona non grata to the younger women of Cairo. As Nefret had once put it, rather rudely in my opinion, it's quite like a fox hunt, Aunt Amelia. The marriageable maidens after him like a pack of hounds, while their mamas cheer them on. We hadn't been seated long before a bevy of fluttering maidens descended on us. Some made straight for Ramsay's, while those who favoured more indirect methods greeted Nefret with affected shrieks of pleasure. Darling, what have you been doing? We haven't seen you for ages. I've been busy, Nefret said. But I'm glad to see you, Sylvia. I intended to pay you a little call. What the devil do you mean, writing those lies to Leah? Well, really, one of the other young women exclaimed. Sylvia Gorst turned red with embarrassment and then white with terror. The glint in Nefret's blue eyes would have frightened a braver woman than she. You know of Leah's situation, Nefret said. A friend would wish to avoid worrying or frightening her. You've written her a pack of gossip, most of it untrue, and all of it malicious. If I hear of your doing it again, I'll slap your face in public and... and... Proclaim your perfidy to the world, Ramsay suggested. The corners of his mouth were twitching. Not quite how I would have put it, but that's the idea, Nefret said. Sylvia burst into tears and was removed by her twittering companions. Good God, Emerson said helplessly. What was that all about? You were very rude, Nefret, I said, trying to sound severe and not entirely succeeding. What was it she told Leah? Something about me, I presume, Ramsay said. No doubt you meant well, Nefret, but that temper of yours... Nefret shrank as if from a blow, and he stopped in mid-sentence. She pushed her chair back and stood up. I'm sorry. Excuse me. You shouldn't have reproached her, Ramses, I said, watching the fret hasten toward the door of the hotel, her head bowed. She's already begun to regret her hasty speech. She always does after she loses her temper. I didn't mean what she thought I meant. He looked almost as stricken as Nefret. Damn it, why do I always say the wrong thing? Because women always take everything the wrong way, Emerson grumbled. When Nefret came back, she was smiling and composed, and accompanied. Lieutenant Pinkney, looking very pleased with himself, was with her. Naturally, with a stranger present, none of us referred to the small unpleasantness. Emerson wouldn't have been deterred by the presence of a stranger, but he still had no idea what the fuss had been about. After greeting Lieutenant Pinkney, I allowed the young people to carry on the conversation. As my eyes wandered over the faces of the other patrons, I was reminded of something the fret had said. I feel that everyone I see is wearing a mask and playing a part. 
I had the same feeling now. All those vacuous, well-bred and not-so-well-bred faces. Could one of them be a mask, concealing the features of a deadly foe? There was Mrs. Fortescue, clad as usual in black, surrounded as usual by admirers. Many of them were officers. Many of them were highly placed. To judge from her encounter with Ramses, the lady, to give her the benefit of the doubt, was no better than she should be. Philippides, the corrupt head of the CID, was also among those present. Was he a traitor as well as a villain? Mrs. Pettigrew was staring at me, and so was her husband. The two round red faces were set in identical expressions of supercilious disapproval. No, surely not the Pettigrews. Neither of them had the intelligence to be a spy. The swirl of a black cloak. Count de Sevigny, stalking like a stage villain toward the entrance of the hotel. He did bear a startling resemblance to another villain I had once known, but Kalenichev was long dead, killed by the man he had attempted to betray. Ramses excused himself and rose. I watched him descend the stairs and plunge into the maelstrom of howling merchants who immediately surrounded him. Since he was a head taller than most of them, it wasn't difficult for me to follow his progress. He examined the wares of several flower sellers before approaching another man, bent and tremulous with age. As soon as Ramses had made his purchase, the fellow ducked his head and withdrew. The pretty little nosegays were rather wilted. Ramses presented one to me and the other to Nefret. She looked up at him with a particularly kindly expression. It was clear she'd taken the flowers as a tacit apology and that all was forgiven. Since she had been deep in conversation with young Mr. Pinckney, I felt sure she hadn't seen the exchange. Emerson was fidgeting. He had only agreed to come to Shepherd's to enable Ramses to communicate with David. Now that that was done, he allowed his boredom to show. Time we went home, he announced, interrupting Pinckney in the middle of a compliment. I had no objection. I had found the inspiration I sought. It is impossible to indulge in ratiocination while driving with Emerson. What with bracing oneself against sudden jolts and warning him about camels and other impediments and trying to prevent him from insulting operators of other motor cars, one's attention is entirely engaged. I was therefore forced to wait until we reached the house before applying my mind to the idea that had come to me on the terrace of Shepherd's. A long, soothing bath provided the proper ambiance. Sethos was in Cairo. I began with that assumption, for I did not doubt it was so. I have no formal training in Egyptology, but I have spent many years in that pursuit, and the particular circumstances surrounding the discovery of the statue hadn't escaped me. I am sure I need not explain my reasoning to the informed reader which includes the majority of my readers, she or he must have reached the same conclusion. The statue had been placed in the shaft within the past few days, and there was only one man alive who could have and would have done it. As for Sethos's motives, they were equally transparent. He was taunting me, announcing his presence, defying me to stop him should he choose to rob the museum or the storage magazines or the site itself. I had realized early on that the present confusion in the Antiquities Department and in Egypt would be irresistible to a man of Sethos's profession. Some might wonder why he had announced himself by giving up one of his most valuable treasures. I felt confident it was one of Sethos's little jokes. His sense of humor was decidedly peculiar. The joke would be on us if he managed to steal the statue back. What a slap in the face that would be for Emerson. I leaned back, watching the shimmer of reflected water on the tiled ceiling of the bath chamber. There was no doubt in my mind that Emerson had reached the same conclusion. Very little having to do with Egyptology escapes him. Of course, the dear, innocent man did not suppose I was clever enough to think of it. He'd not told me for the same reason I'd kept silent. The subject of Sethos was somewhat delicate. Emerson knew I'd never given him cause to be jealous, but... Jealousy, dear reader, is not under the control of the intellect. 
had I not myself felt its poisonous fangs penetrate my heart. Yes, I had. As for Sethos, he had made no secret of his feelings. Early in our acquaintance, he had tried on several occasions to remove his rival, as he considered Emerson, once before my very eyes. Later, he had sworn to me that he would never harm anyone who was dear to me. Obviously, that included Emerson, and I sincerely hoped that Sethos agreed. Just to be on the safe side, I decided I had better find him before Emerson did. I had no doubt I could succeed. Emerson had not my intimate knowledge of the man. Emerson would not recognize him in any disguise, as I could do, as I had done, as I believed I had. I must have a closer and longer look at the man I suspected. The reader may well ask why, if I believe Sethos to be guilty of nothing worse than stealing antiquities, I should try to find him instead of concentrating on the viler villain, the enemy agent who might also be a traitor to his country. I will answer that query. In his day, Sethos's web of intrigue had infiltrated every part of the criminal underworld of Egypt. He knew every assassin, every thief, every purveyor of drugs and depravity in Cairo. He could draw upon that knowledge to identify the man I was after. And by heaven he would, for I would force him to do so. I raised my clenched fist toward the tiled ceiling to reinforce that vow, narrowly missing the nose of Emerson, who had crept up on me unobserved and unheard, owing to the intensity of my concentration. Good gad, Peabody, he remarked, starting back. If you want privacy, you need only say so. I beg your pardon, my dear, I replied. I did not know you were there. What do you want? You, of course. You have been in here for almost an hour. And, Emerson added, studying my toes, you are as wrinkled as a raisin. What were you brooding about? I was enjoying the cool water and lost track of the time. Would you care to help me out? I knew he would, and hoped that the ensuing distraction might prevent him from asking further questions. I was correct. It was rather late by the time we were dressed and ready to go down. I assumed the others had already done so, but I stopped at Ramsay's door to listen. The door opened so suddenly I was caught with my head tilted and my ear toward the opening. Eavesdropping, Mother? Ramsay's inquired. It is a shameful habit, but cursed useful, I said, quoting something he'd once said, and was rewarded by one of his rare and rather engaging smiles. Are you ready to go down to dinner? Ramses nodded. I was waiting for you. I wanted to have a word with you. And I with you, said Emerson. You had no opportunity to write a note. What did you tell David? To meet me later this evening. We need to discuss this latest development. Bring him here, I urged. I yearn to see him. Not a good idea, Emerson said. No. Ramses gestured for us to proceed. There is a coffee shop in Giza village where I go from time to time. They're accustomed to seeing me and wouldn't be surprised if I got into conversation with a stranger. The scheme was certainly the lesser of several evils. Meditating on possible methods of lessening the danger still more, I led the way to the drawing room. Nefret had been writing letters. How slow you all are tonight, she exclaimed, putting down her pen. Fatima's been twice in to say dinner's ready. We'd better go straight in then, I said. Mahmoud always burns the food when we're late. We got to the table just in time to save the soup. I thought I detected a slight undertaste of scorching, but none of the others appeared to notice. Good to have a quiet evening, Emerson declared. You aren't going to the hospital, Lefred? I rang Sophia earlier, and she said I'm not needed at present. Nefret had changed, but not into evening attire. Her frock was an old one, of blue muslin sprigged with green and white flowers. It might have been for sentimental reasons that she had kept it. Emerson had once commented on how pretty she looked in it. I plan to develop some of the plates this evening, she went on. I've got rather behind. Will you give me a hand, Ramses? I'm going out, Ramses replied rather brusquely. For the entire evening? 
She raised candid blue eyes, eyes the same shade as her gown. The innocent question had an odd effect on Ramses. I knew that enigmatic countenance well enough to observe the scarcely perceptible hardening of his mouth. Just to the village for a bit. I want to hear what the locals have to say about the statue. Do you think they're planning to steal it? Nefret asked, laughing. I'm sure some of them would like to, Ramses replied. I won't be late. If you'd like to wait a few hours, I'll be happy to assist. I offered my services instead, and Nefret accepted them. It was an odd conversation altogether. We talked, as we usually did, of our work and our future plans, but I could see that even Emerson had to force himself to take an interest. Not so odd, perhaps, considering that three of the four of us were concealing something from the fourth. After dinner, we went to the parlour for coffee. Several letters had been delivered while we were out. Despite the general reliability of the post, many of our acquaintances clung to the old habit of sending messages by hand. There was one for me from Catherine van der Gelt, which I read with a renewed sense of guilt. We have seen so little of the van der Gelts, I said. Catherine writes to remind us of our promise to visit them at Abusir. Emerson started as if he'd been stung. Damnation! What is it, Emerson? I cried in alarm. Something in that letter? No. no yes. Emerson crumpled the missive and shoved it in his pocket. In part. It is from Maxwell, asking me to be present at a meeting tomorrow. Another example of the cursed distractions that have plagued this season. I meant to go to Abu Sir several days ago. A war is something of a distraction, Nefret said dryly. You're probably the only man on that committee who knows what he's talking about, Professor. You are doing Egypt a great service. Emerson said, <laughs> and Nefret added, This can't last forever. Someday, quite right, I said. You will do your duty, Emerson, and so will we all. And some day... Nefret and I spent several hours in the dark room. When we emerged, both Emerson and Ramses were gone. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Ramses could remember a time when carriages and camels and donkeys transported tourists to the pyramids along a dusty road bordered by green fields. Now taxis and private motor cars made pedestrian traffic hazardous, and the once isolated village of Giza had been almost swallowed up by new houses and villas. Bedeker, the Bible of the tourist, dismissed it as uninteresting, but every visitor to the pyramids passed through it along the road or the train station, and the inhabitants preyed on them as they had always done, selling fake antiquities and hiring out donkeys. The town relapsed into somnolence after nightfall. Its amenities were somewhat limited, a few shops, a few coffee shops, a few brothels. The coffee shop Ramses favoured was a few hundred yards west of the station. It was not as pretentious as the Kyrene equivalents, a beaten earth floor instead of tile or brick, a simple support of wooden beams framing the open front. As he approached, Ramses heard a single voice rising and falling in trained cadences, which were broken at intervals by appreciative laughter or exclamations. A reciter or storyteller was providing entertainment. He must have been there for some time, for he was deep in the intricacies of an interminable romance entitled The Life of Abu Zaid. A few lamps hanging from the wooden beams showed the Shire perched on a stool placed on the mustaba bench in front of the coffee shop. He was a man of middle age with a neatly trimmed black beard. His hands held the single-stringed viol and bow with which he accompanied his narrative. His audience sat round him, on the mustaba or on stools, smoking their pipes as they listened with rapt attention. The narrative, part in prose, part in verse, described the adventures of Abu Zaid, more commonly known as Barakat, the son of an emir 
who cast him off because his dark skin cast certain doubts on the honor of his mother. The emir did his wife an injustice. Barakat's coloring had been bestowed on him by a literal-minded god in response to the lady's prayer. Soon, from the vault of heaven descending, a black-plumaged bird of enormous weight pounced on the other birds and killed them all. To God I cried, O oh, compassionate, give me a son like this noble bird. Waiting in the shadows, Ramses listened appreciatively to the flexible, melodic voice. It was quite a story, as picaresque and bloodthirsty as any Western epic, and it was conveniently divided into sections or chapters, each of which ended in a prayer. When the narrator reached the end of the current section, Ramses stepped forward and joined the audience in reciting the concluding prayer. He and his father were among the few Europeans whom Egyptians addressed as they would a fellow Muslim, probably because Emerson's religious views, or lack thereof, made it difficult to classify him. At least, one philosophical speaker had remarked, he is not a dog of a Christian. Emerson had found that highly amusing. Ramses exchanged greetings with the patrons and politely saluted the reciter, whom he had encountered before. Refreshing himself with the coffee an admirer had presented to him, the shair nodded in acknowledgement. Ramses edged gradually away from the attentive audience and into the single dirt-floored room. Only two creatures had resisted the lure of the narrator. One was a dog, sound asleep and twitching, under a bench. The other was stretched out on another bench, and he too appeared to be asleep. Ramses shoved his feet rudely off the bench and sat down. "'Have you no poetry in your soul?' he inquired. "'Not at the moment.' David pulled himself into a sitting position. I heard. I feared you would. He told David what had happened, or failed to happen the night before. How they got wind of his intentions, I don't know, unless he tried to blackmail them. David nodded. So that's the end of that. What do we do now? Back to the original plan. What else can we do? There was no answer from David, who was leaning forward, his head bowed. I'm sorry, Ramses said. He decided they could risk speaking English. The narrator's voice was sonorous, and no one was paying attention to them. Don't be an ass. Never mind the compliments. There's one thing we haven't tried. Trailing the Turk? Yes. The first time I encountered him, I was prevented from doing so. The second time, you were prevented by your concern for me. There will be at least one more opportunity, and this time we'll have to do more than follow him. As you cogently pointed out, we need to learn not where he's going, but where he came from. He's only a hired driver, and he's probably amenable to bribery or persuasion. But that means we'll have to take him alive, which won't be easy. The professor would be delighted to lend a hand, David murmured. Are you going to let him in on it? Not if I can help it. You and I can manage him. One more delivery. So I was told. It has to be soon, you know. At least Farouk is out of the picture. If they try to replace him, we'll know who the spy is. Are you trying to cheer me up? Apparently I'm not succeeding. One can't help wondering, David said evenly, what he told them. The kurbash is a potent inducement to confession. What could he tell them, except that the great and powerful father of curses had tried to bribe him? He didn't know about you or, or the rest of it. He knew about the house in Mardi. Ramsay swore under his breath. It had been a forlorn hope that David's quick mind would overlook that interesting fact, a fact whose significance had apparently eluded his father. Not that one could ever be sure with Emerson. Listen to me, he said urgently. Father's private arrangement with Farouk was a diversion that had nothing to do with our purpose. We didn't sign on to smash a spy apparatus, we're only trying to prevent an ugly little revolution. If we can do that and come out of it with whole skins, we'll be damned lucky. I refuse to get involved in anything else. They can't expect it of us. You had better lower your voice. Ramses took a long, steadying breath. And you'd better go. I meant what I said, David. Of course. David rose and moved noiselessly toward the doorway. 
Then he pulled back with a muffled exclamation. Ramses joined him and looked out. There was no mistaking the massive form that occupied a seat of honour in the centre of the audience. Emerson was smoking his pipe and listening attentively. "'What's he doing here?' David whispered. "'Playing nursemaid,' Ramses muttered. "'I wish he wouldn't treat me like you did the same for him last night.' "'Oh.' David let out a soundless breath of laughter. "'He saved me the trouble of following you home. "'Till tomorrow.' Bowing his head to conceal his height, he began working his way slowly through the men who stood nearby. Ramses moved forward a step and leaned against the wooden frame, as if he'd been standing there all along. He knew his father had seen him. Emerson had probably spotted David, too, but he made no move to intercept him. He waited politely until the wail of the viol indicated the end of another chapter, and then rose and went to meet Ramses. They took their leave of the other patrons and started on the homeward path. Anything new? Emerson inquired. No. There was no need for you to come after me. Emerson ignored this churlish remark, but he did change the subject. I'm worried about your mother. Mother? Why? Has something happened? No, no, no. It's just that I know her well, and I detected an all-too-familiar glint in her eyes this afternoon. She has not my gift of patience, said Emerson regretfully. What was that? Did you say something? No, sir. Ramsay stifled his laughter. About mother? Oh, yes. I think she's about to take the bit in her teeth and go on the warpath. I had the same impression. Did she tell you what she's got in mind? I hope to God she isn't going to confront General Maxwell and tell him he must call the whole thing off. No, I'm going to do that. What? You can't. I could, as a matter of fact. Emerson stopped to refill his pipe. Calm yourself, my boy. You're becoming as hot-tempered as your sister. Sometimes I think I'm the only cool-headed individual in this entire family. He struck a match, and Ramses managed with some difficulty to refrain from pointing out that this might not be such a wise move, if anyone had been following them. Apparently no one had. Emerson puffed happily and then said, But I shan't. There is no meeting of the committee tomorrow. That was just my little excuse for calling on him. What the devil, there is too bloody much in direction in this affair. I want to know what Maxwell knows and tell him what I think he ought to hear. Don't worry, I shall be very discreet. Yes, sir. Argument would have been a waste of time. One might as well stand on the path of an avalanche and tell the rocks to stop falling. Emerson chuckled. You don't believe I can be discreet, do you? Trust me. As for your mother, I think I know what she has in mind. She thinks she has spotted Sethos. I intend to allow her to pursue her innocent investigations because she is on the wrong track. How do you know? Because, said Emerson, I know... Because I know the fellow she suspects is not he. Who is it she suspects? The Count. Emerson chuckled. Oh, I agree with you. He's too obvious. Quite. They were near the house. I've got to run into Cairo for a while, Ramsay said. I will accompany you. He had expected that and braced himself for another argument. No, it's not one of my usual trips, father. Uh, there is someone I must see. Uh, I, I won't be long. I'll take one of the horses, not Richer, he's too well known, and be back in an hour or so. Emerson stopped short, looming like a monolith. At least tell me where you're going. Just in case. He didn't have to say it. And he was right. El Garbis. Emerson's breath went out in an outraged explosion, and Ramses hastened to explain. I know he's a crawling serpentine trafficker in human flesh and all that, but he's got connections throughout the Cairo underworld. I saw him once before, when I was trying to find out where that poor devil who was killed outside Shepherds got his grenades. He told me several interesting things. I think he wants to see me again. He didn't stop by the hospital because he was concerned about that girl. Not him, 
Emerson rubbed his chin. Hmm, you could be right. It's worth the time, I suppose. Are you sure you don't want... I'm sure. It'll be all right. You always say that. Not always. Anyhow, what would Mother do if she found out you'd gone to El Wasa? Ramses left the horse, a placid gelding Emerson had hired for the season, at Shepherd's, and went on foot from there, squelching through the noisome and nameless muck of the alley to the back entrance he'd been shown. His knock was promptly answered, but El Gabi kept him waiting for a good quarter of an hour before admitting him to his presence. Swathed in his favourite snowy robes, squatting on a pile of brocaded cushions, El Gabi was shoving sugar dates into his mouth with one hand and holding out the other to be kissed by the stream of supplicants and admirers who crowded the audience chamber. He gave a theatrical start of surprise when he saw Ramses, who hadn't bothered to alter his appearance beyond adding a moustache and a pair of glasses. As he had learned, the most effective disguise was a change in one's posture and mannerisms. Clapping his hands, El Gabi dismissed his sycophants and offered Ramses a seat beside him. She's a pearl, he announced, a gem of rare beauty, a gazelle with dove's eyes. Now, my dear, don't glower at me. You don't like me to praise your lady's loveliness? No. I was curious. So much devotion from so many admirers. Having seen her, I understand. She has strength and courage as well, that one. Such qualities in a woman. What did you want to see me about? I? The coal lining his eyes cracked as he opened them wide. It is you who have come to me. When Ramses left the place a quarter of an hour later, he wasn't sure what El Gabi had wanted him to know. Fishing for facts in the murky waters of the pimp's innuendos was a messy job. Once again, Percy had been the main subject, his affairs with various respectable women... The secret, except to the all-knowing El Gabi, hideaways where he took them, his brutal handling of the girls of the Red Blind District. Ramses thought he would probably never know for certain what Percy had done or was doing to annoy El Gabi. Damaging the merchandise might be a sufficient cause. But one fact was clear. El Gabi wanted Percy dead or disgraced, and he wanted Ramses to do the job for him. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. Chapter 10 I decided to admit Nefret to my confidence. Up to a point. We were finishing the last of the photographic plates when I explained my intentions, and for a moment I feared I'd spoken too soon. Nefret managed to catch the plate before it broke, however. Sethos, she exclaimed. The Count? Aunt Emilia! Put that down, my dear. That is right. Come into the other room and I will explain my reasoning. I wasn't surprised to find Emerson missing. I'd known he would go after Ramses to guard him, and if he hadn't, I would have done it myself. Nefret did not comment on his absence. She assumed that he'd also decided to visit the coffee shop. I sat Nefret down in a chair and explained my deductions about the statue. I could see that the notion made sense to her. In fact, she tried to tell me she thought of it herself. Emerson and Ramses do that sort of thing all the time, so I simply raised my voice and proceeded with the next stage of my deductions. I was struck on the few occasions when I have glimpsed him by the Count's resemblance to a villain I once knew named Kalinichev. He was a member of Sethos's gang and a thoroughgoing scoundrel. When he attempted to betray his dread master, Sethos had him killed. Yes, Aunt Amelia, I know. Oh, I told you about him. You told us about many of your adventures, and Ramses told David and me about others. Her face softened in a reminiscent smile. 
We would foregather in Ramsay's room or mine, smoking forbidden cigarettes and feeling like little devils, while we discussed your exploits. They were much more exciting than the popular romances. I was gratified, but I felt obliged to add, with the additional advantage of being true. Oh, yes. Sethos has upon occasion mimicked the appearance of a real person, I continued. I believe he finds it amusing. The fact that the Count has consistently avoided me is also suspicious. Without wishing to boast, I believe I may claim that many newcomers to Cairo try to strike up an acquaintance with me or Emerson. He hasn't avoided me, Nefret murmured. I gave her a sharp look. She was twisting a lock of hair round her finger. It gleamed like a ring of living gold. Hmm. Well, that makes my scheme all the more plausible. I would like you to ask the Count to take you to dine tomorrow night. At one of the hotels, naturally. You must not under any circumstances go off alone with him. You can think of some plausible excuse, such as... Uh, I can think of an excuse, Lefred said. You are serious about this, aren't you? My dear, you can hardly suppose I would ask you to commit such a breach of good manners unless I were. It's not surprising that you should not have suspected the Count. You never met Sethos. Nefret's lips curved. I've always wanted to. That smile aroused certain forebodings, which I felt obliged to express. You must abandon your girlish romantic notions about Sethos. Don't try to outwit him. Just get him there. I suggest shepherds so that I can have a good long look at him. Of course, I will be disguised. Ah, said Nefret. Disguised? How? Leave that to me. I hear that wretched dog barking. It must be Emerson and Ramsay's. Are we agreed? I will do anything you ask, Aunt Amelia. Anything. If this will help. She let the sentence trail off into silence. I knew I could count on you. Pray do not mention our little scheme. Aren't you going to tell the professor, at least? That will depend on... Ah, there you are, my dears. Did you enjoy your evening, Arnold? We have accomplished a great deal of work while you were amusing yourselves. By rousting us out at the crack of dawn, Emerson managed to get in several hours at the site before he left to attend his meeting with General Maxwell. He had repeated to me what Ramses had told him about his conversation with David. Nothing new had been learned, but at least I had the comfort of knowing that as of ten o'clock last night, David was still alive and well. It wasn't comfort enough. Every passing day increased the danger, and I was all the more determined to put an end to the nasty business. Having worked out a course of action which I felt certain would achieve this goal, I was able to concentrate more or less successfully on our archaeological activities. With Emerson gone, I was the person in charge. I explained my intentions to Nefret, Ramses and Selim. I never had to explain anything to Daoud, since he always did exactly what I told him to do. No one admires Emerson's methodology more than I, but in my opinion we've been dawdling over this masturba longer than we ought. Selim, I want that second chamber completely cleared today. Ramsay said, Mother, Selim said, but sit Kim. Nefret grinned. Her grin vanished when I went on, raising my voice loud enough to silence Ramsay's and Selim. Nefret and I will both examine the fill. Ramsay's, you can help Selim label the baskets as they are filled. Make certain you identify the precise square and level from which each is taken. In that way, I believe, Mother, that Selim and I are both familiar with the technique, Ramsay said. His eyebrows had taken on a remarkable angle. Selim's beard parted just a slit. Yes, Sitakim. I smiled at Daoud, whose large countenance bore its customary expression of placid affability. Then let us get at it. I dare say my words spurred them all to even greater energy. Daoud kept the Ducavie cars moving. Nefret and I sifted basket after basket, finding very little. Since I wanted to impress Emerson with our efficiency, I kept everyone at it long past the hour at which we ordinarily stopped for luncheon. Not until Ramses came to join us did a belated realisation of other responsibilities strike me. 
He had, of course, misplaced his hat. Though he feels the heat less than most, his luxuriant black locks had tightened into curls, and his wet shirt stuck rather too closely to his chest and shoulders. The well-developed muscles it moulded were somewhat asymmetrical. Despite my effort to reduce the size of the bandages, I could only hope Nefret's eyes were not as keen as mine. She hadn't commented on Ramsay's recent habit of always wearing a shirt on the dig. We've come across something rather interesting, he announced. You'll need to get photographs, Nefret. She jumped up, her face brightening, and Ramsay's offered me his hand to help me rise. I would have waved it away, but truth compels me to admit I was a trifle stiff. Sitting in the same position for several hours has that effect, even on a woman in excellent physical condition. The chamber had been emptied almost to floor level. There were some fine reliefs and another false door, but that was not what caught my eye. Beyond the south wall, the men had exposed the walls of another, smaller chamber, whose existence none of us had suspected. I realized at once that it must be a surdab, a room containing a statue of the deceased. Through a narrow slit in the wall between the surdab and the chapel, the soul of the dead man or woman could communicate with the outer world and partake of offerings. How did you find it? I asked, scrambling along the surface to a point where I could look down into the chamber. Enough of the fill had been removed to define the inner side of the walls. Only one of the original roofing stones remained. A scattering of chips on the surface of the rubble inside the room suggested that the others had fallen and shattered. I happened to notice that what had appeared to be only a crack in the wall was suspiciously regular, so I dug outside it and found stonework. Running his fingers through his hair, he went on. The plan of the mastaba is more complex than we realised. There's an extension of as yet indeterminate size to the south. As for the Serdab, you can see why I want photographs before we continue emptying it. You think there is a statue down there? One can only hope. Yes, yes, I exclaimed. Hurry, Nefret, get the camera. We arranged measuring sticks along the walls and against them, and Nefret took several exposures. I was all for continuing, but a general outcry overruled me. We ought to wait for father, Ramsay said, and Nefret added, in a fair imitation of Miss Molly's best wine, I'm hungry. An explosive sigh from Selim expressed his opinion, so I gave in. Scarcely had we begun unpacking our picnic baskets when I beheld Emerson approaching. There was something very strange about his appearance. For one thing, he was still wearing the tweed coat and trousers I'd made him put on. To see Emerson in a coat at that time of day, on the dig, indicated a state of mental preoccupation so extreme as to be virtually unprecedented. Further evidence of preoccupation was provided by his blank stare and his frequent stumbles. He looked like a sleepwalker, and it appeared to me that he was in serious danger of falling into a tomb. So I shouted at him. His eyes came back into focus. Oh, there you are, he said. Lunch? Good. We have found the Sir Dab, Emerson, I announced. The what? Oh. Emerson took a sandwich. Very good. Visibly alarmed, Nefret took him by the sleeve and tried to shake him. The monumental form of Emerson was not to be moved thus, but the gesture and her exclamation did succeed in getting his attention. Professor, didn't you hear? A serdab. Statues. At least we hope so. Is something wrong? Did the general have bad news? I cannot imagine, said Emerson stiffly. What makes you suppose I am not listening, or what leads you to surmise that there is bad news? A serdab. Excellent. As for the general, he was no more annoying than usual. He put the rest of his sandwich in his mouth and chewed. I had the impression he was employing mastication to give him time to invent a story. Inspiration came. He swallowed noisily and went on. The damned fools are talking about a corvée. Forced labour battalions. Ramses, who had not taken his eyes off his father, said, That would be disastrous. 
especially at the present time, and a direct violation of Maxwell's assurance that Great Britain would not demand aid from the Egyptian people in this war. Emerson agreed. I hope I persuaded him to give up the idea. That is all? Nefret demanded. It is enough, isn't it? An entire morning wasted on a piece of bureaucratic bombast. Emerson pulled off his coat, tie, waistcoat and shirt. I picked them up from the ground and collected several scattered buttons. Back to work, Emerson went on. Have you taken photographs? Ramses, let me see your field notes. Peabody, get back to your rubble. Emerson's exasperation at discovering he had been in error about the plan of the Mastaba was so extreme, I was unable to get a private word with him for some time. After further excavation had exposed the head of a statue and Nefret was taking her photographs, I finally managed to remove Emerson to a little distance. What happened, curse it? I demanded. What happened where? Emerson tried to free himself from my grasp. You know where, I hissed, or would have done had that phrase contained any sibilance. Something about Ramses? Tell me, Emerson, I can bear anything but ignorance. Oh. Emerson's heavy brows drew apart, and his eyes softened. You are on the wrong track entirely, my dear. The situation is no worse than it was. In fact, it has been made safer by the removal of that wretched man. Maxwell assured me that the police will act within a fortnight, as soon as the final shipment of arms is delivered. A fortnight? Two more weeks of this? Perhaps we can shorten it. I waited for him to go on. Instead, he put his arm round me and pressed his lips to my temple, the end of my nose and my mouth. Yes, Professor, I thought, perhaps we can. And if you think you can distract me... You are sadly in error. However, I am not childish enough to reciprocate in kind when someone tries to deceive me. I bided my time until we stopped work for the day. The Sir Dab contained not one but four statues, all crammed together in that confined space. They were of private individuals, the tomb owner and his family, so they were not of the same superb quality as the statue of Caffrey we had found in the shaft. But they had a naive charm of their own, and all were in excellent condition. Leaving them half buried for their own protection, we started for home, while several of our trustiest men remained on guard. Ramses also remained, ostensibly to discuss security measures with the men. He would go directly from Giza to his assignation. In point of fact, there was no way on earth I could keep Emerson entirely in the dark concerning my plans for the evening. If he did not observe my absence and Nefret's earlier, he would certainly do so when he discovered he was alone at the dinner table. I therefore determined to give him a very slightly modified account of the truth when we were alone. It is always good policy to go on the attack when one's own position is somewhat vulnerable, so I began by asking him what he had meant by suggesting that there might be a method of ending Ramsay's masquerade earlier than Maxwell had said. He was in the bath at the time. Uh, let me add that my choice of location was not an attempt to undermine his confidence. Most individuals become self-conscious and uneasy when they are unclothed. This has never been one of Emerson's weaknesses. One might even claim... But I perceive that I'm wandering off the subject. Having assumed undergarments and dressing gown, I went to the bath chamber, which is in the Turkish style. I had caused cushions to be placed round the bath itself, and I settled myself on one of these before addressing my spouse. The pleased smile with which he had welcomed my appearance vanished. I might have known you would not let the subject drop, he remarked. Yes, you might. Well... Emerson reached for the soap. As you have no doubt realized, locating the supply lines would enable us to intercept and catch the people who are bringing the weapons to Cairo. I am fairly familiar with the eastern desert, and I have a theory as to the most likely route. I thought I might ride out that way and have a look round. It was an idea that had not occurred to me. When? Tomorrow. Yes, I said slowly. Hmm. You can't get all the way to Suez and back in a single day. 
I don't plan to go all the way. It will mean an early start, though, and I may be late returning. You won't go alone? Certainly not, my dear. I will take Ramsay's, if he chooses to come. Emerson, are you going to use that entire bar of soap? Except for his head, the parts of him above water were white with soap bubbles. Emerson grinned. Cleanliness is next to godliness, my dear. Here, catch. The bar of soap slipped through my hands, and by the time I had retrieved it and replaced it in the proper receptacle, Emerson had submerged himself and was rising from the bath. Now, he said, reaching for a towel, I have confided in you. It is your turn. You are up to something, Peabody. I can always tell. What is it? I explained my plan. I expected objections. What I got was a whoop of laughter. You think the Count is Sethos? I didn't say that. I said that he was a highly suspicious character. Most people strike you that way, but never mind. The threat agreed to this preposterous, uh, this interesting scheme. I did not return his smile. Her mind is not at ease, Emerson. I know the signs, and I know Nefret. We cannot take her wholly into our confidence, but we can provide her with a safe outlet for that restless energy of hers. Well, Peabody, you may be right. Emerson's broad chest expanded as he heaved a mighty sigh. It is damned unpleasant keeping things from Nefret. We will tell her the whole story after it's over. Of course, my dear. So... You agree with my plan? I accept it. I can do no more. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. When Ramses got back to the house, he found his father alone in the drawing room. Emerson looked up from the paper he was holding. Well? Ramses answered with another question. Where are Mother and Nefret? Out. You can speak freely. How did it go? No one tried to kill me, which I suppose can be taken as a positive sign. Ramses loosened his tie and dropped into a chair. The lads aren't very happy, though. Assad threw himself into my arms, shrieking with relief, and the others are demanding action. I had the devil of a time calming them down. They'd heard about Farouk. Everybody in Cairo's heard about Farouk and about his encounter with us. Ah, said Emerson. Well, one might have expected that piece of news would get about. Especially after your shouting match with Russell, Ramses rubbed his forehead. One of the actions Rashad suggested was assassinating you. He volunteered. Emerson chuckled. I hope you dissuaded him. I hope so, too. That's the trouble with these young firebrands. When they get excited, they want to run about the streets attacking people. I bullied them into taking my orders this time, but I don't know how much longer I can control them. And the last delivery? That's another disturbing development. Assad picked up the message yesterday. He didn't know what it said until I deciphered it. The code is pretty primitive, but I'm the only one who has the key. The merchandise won't be delivered directly to us as before. It will be hidden somewhere, and we'll be told when and where to collect it. Damnation, Emerson said mildly. No idea when? No. I had a brief conversation with... A soft tap at the door warned him to stop speaking. It was Fatima, offering coffee and food. He had to eat a slice of plum cake before she would leave. With David? Emerson asked. Ramses nodded. We met on the train platform. He went one way and I the other. There wasn't much to say. He finished the slice of cake. Where's Mother got to? Following a fret, Emerson said. He chuckled. In disguise. What? Would you like a whiskey and soda? No, thank you, sir. I've drunk enough over the past few weeks to turn me into a teetotaler, even if most of it did go out the window or into a potted plant. Intoxication is a good excuse for many aberrations, Emerson agreed. He sipped his own whiskey appreciatively. As for your mother... She took it into her head to go spy hunting. She persuaded Nefret to dine with one of her suspects. The Count? How did you know? It's like Mother to fix on such a theatrically suspicious-looking character. 
I don't believe he's an enemy agent, but I wouldn't trust him alone with a woman I cared about. They won't be alone, Emerson replied. You don't suppose your mother will let them out of her sight, do you? Ramsay's alarm was replaced by a horrible fascination of the sort his mother's activities often inspired in him. What's she disguised as? he asked. A series of bizarre images passed through his mind. Well, she borrowed that yellow wig you used to wear when you weren't so tall and could still pass as a female, and eyeglasses, and a good deal of face paint. Emerson's reminiscent smile broadened into a grin. Don't worry, Selim is with her. I must say, the top bush looked even more absurd on him than it does on most people. But he was tremendously pleased with himself. Oh, good Lord, what's he supposed to be? One of those slimy terrassiers who prey on foreign women? There is a question, said Emerson reflectively, of who preys on whom. The ladies are under no compulsion. Anyhow, they will all enjoy themselves a great deal, and it served to get the fret out of the way so that we can have a private conversation. Pull up a chair. He opened the paper he had been looking at and spread it out on the table. It was a map of the Sinai and the Eastern Desert. If you could find out how the weapons are being brought in and catch the people who are bringing them, that would put an end to this business of yours, wouldn't it? Possibly. It would take them a while to find alternate routes, but they don't have that much time. Emerson took out his pipe. There will be an attack on the canal within a few weeks. There are reports of troop movements in Syria, toward Ajua and Kosema on the Egyptian frontier. Those complacent idiots in Cairo have decided against defending the border. They think the Turks can't cross the Sinai. I think they are wrong. The same complacent idiots have concentrated our forces on the west of the canal. The few defence posts on the east bank could be taken by a determined goatherd. Now, look here. The stem of his pipe stabbed at the long dotted line that marked de Lesseps' great achievements. Our people have cut the canal bank and flooded the desert to the north for almost twenty miles. That still leaves over sixty miles to be defended. Boats are patrolling the bitter lakes, but the rest of it is guarded by a few trenches and a bunch of Lancashire cotton farmers. There's also the Egyptian artillery and two Indian infantry divisions all of whom are Muslims. What if they respond to the call for jihad? They aren't that keen on the Turks. Let us hope not. In any case, there aren't enough of them. There are over a hundred thousand of the enemy based near Beersheba. I won't ask how you found that out. It is common knowledge. Too common. I'd be willing to wager that Turkish High Command knows as much about our defences as we do. Insofar as your little problem is concerned, transporting arms across the Sinai to the canal or the Gulf of Suez would not present much difficulty. The question is, how are they getting the arms from there to Cairo? You know the terrain of the eastern desert? How well do you know it? Well enough to know that there are only a few practical routes between Cairo and the canal. Ramses leaned closer to the map. The northern routes are the ones we use, and there is a good deal of traffic along them, by road and rail. Aside from the problem of crossing the bitter lakes with gunboats patrolling them, the terrain south of Ismailia is difficult for camels or carts. It's not a sand desert, it's hilly and rocky, broken by wadis. Some of the mountains are 6,000 feet high. So, Emerson inquired, like a patient teacher encouraging a slow child. At least that was how it sounded to his son. So the most obvious route is this one. He indicated a dotted line that ran straight from Cairo to Suez. The old caravan and pilgrim trail to Mecca. It's also the most direct route. I agree. Why don't we go out tomorrow and have a look? Are you serious? Certainly. The strong line of Emerson's jaw hardened. Sooner or later, they will have to inform you of the precise date of their attack. So you can time your little revolution to coincide. But if they have the sense I give them credit for, they'll wait until the last possible moment. I want you and David out of this, Ramses. 
It... it worries your mother. I'm not especially happy about it either, Ramses said. Your idea is worth a try, I suppose. Ramses was even less enthusiastic than he had admitted. It seemed to him extremely unlikely that they would find anything. He understood his father's motive for suggesting the search, though. Mordani's crowd weren't the only ones who were finding it hard to wait. After they'd settled on the details, Emerson picked up a book and Ramses went to the window. The shadowy, starlit garden was a beautiful sight, or would have been to one who did not see prowlers in every shadow and hear surreptitious footsteps in every rustle of the foliage. He wondered morosely whether he would ever be able to enjoy a lovely view without thinking about such things. Knowing his family, the answer was probably no. Even when there wasn't a war, his mother and father attracted enemies the way wasps were drawn to a bowl of sugar water. There were things he ought to be doing, going over the copies of the tomb inscriptions, checking them with Nefret's photographs. His father ought to be working on his excavation diary. Ramses knew why Emerson was sitting there, pretending to read. He hadn't turned a page for five minutes. How much did it cost him to let his wife go off alone, looking for trouble and possibly finding it? Ramses knew the answer. He felt it too, like a dull headache that covered his entire body. It was almost midnight before they returned, for once his father's hearing was keener than his. Emerson was out of his chair before Ramses heard the motor car. They came in together, his mother and Selim, and Ramses sank back into the chair from which he had risen. Outraged laughter struggled with pure outrage. His mother was bad enough, but Selim... Where did you get that suit of clothes? he demanded. Selim whipped off his tarbouche and struck a pose. He had oiled his beard and slicked his hair down. The black coat was too tight across the chest and too long. It had lapels of gold brocade. Ramses turned his stricken gaze to his mother. The eyeglasses rode low on her nose. The flaxen blonde wig had slipped down over her forehead. And what in heaven's name had she done to her eyebrows? Catching his eye, she shoved the wig back onto the top of her head. Selim was driving quite fast, she explained. Sit down and tell us all about it, said Emerson, too relieved to be critical. You too, Selim. I want to hear your version. Nothing loath. Selim gallantly held a chair for his lady of the evening. And she looked like one too, Ramses thought. It went very well, Selim said with a broad, pleased smile. No one knew us, did they, Sit? Certainly not said Ramsay's mother. We had a quiet dinner. Nefret was dining with the Count. He kissed her hand very often, said Selim. What did she do? Emerson demanded. She laughed. Involuntarily, Emerson glanced at the clock, and his wife said, I did not think it advisable to wait and follow them. They were lingering over coffee when we left, but she should be here before long. What if she's not? Emerson's voice rose. Then I will have a few words with her. And I, said Emerson, will have a few words with the Count. There'll be no need for that. Here she is now. Nefret came in. Her face was flushed and her eyes sparkled. Ramses found himself in the grip of a severe attack of pure, primitive jealousy. If she had let that monocled swine kiss her... Did that swine dare to embrace you in the cab? Emerson demanded furiously. Nefret burst out laughing. He tried, but he didn't succeed. He's really very entertaining. Aunt Amelia, what do you think? I was mistaken. This admission stopped Emerson in mid-expletive. He stared open-mouthed at his wife. What did you say? I said... I was mistaken. But it was good of you, Nefret, to make the effort. It was still dark when they left the house next morning. Ramses on Risha and his father on the big gelding he had hired for the season. They crossed the river on the bridges that spanned the Isle of Roda. The molten rim of the sun had just appeared over the hills when they reached the Abbasir quarter on the edge of the desert. 
There wasn't much there except a few hospitals, a lunatic asylum, and the Egyptian army military school and barracks. Emerson turned his horse toward the barracks. The road's that way, Ramses said, and wished he hadn't, when his father said patiently, Yes, my boy, I know. Ramses closed his mouth, and after a moment his father condescended to explain. Maxwell reminded me that the military keep a close eye on people heading into the eastern desert. We will report to the officer on duty and comply with the rules. It was a reasonable explanation, which was why Ramses doubted its truth. His father's usual reaction to rules was to ignore them. Early as it was, the officers were already at the mess. Emerson sent a servant to announce his presence. The horse was a large animal, and so was Emerson. When several people emerged from the building, he did not dismount, but looked down on them from his commanding height with an air of affable condescension. Some of them were known to Ramses, including a tallish man wearing a kilt, who gave Ramses a stiff nod and then introduced himself to Emerson. Hamilton, he barked. Emerson, heard of you, and I you. Hamilton drew himself up, threw his shoulders back, and stroked his luxuriant red moustache. He was at a disadvantage on foot, and he was reacting like a rooster meeting a bigger rooster. Hadn't expected to see you here. No, why should you have done? Following your rules, sir, following your rules. We are on a little archaeological exploration today. There's a ruined structure out there, a few miles southwest of the well of Sit Miriam. I've been meaning for years to have a closer look. The Major's narrowed eyes measured Emerson, from his smiling face to his bared forearms, brown as an Arab's and hard with muscle. He seemed to approve of what he saw, for his stern face relaxed. Probably Roman, he said gruffly. Ah. Emerson took out his pipe and began to fill it. You know the place. I've done a bit of hunting in the area. There are ancient remains all over the place, way stations and camps for the most part. Hardly of interest to you. For the most part, Emerson agreed. However, one never knows, does one. Well, gentlemen, we must be off. A moment, sir, Hamilton said. You are armed, aren't you? Emerson gave him a blank stare. Armed? What for? One never knows, does one? The other man smiled faintly. Allow me to lend you this, just for the day. He reached under his coat and pulled out a revolver, which he offered to Emerson. To Ramsay's surprise, his father accepted it. Most kind. I'll try not to damage it. He tried to put it in his trouser pocket, dropped it, caught it in midair, and finally managed to get it into the pocket of his coat. Watching him, one of the subalterns said doubtfully, You do know how to use it, sir. You point it and pull the trigger? Ramses, who knew that his father was an excellent shot, with pistol or rifle, smothered a smile as the young man's face lengthened. Well, sir, more or less... Most kind, Emerson repeated. Good day to you, gentlemen. After they'd gone a little distance, Emerson drew the weapon out of his pocket, broke it and spun the cylinder. Fully loaded and functional. Did you think it wouldn't be? Happened to me once before, Emerson said equably. A nasty, suspicious mind, that's what I've got. Particularly when people with whom I am only slightly acquainted do me favours. He seemed cordial enough, Ramsay said. Even to me. Highly suspicious, his father said with a chuckle. Ah, oh, well, perhaps he was won over by my extraordinary charm of manner. If anyone's charm had influenced the Major, Ramses thought, it wasn't yours or mine. He could only hope Nefret had not put ideas into the old fellow's head. He wouldn't be the first to make that mistake. Not that a Wibley is likely to be of much use, Emerson continued, slipping the gun into his belt. Cursed things are cursed inaccurate. What sort of weapon have you got? No use asking how his father knew. Maybe he'd noticed the bulge under Ramsey's arm. The Mauser semi-automatic pistol was big and heavy, but for accuracy and velocity, it couldn't be beaten. Ramsey's handed it over, adding, 
If one must carry one of the vile things, it might as well be the best. Emerson examined and returned the weapon. I presume this is a contribution from the Turks. Mm, yes, a nice touch of irony, that. Once they had reached the top of the plateau, the ground leveled off. The old trail was only slightly harder and better defined than the surrounding desert. Not the blowing sand dunes of the western desert, but baked earth and barren rock. There were signs of traffic, camel and donkey dung, the whitened bones of animals stripped of flesh by various predators, an occasional cigarette end, the shards of a rough pottery vessel that might have been there for 3,000 years or three hours. No sign that the man they were after had passed that way. No sign that he hadn't. As the sun rose higher, the pale brown of sand and rock turned white with reflected light. At Ramsay's suggestion, his father put his hat on. By midday, they had gone a little over 30 miles, and through the shimmering haze of heat, Ramsay's made out a small clump of trees in the distance. About time, said Emerson, who had seen it too. Like Risha, his horse was desert-bred, and neither had been ridden hard, but they deserved a rest and the water that lay ahead. They were still several hundred yards away from the miniature oasis when a voice hailed them, and a group of men on camels appeared over a rise north of the track. They rode straight for the Emersons, who stopped to wait for them. Bedouin, inquired Emerson, narrowing his eyes against the glare of sunlight. Camel patrol, I think. Whoever the men were, they carried rifles. Ramses added, I hope... The uniformed group executed a neat maneuver that barred their path and surrounded them. Their dark, bearded faces would have identified them even without their insignia. Punjabis, belonging to one of the Indian battalions. Who are you, and what are you doing here? the Jemadar demanded. Show me your papers. What papers? Emerson said. Curse it, can't you see we are English? Some Germans can speak English. There are spies in this part of the desert. You must come with us. Ramses removed his pith helmet and addressed one of the troopers, a tall bearded fellow with shoulders almost as massive as Emerson's. Do you remember me, Dalip Singh? he inquired in his best Hindustani. We met in Cairo last month. It wasn't very good Hindustani, but it had the desired effect. The man's narrowed eyes widened, and the impressive beard parted in a smile. Ah, you are the one they call brother of demons. Your pardon, I did not see your face clearly. Ramses introduced his father, and after an effusive exchange of compliments from everyone except the camels, they rode on toward the oasis, escorted fore and aft by their newfound friends. A rim of crumbling brickwork surrounded the cistern that was locally known as Sit Miriam's Well. Almost every stopping place along the desert paths had a biblical name and legend attached to it. According to believers, they marked the route of the escape into Egypt or the wanderings of Joseph or the Exodus. There was not much shade, but they took advantage of what little there was. The camels lay down with their usual irritable groans and Ramses watered the horses, filling and refilling his pith helmet from the turgid waters. Emerson and the Jemadar sat side by side, talking in a mixture of English and Arabic. Knowing he could leave the questioning to his father, Ramses joined the troopers for a brief language lesson. At first, all of them except Dalip Singh were somewhat formal with him, but his attempts to speak their language and his willingness to accept correction soon put them at ease. He had to have the jokes explained. Some of them were at his expense. Finally, the laughter got too loud, and the Jemadar, like any good officer, recalled his men to their duties. They went off in a cloud of sand. Emerson leaned back and took out his pipe. When did you learn Hindustani? Last summer. I'm not very fluent. Why did that fellow grin at you in such a familiar manner? Well, I suppose we did get a bit familiar. Wrapped in one another's arms, in fact. His father gave him a critical look, and Ramses elaborated. He boasted that he could put any man in the place on his uh, back, so I took him up on it. 
He taught me a trick or two, and I taught him one. What did the Jemadar say? Emerson sucked on the stem of his pipe. I'm beginning to think that we're on the wrong track. Since he appeared to be oblivious of the pun, Ramses let it go. Why? Emerson finally got his pipe going. Those chaps and others like them patrol the area between here and the canal by day and by night. The Jemadar insisted nothing as large as a wagon could have got by them on this track. You know how sound carries at night. They might have used camels along this stretch. Camels make noise too, especially when you hope they won't. Bloody-minded brutes, Emerson added. I see what you mean. Ramses lit a cigarette. It's become altogether too complicated, hasn't it? Land transport from the Syrian border, transfer to boats or rafts, then reloading a second time for the trek across the desert, with the whole area under surveillance. There are other routes, longer but safer, from the coast west of the Delta, or from Libya. The Ottomans have been arming and training the Senussi tribesmen for years. The Senussis hate Britain because she supported the Italian conquest of that area. They would be happy to cooperate in passing on arms to Britain's enemies, and they have sympathizers all along the caravan routes from Siwa westward. They smoked for a while in companionable silence. We may as well start back, Ramsay said. Since we've come this far, Emerson began. Not your damned ruins, father. The place isn't far, only a few miles. If we aren't back by dark, mother will come after us. She doesn't know where we are, Emerson said, with evil satisfaction. It won't take long. We can water the horses again on our way back. He knocked his pipe out and rose. Ramses hadn't the courage to argue, though he wasn't happy about his father's decision. The sun had passed the zenith and had started westward. The air was still blisteringly hot, and the flies seemed to have multiplied a thousandfold. As he feared, Emerson's few miles turned out to be considerably longer. Ahead and to the right, the imposing ramparts of the Araka Mountains stood up against the sky. Another, larger range was visible to the north of the track. Finally, Emerson turned south, skirting the steep slopes of one of the smaller jebels. There, he said, pointing. At first glance, the heaps of stones looked like another natural outcropping. Then Ramses saw shapes too regular to be anything but man-made. Low walls, a tumbled mass that might once have been a tower or a pylon. There was a long cylindrical shape, too, half buried by sand. That could be a fallen column. Emerson's eye couldn't be faulted. This was no way station. Ramses followed his father, who had urged his reluctant steed into a trot. He was ten feet behind Emerson when he heard the sharp crack of a rifle. Emerson's horse screamed, reared, and toppled over. Ramses pulled Risha up and dismounted. He hadn't been aware of drawing his pistol until he realized he was holding it. Avoiding the thrashing hooves of the wounded animal, he finished the poor creature with a bullet through the head and squeezed off a few random shots in the direction from which the firing had come before he dropped to his knees beside his father. Emerson had jumped or been thrown off, probably the former, since he had had time enough and sense enough to roll out of the way of the horse's body. He lay motionless on his side, his arms and legs twisted and his eyes closed. Torn between the need to get him to shelter and the fear of moving him, Ramses carefully straightened his legs, feeling for broken bones. The change in the rhythm of his father's breathing made him look up. Emerson's eyes were open. Did you get him? he inquired. I doubt it, Ramses said, drawing a deep breath. Taught him to keep his head down, I hope. Were you hit? No. Anything broken? No. Better get ourselves and Risha behind that wall. He sat up, turned white, and fell backwards. Ramses caught him before his head, now uncovered, hit the ground. He'd been sick with fear when he feared his father might be dead or gravely injured. Now the lump in his throat broke and burst out of his mouth in a furious cascade of words. God damn you, father! Will you stop behaving as if you were omnipotent and omniscient? 
I know we must get under cover. I'll take care of that little matter as soon as I determine how seriously you're injured. Emerson gave his son a look of reproach. You needn't shout, my boy. I put my shoulder out for game, that's all. That's all, is it? They both ducked their heads as another shot whistled past. All right, here we go. Hang on to me. After an effort that left them both breathless, they reached the shelter of the ruined wall, with Risha close on their heels. Ramses eased his father onto the ground and wiped his sweating hands on his trousers. Better let him have a few more reminders to keep his head down, Emerson suggested. Father, Ramses said, trying not to shout, if you make one more unnecessary, insulting, unreasonable suggestion... Yes, sorry, Emerson said meekly. I don't want to waste ammunition. I haven't any extra. It'll be dark in a few hours, and we're all right here unless he shifts position. If he moves, I'll hear him. I'm going to put your shoulder back before I do anything else. Need I continue? Your arm. It isn't... His eyes met those of Ramsay's. <laughs> Whatever you say, my boy. Ramsay's had heard the story of how his father's shoulder had first been dislocated. His mother's version was very romantic and very inaccurate. According to her, Emerson had been struck by a stone while shielding her from a rockfall. Ramses could believe that all right. What he didn't believe was her claim that she herself had pulled the bone back into its socket. Such an operation required a lot of strength, especially when the victim was as heavily muscled as Emerson. Nefret had once demonstrated the technique, using Ramses as a subject, with such enthusiasm that he could have sworn her foot had left a permanent imprint under his arm. For a few agonizing moments, Ramses didn't think he was going to be able to do it. His right arm was unimpaired, though, and the left was of some little help. A final heave and twist, accompanied by a groan from Emerson, the first that had passed his lips, did the job. Weak need and shaking, Ramses unhooked the canteen from Risha's saddle. The process had been more agonizing for his father than for him. Emerson had fainted. Ramses trickled water over his face and between his lips, then poured a little into his own hand and wiped his mouth. It was the same temperature as the air, but it helped. His father's face was already dry and warm to the touch. Water evaporated almost instantly in the desert air. Father, he whispered. Now that the immediate emergencies had been attended to, he had leisure to think about what he had said. Had he really sworn at his father and called him? Well done, said Emerson faintly. Done at any rate. Have a drink. I'm sorry it's not brandy. Emerson chuckled. So am I. Your mother will point out, as she has so often, that we ought to emulate her habit of carrying such odds and ends. He accepted a swallow of water and then pushed the canteen away. Save it. Mine is on the body of that unfortunate animal, and it's not worth the risk of... <clears throat> May I smoke? You're asking me? I suppose so. Better now than after dark. You don't mean to stay here until dark, do you? What else can we do? Ramsay demanded. He took the pipe from his father. After he'd filled it, he handed it back and struck a match. Risha can't carry both of us, and it would be insane to expose ourselves to a marksman of that caliber. He dropped your horse with the first shot, and the others came unpleasantly close. The rifle spoke again. Sand spurted up from beside the carcass of the horse. The second bullet struck its body with a meaty thunk. He's somewhere on that rocky spur to the southeast, Ramses said. Emerson opened his mouth. Ramses anticipated him. Forget the binoculars. A flash of reflected sunlight would give him his target. I fired three, no, four times. That leaves me with only six shots and... And a rifle has greater range than a pistol, Emerson said. You needn't belabor the obvious, my boy. It appears we'll be here a while. 
Ramses looked round. A few yards to his right, the ground dropped into a kind of hollow, bordered on two sides by the remains of the wall. He indicated the place to his father, who was graciously pleased to agree that it offered better protection for all concerned. He even accepted the loan of Ramsay's arm. Getting Risha into shelter was a more nerve-wracking procedure, but they made it into the hollow without incident. They celebrated with another swallow of warm water and another smoke. The slanting rays of sunlight beyond their shelter had turned gold. Someone will come looking for us in the morning, Ramsay said. No doubt. He seemed to have accepted the idea of waiting for rescue. That wasn't like him. Ramses had other ideas, but he did not intend to propose them. Short of knocking his father over the head, there was no way he could keep Emerson from trying to help him. And he didn't want help, not from an injured man who also happened to be someone he... someone he loved. Emerson had dropped off to sleep his head resting on Ramsay's folded coat. Ramsay's watched the shadows darken across his father's still face and wondered why they all found that word so difficult. He loved both his parents, but he'd never told them so. He doubted he ever would. They had never said it to him either. Was the word so important? He'd never seen his mother cry until the other night, and he knew that tears had been for him tears of worry and relief, and perhaps even a little pride. It had been a greater acknowledgement of her feelings than hugs and kisses and empty words. All the same. Emerson's eyes opened, and Ramsay started, as embarrassed as if his father could read his private thoughts. Emerson hadn't been asleep. He'd been thinking. Were our brilliant deductions about the route wrong after all? I don't think so, Ramsay said. There'd be no point in killing us to prevent us from telling the authorities what we found. We haven't found a damn thing. It's more likely that someone took advantage of our being out here in the middle of nowhere to rid himself of... Father, it's me he's after. I'm damned sorry I got you into this. Don't be a bloody fool, his father growled. No, sir. Emerson's eyes fell. It took Ramses several long seconds to interpret his expression correctly. He couldn't remember ever seeing his father look guilty. Downcast eyes, tight mouth, bowed head. It was guilt right enough, and all at once he understood why. No, he said again. I didn't get you into this, did I? You went out of your way to find Hamilton this morning. You told him we were coming here. You... His father coughed apologetically. Go on, he muttered. Call me anything that comes to mind. I was the bloody fool. I knew that between the two of us we could deal with a few assassins or an ambush. But I didn't count on falling off the damned horse. If harm comes to you because of my clumsiness and stupidity, I will never forgive myself. Neither will your mother, he added gloomily. It's all right, father. He felt an incongruous rush of pleasure between the two of us. Did his father really think that highly of him? In fact, there's no one I would rather... Well, you know what I mean. Too English, David would have said. Both of them. Emerson raised his head. Uh, yes, I, I feel the same. <clears throat> Having got his effusive display of emotion out of his system, he accepted a cigarette from the tin Ramses offered and allowed him to light it. What made you suspicious of Hamilton? Ramses asked. Hamilton? Emerson looked surprised. No, no, my boy, you mistake me. I do not suspect him of anything except being a crashing bore. But the other night you implied you had identified Sethos. Don't deny it, father. You wouldn't have been so certain Mother was on the wrong track if you hadn't suspected someone else. I thought, well, curse it. Hamilton's avoidance of us was suspicious, wasn't it? I was mistaken. As soon as I set eyes on him, I knew he wasn't our man. I mentioned our destination to him as a precaution, so that if we did run into trouble, someone would know where we were heading. Oh. 
a number of the officers overheard my conversation with Hamilton. One of them might have mentioned our intentions to other people. You see what that means, don't you? We're talking about a limited circle of people, all English, officers and gentlemen. One of them is working for the enemy. He had time to get out here before we arrived. Or send someone here to wait for us. Or reach someone by wireless. Emerson shifted uncomfortably. He was obviously in pain, though he would rather have died than admit it. Ramses unbuckled the holster, took off his shirt, and began tearing it into strips. Let me strap your shoulder. The fret showed me how. You can't do much worse than your mother, said Emerson, with a reminiscent grin. It was her petticoat she tore up. Women used to wear dozens of them. Useful for bandages, but cursed inconvenient in other ways. Astonishment made Ramses drop one end of the cloth he was holding. Had that been a mildly risque double entendre? Nothing double about it, in fact. But to hear his father say such a thing about his mother. Greatly daring, he said. I expect you manage, though? Emerson chuckled. Mm, yes. Thank you, my boy. It's much better. Why don't you try to get some sleep? We've nothing better to do. Wake me in four hours, Emerson muttered. We'll take it in turns to keep watch. Yes, sir. In four hours, it would be dark and the moon would be up. It was a new moon, but there would be light from the brilliant stars. Ramses wasn't sure what he was going to do, but he had to do something. Desert nights were bitterly cold, and they had no blankets and very little water. Emerson had left his coat, canteen, weapon, everything except his precious pipe on the saddle of the dead horse. Risha stood quietly, his proud head bent. He would have to go hungry and thirsty that night, too. Ramses would have given him the last of the water had he not wanted it for his father. Well, they would survive, all of them, and he'd have been willing to stick it out if the worst they had to fear was discomfort. Would the assassin give up when darkness fell? Bloody unlikely, Ramses thought. If I'd send him, I'd want proof that he'd done the job. A grisly picture flashed through his mind. Egyptian soldiers, after a battle, piling up their trophies of victory. Sometimes they collected the hands of the enemy dead. Sometimes it was other body parts. Ramses began to unlace his boots. The sun had just set, and a dusky twilight blurred the air when he heard the sound he'd been expecting. It was only the faint rattle of a pebble rolling, but in the eerie silence of the desert it was clearly audible. He strained his ears, but heard nothing more. Not an animal, then. Only a man bent on mischief would take pains to move so quietly. He eased himself upright and moved cautiously along the wall, his bare feet sensitive to the slightest unevenness on the surface of the ground. The bastard knew where they were, of course, but a stumble or a slip would warn him that they were awake and on the alert. Then... He heard another sound that literally paralyzed him with surprise. Hello, is someone there? A sudden glare of light framed the speaker. A British officer in khaki drill jacket and short trousers, cap and putties. He threw up his arm to shield his eyes. I see someone is, he said coolly. Better switch that off, old boy. The fellow who was firing at you has probably taken to his heels. But one ought not take chances. Emerson was on his feet. Injured, sick, or half dead, he could move as silently as a snake. And he'd obviously not been asleep. Looking for us, were you? he inquired. Yes, sir. You are Professor Emerson, one of the Camel Corps chaps, heard gunfire earlier. And since you'd not turned up, some of us went out looking for you. You aren't alone? Three of my lads are waiting for me at the mouth of the wadi where I left my horse. A spot of scouting seemed to be in order. Is your son with you? 
pressed against the wall, Ramses held himself still. He could see the man's insignia now, a lieutenant's paired stars and the patch of the Lancashire 42nd. His hands were empty and the holster at his belt was fastened. The impersonation was almost perfect, but it was damned unlikely that the military would send a patrol at this hour of the night to search for mislaid travellers. And although his accent was irreproachable, the intonations were just a bit off. Ramses had to admire the man's nerve. The ambush had failed, and he was hoping to settle the business before daylight brought someone out looking for them. Emerson was rambling on, asking questions and answering them, like a man whose tongue had been loosened by relief. He kept the torch pointed straight at the newcomer's eyes, though, and he hadn't answered the question about Ramsay's whereabouts. "'Fred, I'll have to ask the loan of one of your horses,' he said apologetically. "'Banged myself up a bit, you see. "'If uh, you could give me your arm.' For a second or two, Ramsay thought it was going to work. The officer nodded affably and took a step forward. The pistol wasn't in his holster. He had stuck it through his belt behind his back. Ramses had a quick, unpleasant glimpse of the barrel swinging in his direction and aimed his own weapon. But before he could fire, Emerson dropped the torch and launched himself at the German. They fell at Ramses' feet. By some miracle, the torch hadn't gone out. Ramses saw that the slighter man was pinned to the ground by Emerson's weight, but his arms were free, and he was trying to use both of them at once. His fist connected with Emerson's jaw as Ramses kicked the gun out of the other hand. Emerson let out a yell of pure outrage and reached one-handed for the German's throat. Ramses swung his foot again, and the flailing body went limp. Emerson sat up, straddling the man's thighs, and rubbed his jaw. Sorry for being so slow, sir, Ramses said. Emerson grinned and looked up. Two good arms between the two of us. Not so bad, eh? You saved my life again. I'd say the score was even. I tried to blind him, but his night vision must be almost as good as yours. He went for you first because he took me to be unarmed and incapacitated. Now, what shall we do with him? Ramses lowered himself to a sitting position, wondering if he would ever be able to match his father's coolness. Tie him up, I suppose. I'll be damned if I know what with, though. Yards of good solid cloth in those putties. Yeah, I think he's waking up. Stick that pistol of yours in his ear. He's a feisty lad, and I'd rather not have to argue with him again. It struck Ramses as a good idea, so he complied. Emerson got the torch and positioned it more effectively before he began unwinding the strips of cloth from round the fellow's legs. Ramses studied the man's face curiously. It was a hard face, narrow across the forehead and broadening to a heavy jaw and protruding chin. But the mouth, relaxed in unconsciousness, was almost delicate in outline. He was younger than he had appeared. Hair, moustache and scanty brows were fair, bleached almost to whiteness by the sun. His lips moved, and his eyes opened. They were blue. Sind Sie ruhig, Ramsey said. Rühren Sie sich und ich scheiße. Verstehen Sie? I understand. You prefer English? inquired Emerson, wrapping strips of cloth round the booted ankles. It's no good, you know. You gave yourself away when you pulled that gun. I know. Are you alone? The pale blue eyes rolled toward Ramsay's and then looked down. Emerson had managed to knot the strip of cloth by holding one end between his teeth. With his lips drawn back, he looked like a wolf chewing on a victim's torn garments. The German swallowed. What are you going to do with me? Take you back to Cairo, Ramsay said, since his father was still tying knots. First we have a few questions. 
I strongly advise you to answer truthfully. My father is not a patient man, and he's already rather annoyed with you. You torture prisoners, the boy tried to sneer. He can't be much over twenty, Ramses thought. Just the right age for a job like this, all afire to die for the fatherland or the motherland or some equally amorphous cause, but not really believing death can touch him. He must have attended school in England. Good God, no, Emerson said. But I cannot guarantee what will happen to you in Cairo. You are in enemy uniform, my lad, and you know what that means. Cooperate with us, and you may not have to face a firing squad. First, I want your name, and the name of the man who sent you here. My name, he hesitated. Heinrich Fechter. My father is a banker in Berlin. Very good, Emerson said, encouragingly. I sincerely hope you may live to see him again one day. Who sent you? I... He ran his tongue over his lips. I see I must yield. You have won. I salute you. He raised his left hand. Ramsay saw it coming. But the split second it took him to comprehend the boy's real intent was a split second too long. The muscles of his hand and arm had locked in anticipation of an attempt to seize the gun. Before he could turn the weapon away, the young German's thumb found Ramsey's trigger finger and pressed it. The heavy caliber bullet blew the top of his head off in a grisly cloud of blood and brains, splintered bone and hair. Christ! Ramsey stumbled to his feet and turned away, dropping the pistol. The night air was cold, but not as cold as the icy horror that sent shivers running through his body. His father put Ramsay's coat over his bare shoulders and held it there, his hands firm and steadying. All right now? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Never apologize for feeling regret and pity. Not to me. Well, let's get at it, shall we? It was a vile, horrible task, but he was up to it now. The search produced a set of skillfully forged documents, including a tattered photograph of a sweet-faced, grey-haired woman who was probably not the boy's mother. Emerson pocketed them. Shall we try to find his horse? We can't leave it here to die of thirst. No, but to search this terrain in the dark is to risk a broken leg. We'll send someone to look for it in the morning and for his camp. There was one more thing. Neither of them had to suggest it. They set to work in silent unanimity, deepening the shallow depression in the corner of the wall. Ramses wrapped his coat round the shattered head before they moved the body. A good hard push sent the remains of the wall tumbling down over the grave. Do you remember his name? Emerson asked. Yes. It wasn't likely he would ever forget it or neglect the request implicit in that single answer to their questions. Someday the banker in Berlin would know that his son had died a hero for whatever comfort that might give him. Another death, another dead end, Ramses thought. It appeared there was to be no easy way out. He got the canteen from the body of Emerson's horse and gave Risha a drink before he addressed his father. Do you want to go on ahead? You can make better time alone. I'll be all right here. Good God, no. What if I fell off again? You go. I'll wait here. He knew exactly what his father had in mind, and now he had no hesitation in saying so. You want to explore your bloody damned ruins, don't you? If you think I'm going to leave you stumbling round in the dark without food or water or transport, you can think again. We'll go together. You ride Risha. I'll walk. They had extinguished the torch to save what was left of the failing batteries. He couldn't make out Emerson's expression, but he heard a soft chuckle. Stubborn as a camel. Very well, my boy. 
Give me a hand up, will you? The sooner we get back, the better. God only knows what your mother's been up to. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. Chapter 11 The flat was in the fashionable Ismailia district. Waiting in the cab I had hired, I saw him enter the building at a few minutes past three. He'd been lunching out. I do not lie unless it is absolutely necessary. In this case, it had been absolutely necessary. If Emerson had known what I intended, he would not have let me out of his sight. If I had told Nefret the truth, she'd have insisted on accompanying me. Neither would have been acceptable. I gave my quarry half an hour to settle down and then inspected myself in the small hand mirror I carried. The disguise was perfect. I'd never seen anyone who looked more like a lady bent on an illicit assignation. The only difficulty was my hat, which tended to tip since the hat pins did not penetrate through the wig into my own hair. I pushed it back into position, adjusted the veil, and crossed the street. The doorkeeper was asleep. They usually are. I took the lift to the second floor and rang the bell. A servant answered it. His dark colouring and tarbouche were Egyptian, though he wore the neatly cut suit of a European butler. When he asked my name, I put my finger to my lips and smiled meaningfully. You need not announce me. I am expected. Evidently, the Count was accustomed to receiving female visitors who did not care to give their names. The man bowed without speaking and led me through the foyer. Opening a door, he gestured me to enter. The room was a parlour or sitting room, quite small but elegantly furnished. A man sat writing at an escritoire near the windows with his back to me. Apparently, he agreed with Emerson that tight-fitting garments interfered with intellectual pursuits. He had removed his coat and waistcoat and rolled his shirt sleeves to the elbow. I took a firmer grip on my parasol, readjusted my hat, and entered. The servant closed the door behind me, and then I heard a sound that made my breath catch. I flung myself at the door. Too late. It was locked. Slowly I turned to face the man who had risen to confront me, his hand resting lightly on the back of his chair. The black hair and moustache and the eyeglass were those of the Count de Sévigny. The lithe grace of his pose, the trim body and the eyes of an ambiguous shade between grey and brown were those of someone else. At last, he exclaimed, I have waited tea for you, my dear. Will you be good enough to pour? An elegant silver tea service stood on the table he indicated, together with a dumbwaiter spread with sandwiches and iced cakes. Please take a chair so that I may do so, said Sephos politely. I believe you have a fondness for cucumber sandwiches. Cucumber sandwiches, I said, regaining my self-possession, do not appeal to me at this moment. Pray let us not stand on ceremony. Please sit down and keep your hands where I can see them. In a single long step, he was at my side. The wig does not become you, he said, deftly whisking off the hat and the wig, to which it was somewhat precariously attached. And if you will permit me a word of criticism, that parasol does not match your frock. The hand that rested on my shoulder fell away as I leaped back. He made no attempt to detain me. Instead, he folded his arms and watched with infuriating amusement as I tugged in vain at the handle of the parasol. The release button was still sticking. I would have a few words to say to that lazy rascal Jamal when I'd returned home. If I'd returned home. May I be of assistance? Sethos inquired. He held out his hand. The mocking smile, the contemptuous gesture, gave me the additional strength I required. The button yielded. I whisked the blade out and brandished it. Ha! Huh! I cried. Now we will see who gives the orders here. Sit in that chair. 
he appeared quite unperturbed for a man who has a sharp point an inch from his jugular, but he obeyed the order. An engaging little accoutrement, he remarked. Put it away, my dear. You won't use it. You are incapable of cutting a man's throat unless your passions are aroused, and I have no intention of arousing yours. Not that sort of passion, at any rate. His grey, hazel-brown eyes sparkled wickedly. What colour were they? I leaned closer. Sethos let out a little yelp. Please, Amelia, he said plaintively. A thin trickle of blood ran down his bared throat. That was an, an accident, I said, in some confusion. I know. I forgive you. Do sit down and give me a cup of tea. There is no need for this combative approach, you know. You have won. I yield. Have I? You do? Sethos leaned back, his hands on the arms of the chair. I presume you have left the usual message to be opened if you fail to return home. So I can't keep you here indefinitely. Your husband and son will not be back for some hours. But there are others who may be moved to come looking for you, including that charming little tigress, your daughter. She isn't really your flesh and blood, though. Sometimes, Amelia, I am filled with wonderment at how you can be so clever about so many things and miss others that are right under your nose. Confound it! I cried in considerable confusion. How do you know? What do you mean by... You're trying to get me off the subject. We were speaking of... My surrender. Sethos smiled. I apologize. Conversation with you has such charm. I am always moved to prolong it. I accept your surrender. Come with me. I have a cab waiting. I took up a position of attack. Feet braced, sword at the ready. Sethos's mouth underwent a series of contortions. Instead of rising, he leaned forward. His hands clasped. They were long-fingered, well-tended hands, and the bared forearms to which they were attached had a symmetry many younger men might have envied. You must understand me, dear Amelia. You have already captured my heart, and the rest of me is at your disposal. But not if you want to dispose of it into a prison cell. What I meant was that you have destroyed the usefulness of this persona. The Count will never be seen again in Cairo. Now, sit down and have your tea, and we will chat like the old friends we are. Who knows? You may be able to trick me into betraying information that will enable you to put an end to me once and for all. His mouth twitched again. He was laughing at me. All the better, I thought. In his arrogance, he believes me incapable of catching him off guard. We'd see about that. I sat down on the sofa behind the tea table, leaned the parasol, still unsheathed, against one of the cushions, and placed my handbag at my feet. My position was greatly improved thereby, since it left both my hands free. I'd been unable to extract the handcuffs or the pistol or the length of rope from my bag while I held the sword. I would defeat him yet. But before I took him prisoner... I wanted explanations for several of his enigmatic statements. How do you know Ramses and Emerson will not be back for some hours? I inquired, pouring the tea. Milk or lemon? Sugar? Lemon, please. No sugar. He leaned forward to take the cup from my hand. His eyes met mine. Surely they were brown. And how dare you refer to Nefret so familiarly? I went on, pouring a cup for myself. Excitement had made me quite thirsty, and I knew the tea could not be drugged, since both cups came from the same pot. And what were you implying, when you informed me of a fact I know quite well, namely that she is not... Wait. Sethos held up his hand. A little order and method, my dear, if you please. Let me take your questions one by one. Pray do. He indicated the plate of sandwiches. I shook my head. His smile broadened. They have not been tampered with. He took one, seemingly at random, and bit into it. But you expected me. How did you know I would come here today? 
Sethos swallowed. Another question. These are excellent sandwiches, by the way. Are you sure you won't? Very well. I expected you today because I knew you had recognized me last night. I told you I would know you anywhere, in any disguise. Yes, touching, isn't it? I believed you when you told me that, and I've been careful to stay out of your way, though I was unable to resist presenting you with a token of my affection. Are you going to thank me properly? The melting look he gave me would have been more effective if I hadn't known he was laughing at me. It was a foolish gesture, I said severely. Yes, I suppose it was. A student of psychology like yourself might claim I did it because subconsciously I wanted you to find me. I didn't anticipate you would follow the young lady. Is that what you were doing, or was it a joint venture? But I knew you instantly, in spite of that hideous wig. It works both ways, you know. The eyes of love. Enough of that! I beg your pardon. So, knowing your inveterate habit of rushing into action without stopping to consider the possible consequences, I fancied you'd drop by today. I was all the more certain after I learned from sources that shall remain nameless that your husband had gone off into the eastern desert looking for ruins. Or so he claimed. What's he after, really? I allowed my lips to curve into an ironic smile. You don't suppose you can trap me into a damaging admission, do you? There is nothing to admit. Emerson is an archaeologist, not some sort of spy. And your son? The expression in those chameleon eyes made a shiver run through me. I concealed my alarm with a little chuckle. How absurd! Ramsay's views about the war are well known. They must be known to you as well. I know a great deal about that young man. So do others. The individuals in question are in some doubt as to the genuineness of his opinions. Individual, you mean, I said. You are referring to yourself, are you not? A man in your vile profession suspects everyone of double dealing. The insult struck home. His face hardened and his form stiffened. I serve my present employers faithfully. You may not approve my methods, but you are hardly in a position to criticize them. What do you mean? I cried in terror. Why, only that you would do the same had you my qualifications. Fortunately, you don't. But if you did, you would not hesitate to risk not only life, but the appearance of honor. I don't understand. But I did understand, and I felt sick with fear and dismay. He was working for the enemy, and he was warning me that his employers, as he was pleased to call them, were suspicious of Ramses. Those sneering references to the hazarding of life and the appearance of honour described my son's masquerade only too accurately. Sethos had once promised me that none of those I loved would come to harm through him. The oblique warning was his perverse way of keeping that promise. I reached into the bag at my feet and saw him stiffen, his eyes following the movement of my hand, his body taut as a coiled spring, and I knew that I had made a fatal error. I had believed that he was guilty of nothing more despicable than dealing in illegal antiquities, and I had counted upon... I felt my cheeks grow warm with shame. Yes, I had counted upon that fondness he claimed to feel for me. I had intended to use it in order to induce him to do my bidding. What a fool I'd been! He was worse than a thief. He was a spy and a traitor, and I dared not risk his escaping me now. Not when my son's life might depend on what he knew. I could not overpower him. I could not bind him or handcuff him, unless I rendered him unconscious first, and I doubted he would be obliging enough to turn his back so I could strike him senseless. That left the pistol as my only recourse. But what if I missed, or only wounded him with the first shot? I knew his strength and his quickness. Anticipating an attack, as he clearly was... He could be upon me before I extracted the pistol and aimed it. Yes, I'd been a fool, but I might yet outwit him. 
I picked up the bag and rose to my feet. Sethos's taut muscles relaxed. He smiled amiably at me. Leaving so soon, without getting answers to your other questions? Why, yes. I took hold of the parasol and edged round the table. We seem to have reached an impasse. I cannot force you to accompany me, and I am willing to accept your word that you will leave Cairo at once. Goodbye, and thank you for the tea. Your manners are impeccable, Sethos laughed. But I fear you cannot leave just yet. He came toward me, with that light, lithe step I knew so well. I backed away. You said you would not keep me here. Not indefinitely, I said. But, my dear, you don't suppose I'm going to let you go scurrying off to the police. It will take me a few hours to complete the preparations for my departure. Resign yourself to waiting a while. I promise you won't be uncomfortable. And I will take steps to have you released once I am safely on my way. I raised my parasol. With a sudden sweep of his arm, Sethos knocked it out of my hand. You drugged the tea, I gasped as he reached for me. No. If your hands were unsteady, it must have been for another reason. He held me in the circle of his arm and pulled me close. The other hand came to rest on my cheek. Do you remember my telling you once about a certain nerve just behind the ear? Yes. Do it, then. Render me instantly and painlessly unconscious, as you threatened, you... you cad... He laughed his soundless laugh. Oh, my dearest Amelia, I haven't even begun to be a cad. Shall I? His long, hard fingers slid through my hair and tilted my head back. His face was only a few inches from mine. I peered intently into that enigmatic countenance. His eyes were grey, with just a hint of green. I thought I detected a faint line along the bridge of his nose where some substance had been added to fill out the shape of that member. His long, flexible lips were not quite so thin as they seemed. They closed in a hard line, and the arm that held me tightened painfully. For God's sake, Amelia, the least you can do is pay attention when I'm trying to decide whether to take advantage of you. After all, why should I not... How many times have you been in my power? And how often have I dared to do so much as kiss your hands? I have never loved another woman but you. These are perilous times. I may never see you again. What is to stop me from doing what I have always yearned to do? I couldn't think of anything either. Um... Your sense of honour, I suggested. According to you, I have none, Sethos said bitterly. And don't think that tears will deter me from my purpose. I've no intention of weeping. No, you wouldn't. That is one of the reasons why I love you so much. His lips came lightly to rest on mine. I felt him tremble. Then he clasped me tightly to him and captured my mouth in a hard, passionate kiss. I struggled, of course. Dignity and my duty to my adored spouse demanded no less. In practical terms, it was a wasted effort. Those strong arms held me as easily as if I'd been a child. His lips moved to my cheek, and as I gasped for air, he whispered, Don't fight me, Amelia. You will only hurt yourself and resistance brings out the worst in men of my evil temperament. I refuse to be held wholly accountable for my actions if you continue. There. That is much better. Again, his mouth covered mine. I could not have said how long that burning kiss went on. I did not feel the touch that deprived me of consciousness. When I came to my senses, I felt as if I had woken from a restful sleep, pleasantly relaxed and comfortable. Then I remembered. I sat up with a muffled shriek and glared wildly at my surroundings. I was alone. The room was dark except for the glow of a single lamp. It was a bedchamber. 
The couch on which I had reposed was soft, piled with cushions and draped with silken hangings of azure and silver. Typical of the Count, and also of Sethos. He had luxurious tastes. On a table beside the bed was a crystal carafe of water, a silver cup, and... and a plate of cucumber sandwiches. They were curling at the edges. The manservant might at least have covered them with a damp napkin, but then I mused he probably had more urgent duties. Reflection and investigation, I believe I need not go into detail, persuaded me that Sethos's attentions had not gone beyond those long, ardent kisses. They were quite enough, as Emerson would certainly agree when I told him, if I told him. My immediate concern was escape. The door was locked, of course. I had expected that. The windows were covered with shutters that had been made fast by some mechanism I could not locate. My watch informed me that several hours had passed since I entered the flat. It was getting on for seven o'clock. Upon investigating my handbag, which had been placed beside me on the couch, I discovered that the handcuffs, the rope, the scissors, and the pistol were missing. The bureau had been swept clean. The drawers had been emptied of their contents, whatever those might have been, and the top was bare of toilet articles. There was nothing in the room that could serve as a weapon or a lockpick. I removed a hairpin from my untidy coiffure and knelt before the lock. As I had discovered on an earlier occasion, hairpins are not of much use for picking a lock. However, with my ear close to the door, I was able to make out sounds from the room beyond. Hurrying footsteps, the movement of a heavy object being dragged across the floor, an occasional brusque order in that familiar, detestable voice. Clearly, Sethos was completing his preparations for departure. The final command made this definite. Bring the carriage round and start carrying the luggage down. Footsteps approached the door behind which I knelt. Would he open it? Would he wish to bid me another final farewell? Or finish the dastardly deed he had threatened? My heart was pounding as I rose to my feet, prepared to resist to the last of my strength. All I heard was a long, deep sigh. The footsteps moved away. I was still standing by the door, my hand pressed to my breast, when a cry from Sethos made me jump. What the devil? A door slammed, the servant screamed, and Sethos began to laugh. Bit you, did she? Here, let me have her. Now, my dear, there is no need for all this exhausting activity. She is safe and unharmed, and if you behave yourself... I will allow you to keep one another company while I complete the preparations you so rudely interrupted. If you don't, I will lock you in a dark cupboard with the mops and brooms and black beetles. Good. I see you are susceptible to reason. Hamza, unlock the door. Amelia, stand back. I know you have your ear pressed to the panel, and I am running short of time. It was as well I obeyed. The front door flew open, and I saw, as I had known I would, my daughter and my dread adversary. One arm pinned her arms to her sides and held her firmly. The other hand covered her mouth. Her hair was coming down, and her eyes shone with fury. But she had had the sense to stop struggling. It would be a waste of breath to scream or swear, Miss Forth, Sethos said, propelling her into the room. Do so if it will relieve your feelings. But first, give me the knife I feel certain you have concealed about your person. The alternative would be for me to search you, and I will not take that liberty unless you force me to. Amelia would not approve. He removed his hand from her mouth, leaving the marks of his fingers imprinted on her cheek. She swallowed, and I said quickly, Give him the knife, Nefret. This is not the time for heroics or temper. Her eyes moved from me to Sethos, who had backed off a step, and then to the manservant. She was calculating the odds, and admitting they were against us. She reached into a side pocket of her skirt. Set into the seam, it was open at the back, giving her access to the knife strapped to her lower limb. 
Slowly she withdrew it, hesitated, and then passed it into Sethos's poised, waiting hand. How did you know I was here? I demanded. And why were you foolish enough to come alone? As I presume you... Forgive me, Sethos interrupted. You can chat after I've gone. I am in something of a hurry. But as long as I'm here... He took a step toward me, and then stopped and looked quizzically at Nefret. Turn your back, Miss Forth. Nefret's eyes widened. Do it, I said, through clenched teeth. She spun round. I might have evaded him for a short time, but how undignified, how humiliating would have been that frantic and futile flight, with Sethos close on my heels and his long arms ready to seize me. He would probably be laughing. It would end the same, whatever I did. Better by far to submit and get it over. So once again, I felt his arms close round me and his lips explore mine. For a man who claimed to be in a hurry, he took his time about it. When he let me go, I would have fallen, being off balance, had he not lowered me gently onto the foot of the couch. Goodbye, Amelia he said quietly. And you, my dear Miss Forth. He took her by the shoulders and turned her to face him. Her face was flushed and her lips were parted. He laughed and kissed her lightly on the forehead. Be good, sweet maid, and let who will be clever, particularly at the present time. Amelia, remember what I told you. The door slammed and the key turned in the lock. Nefret groped for a chair and lowered herself into it. What did he mean? Mean by what? The villain specialises in being enigmatic. My dear, did that man hurt you? No. Nefret rubbed her arm. He humiliated me, which is even worse. I was waiting on the landing, trying to decide whether to ring or not, when he came out and caught hold of me. Oh, Aunt Amelia, I'm sorry, but I didn't know what to do. When I came back from the hospital, you were all gone, all three of you. And it got darker and darker and later and later. And there was no sign of them and no word. And I didn't know where to start looking for them. But I did have a fairly good idea as to where you might have gone, because I suspected you'd lied to me about the Count. And I couldn't stand waiting any longer, so... I'm sorry... They'd not returned by the time you left? No. Something's happened. Nonsense, I said firmly. I can think of a dozen harmless reasons why they might have been delayed. Emerson is easily distracted by ruins. Never mind that now. We can't do anything about it until we get out of here. Have you any object on your person that we might use to pick the lock or break open a shutter? I had only my knife. You saw what happened to that. I stood up and began pacing. Let us consider the situation rationally. We will be freed eventually. I left a message for Emerson telling him where I'd gone, and so did I, for Ramses. But what if they don't? They will. They must have returned by now and be on their way here. If they are... If they are delayed, someone will release us eventually. I went to the door and put my ear against it. I don't hear anything. I believe Sethos has gone. He will want several hours in which to make good his escape from Cairo. By midnight... Midnight? Nefret jumped up. Good God, Aunt Amelia! We can't wait so long. What makes you suppose Sethos will take the trouble to inform someone of our whereabouts? He will, I said, with more confidence than I felt. It was necessary to calm the girl. She looked like Medusa, her hair falling loose over her shoulders, her eyes wild. But I agree, we shouldn't wait for rescue. I'll get back to work on the lock. I've plenty of hairpins. And you see what you can do with the shutters. First, however... Nefret, my dear, this is not the time to succumb to faintness. She had pressed her hands to her face. I caught hold of her swaying form and lowered her into a chair. I'm not going to faint. I had to strain to hear the low voice. Slowly she lowered her hands. It's all right. Have a cucumber sandwich, 
I snatched up the plate and offered it to her. No, thank you. Her face was glowing with perspiration, but calm. She let out a long breath and smiled. Cucumber sandwiches, Aunt Amelia? We need to keep up our strength. Yes, of course. I'm frightfully thirsty, too. Can we trust the water, do you think? The change in her was astonishing. She had exerted her will under the dominance of an even stronger will and was now an ally on whom I could depend. I believe we can. As you see, he has left a little note. It read, You probably won't believe me, Amelia dear, but the water is not drugged. Neither are the cucumber sandwiches. I handed it to Nefret, who actually laughed when she read it. He is an amazing individual. Did he... If you don't mind my asking... He did not. Oh. He did kiss you, though. When he told me to turn my back. I did not reply. Nefret took a sandwich. He kissed me on the brow, she muttered. As if I were a child. He is strong, isn't he? And tall, and... He is a spy and a traitor. I said. We must stop him before he leaves Cairo. If you have fully recovered, Nefret, let us get to work. We had a sandwich or two. They weren't very good, though the bread was beginning to go stale. And a sip of water, before exploring the chamber more intensively than I had done earlier. Nefret tore the place to pieces, in fact, flinging mattresses and cushions onto the floor, overturning chairs, and at last repeatedly dashing a small brass table against the wall until it broke apart. Selecting one of the metal supports, she went to the shutters and began prying at them. Her actions were vigorous but controlled. She appeared to be in a much calmer frame of mind than she'd been earlier, calmer than my own. Her statement that Ramses and Emerson hadn't returned by the time she left had frightened me more than I dared admit even to myself. Emerson was easily distracted by ruins, but Sethos's claim that he'd known of their purpose aroused the direst of forebodings. Nefret's efforts succeeded at last. She let out a cry of triumph. One of the shutters had given way. I hurried to her side as she flung it back and leant out the window. It did not open onto the Sharia Suleiman Pasha, but onto a narrower street that had not so much traffic. However, our cries finally attracted attention. A turbaned porter, bent under a load of pots and pans, stopped and looked up. I addressed him in emphatic Arabic. When I told him what I wanted, he demanded money before he would stir a step, and we dickered for a bit before I persuaded him to accept an even larger payment upon the completion of his errand. He was gone some time, and Nefret was knotting the satin sheets into a rope when he finally returned, accompanied by a uniformed constable. There are advantages to being notorious. As soon as I identified myself to the constable, he was ready to obey my commands. However, by the time our rescuers began banging on the door of the flat, I was almost ready to take my chances with Nefret's rope. My cries of encouragement and impatience directed them to the bedchamber. They got that door open, too, and I rushed out, searching the faces of the men who had entered the sitting room. One of them was familiar, but alas, it was not the face I had hoped to see. Mr. Assistant Commissioner Thomas Russell was in evening kit, and this annoyed me to an excessive degree. I seized him by his lapels. Enjoying your evening out, I demanded, while others risk life and the appearance of... Curse it, Russell! While you were lollygagging about, the master criminal has escaped. And where is my husband? Russell kept his head, which was, I admit, rather commendable of him under the circumstances. He pushed me back into the bedchamber and closed the door. For the love of heaven, Mrs. Emerson, don't tell your business to every police officer in Cairo. What is all this about master criminals? He is the Count de Sévigny! Sethos is the Count. The master criminal is Sethos. Allow me to get you some brandy, Mrs. Emerson. I don't want brandy. I want you to go after Sethos. He's probably in Alexandria or Tripoli by now, or Damascus or Khartoum. 
It wouldn't surprise me to learn that he knows how to fly one of those aeroplanes. You must shoot him down before he reaches enemy lines. Nefret put her arm round me and murmured soothingly, but it was Russell's incredulous question that made me realise I might not have taken the right approach. Are you telling me, Mrs Emerson, that you and Miss Forth came alone to the flat of a man you knew to be a spy and uh, master criminal? Not altogether, I said. When I failed to return home, Miss Forth came to rescue me. The devil she did. The devil I didn't, Nefret said with wry amusement. Rescue her, that is. I confess neither of us behaved sensibly, Mr. Russell. Don't scold, but get your men after him. Our imprisonment and his flight are surely evidence that he is guilty of something. Russell gave a grudging nod. Very well. Go home, ladies, and get out of my... That is, go home. I will send one of my men with you. But what of Emerson? I demanded. He and Ramses ought to have been back hours ago. Ramses went with him. Russell's cold eyes grew even frostier. Where? Into the eastern desert. They were looking for... Now it was Mr. Russell who was in danger of forgetting himself. I cut short his incoherent anathemas with a useful reminder. I will take Miss Forth home, as you advised. You will let us know at once if you... When you hear. Yes, and you will send to inform me if... When they return... They had no business. Well, good night, ladies. As we passed through the sitting room, one of the constables spoke. Look here, sir. The man was a criminal. In his haste, he forgot his implements of crime. They were set out on the tea table. Handcuffs, a coil of rope, a little pistol, and a long knife. Those are mine, I said, holding out my hand. Except for the knife. It belongs to Miss Forth. For some reason, this harmless statement brought Russell's temper to the breaking point. He bundled us out the door and directed a constable to put us in a cab. All along the homeward path, I looked for a yellow motor car being driven at breakneck speed toward the Count's flat. No such vision rewarded my search. When we arrived home, we found not Emerson and Ramses, but Fatima, Selim, Daoud and Khadija. All of them, except the ever-calm Khadija, were in a considerable state of agitation. They took turns embracing me and Nefret and peppered us with questions, while Fatima produced platter after platter of food. It took us considerable time to convince them we were unharmed, and then we had to apologise for failing to tell them where we'd gone. You did not come home for dinner, Fatima said, fixing me with an accusing stare. Ramses and the father of curses did not come back. Then Nur Misur went away. What was I to do? I sent for Daud and Selim and... Yes, I see. I appreciate your concern, but there is nothing to worry about now. It's very late. Good night and thanks to you all. Selim and Daud exchanged glances. Yes, Sitakim, the former said. After they'd left the room, Nefret said, They won't leave, not until after Ramses and the professor are safely back. Go to bed, Aunt Amelia. Yes, I know you won't sleep a wink, but at least lie down and rest. If they lost their way, they may have decided to wait until daylight before starting back. Hoping that she at least would rest, I agreed, and we went to our respective rooms. I was removing my crumpled frock when she tapped at my door. See who I found, asleep on my bed. I thought you might like her company tonight. She was carrying Seshat. It was unusual for the cat to be in my room, or Nefret's, unless she was in search of something or someone. This did not appear to be the case now. When Nefret put her down on the foot of the bed, she curled herself into a neat coil and closed her eyes. Feeling somewhat comforted and more than a little foolish, I stretched out beside the cat, although I knew I wouldn't sleep a wink. As I... Near the top of the cliff, I looked up to see a tall, familiar form silhouetted against the pale blue of the early morning sky. I was in Luxor again, climbing the steep path that led to the top of the plateau behind Deir el-Bahri, 
and Abdullah was waiting. He reached out a hand to help me up the last few feet and sat down beside me as I sank, panting onto a convenient boulder. He looked as he always did in those dreams, his stalwart form, that of a man in the prime of his life, his handsome, hawk-like features framed by a neatly trimmed black beard and moustache. He remained impassive, but his black eyes shone affectionately. Finally, I exclaimed, when I'd got my breath back. Abdallah, I've wanted so much to see you. It's been too long. Long for you, perhaps, Sit. There is no time here, on the other side of the portal. I haven't the patience for your philosophical vagueness tonight, Abdallah. You claim to know everything that happens to me. You must know how frightened I am, how much in need of comfort. I held out my hands to him and he enclosed them in his. They are well, said Hakim, the two you love best. Soon, after you wake, you will see them. I knew I was dreaming, but that reassurance carried as much conviction as the evidence of my own eyes would have done. Thank you, I said, with a long breath of relief. It is good news you give me, but it is only part of what I want to hear. How will it end, Abdallah? Will they live and be happy? I cannot tell you endings, Sid. You did before. You said the falcon would fly through the portal of the dawn. Which portal, Abdallah? There are so many doorways, and some lead to death. And from it, one may pass in or out of a portal, Sid. Abdallah! I tried to free my hands. He held them more tightly, and he laughed a little. I cannot tell you endings, because I do not know them all. The future can be changed by your actions, Sid. And you are not careful. You do foolish things. You don't know, I repeated. Even about David? He's your grandson. Don't you care? I care about all of you. And I would like my grandson to live to see his son. His sober face brightened, and he added smugly, They will name him after me. Oh, it is to be a boy, is it? That is already determined. As for the rest... His eyes dwelt on my face. I should not tell you even so much as this. But mark my words well. There will come a time when you must trust the word of one you have doubted and believe a warning that has no more reality than these dreams of yours. When that time comes, act without hesitation or doubt. He rose to his feet, drawing me to mine, and carried the hands he held to his lips. You may tell Emerson of this kiss, he said, his eyes twinkling. But if I were you, Sid, I would not tell him of those others. Instead of vanishing into the depths of sleep, as he and his surroundings had done before, he turned and walked away. He did not stop or look back as he followed the long path that led to the valley where the kings of Egypt had been laid to rest. When I opened my eyes, the room was filled with the pearly light of early morning. Seshat sat beside me, holding a fat mouse in her mouth. Sluggish with sleep, I was unable to move in time to prevent her from placing it neatly on my chest. That got me up in a hurry. Seshat retrieved the mouse from the corner where I had flung it, gave me a look of disgust, and went out the window with it. My inadvertent cry, for even a woman of iron nerve may be taken aback by a dead mouse six inches from her nose, brought Nefret bursting into the room. After I had finished explaining and Nefret had finished laughing, she took me by the shoulders. You look much better, Aunt Amelia. You did sleep. I dreamed. Of Abdallah? Nefret was the only one I had told of those dreams and of my half-shamed belief in them. What did he say? Leah's baby is a boy. Nefret's smile was fond but sceptical. He has a 50% chance of being right. Emerson and Ramses are safe. He said I would see them soon after I woke, 
and don't tell me the same odds apply to that prediction. No, I'm certain he was right about that. You needn't humor me, Nefret. I know there is no truth in such visions, but... But they comfort you, I'm glad. I wish I could dream of the dear old fellow, too. She gave me a hug. Fatima's cooking breakfast. They're still here, Daoud and Selim and Khadija, and several of the others turned up. However, before we reached the breakfast room, our ears were assaulted by one of the most horrible noises I'd ever heard. It grew louder and louder. I was about to clap my hands over my ears when it stopped, and in the silence I heard another sound, a sound as sweet as music to my anxious ears, Emerson's voice bellowing my name. Nefret must have recognized the significance of the racket before I did. She ran to the door. Ali had opened it and stood staring. I did not blame Ali for staring. Never had the father of curses appeared in such a contrivance. Motor bicycles had always reminded me of enlarged mechanical insects. This one, which was bestrode by a pale young man in khaki, had a bulging excrescence on one side. The sidecar, as I believe it is called, was occupied by Emerson. A delighted grin indicated his enjoyment of the experience. It took three of us, including Ali, to get Emerson out of the contraption. He is so very large that he fitted rather tightly, and, as I soon observed, he hadn't the use of his left arm. Eventually, we extracted him, and I thanked the young man who was still sitting on the vehicle. He turned a glazed stare toward me. "'Are we there?' he asked stupidly. "'You are here,' I replied. "'Dismount, or get off, as the case may be, and have breakfast with us.' "'No, thank you, Mom. I was told to come straight back.' He shook his head. "'He kept shouting at me to go faster, Mom. "'I never heard such... such... language,' I supplied. "'I don't doubt it. Are you sure you wouldn't like...?' "'The motor bicycle roared and rushed off in a cloud of dust.' "'Splendid machine,' said Emerson, gazing wistfully after it. "'I wanted to drive it, but the fellow wouldn't let me. "'We must have one, Peabody. "'I will take you for a ride at the sidecar.' "'Not while there is breath in my body,' I informed him. "'Oh, Emerson, curse you! How could you worry me so? What happened?' "'Nefret hadn't spoken. "'Now a very small voice uttered a single word. "'Ramses?' "'Coming!' Emerson replied. He insisted on bringing Risha home himself. The brave creature will want a day or two of pampering. He had a tiring experience. So did you, I see, I remarked, inspecting him more closely. He was not wearing a coat. One arm was fastened to his body by strips of cloth. His shirt was torn and dirty. His face bruised, his hands scraped. I apologize for my appearance, Emerson said cheerfully. They offered us baths and bandages and food and so on, but I was determined to relieve your mind as soon as I could. Consider it of you, I said. Come upstairs. Upstairs be damned. You can clean me up after breakfast. I hope there is a great deal of it. There was a great deal, and Emerson ate most of it. Nefret hovered over him, trying to examine him, but there wasn't much he could do when he refused to lie down and stop gesticulating. He was still eating when Ramses arrived, he had borrowed a mount and was leading Risha. He turned the stallion over to Selim, who crooned to the noble beast as he led him to the stable. "'You don't look much better than your father,' I said. "'What happened to your shirt? And your nice new tweed coat? That one you're wearing doesn't fit.' "'Let him eat first, Aunt Amelia,' Lefret said, somewhat snappishly. "'Thank you,' Ramsay said. "'I will just put on a clean shirt before I have breakfast.' This is father's coat, and you're quite right. It doesn't fit. It hid the bandages and the scars of his recent injury, however. I decided I'd better go with him and make certain he wasn't in need of immediate medical attention, for he was not likely to tell me if he was. He was waylaid in the courtyard by the entire family, including Emerson. After embracing him, Dowd announced, I will go home. It is well now that you are here. Hmm, said Emerson indignantly. What about me? Ramses glanced at his father, his lips parted in a smile so wide 
I would have called it a grin if I had believed my son's countenance capable of that expression. Then he slipped away and started up the stairs. I started after him. Emerson caught me by the arm and whispered into my ear, Don't ask him about his coat. Emerson's whispers are audible ten feet away. Everyone in the courtyard heard him, including the fret. Why not? she asked. He left it, you see, Emerson gabbled. New coat. Fuss at the boy. I left him telling lies and went after Ramsay's. His door was open. I was somewhat startled to hear him say, Most kind. However, I'm about to eat breakfast. Perhaps we might put it aside for later. He was standing by the bed, holding a dead mouse by the tail. So that is what she did with it, I remarked. I was the first recipient, and I fear I did not accept the gift as graciously as you. I wish you wouldn't talk to the cat as you do to a human being. It's very disconcerting. Take off that coat and let me have a look at you. Ramses put the mouse on his bureau. Seshat sat down and began washing her face. Leave it, Muller. He removed the coat and tossed it onto the bed. Except for the half-healed wounds, his tanned chest and back were unmarked. I'm as hungry as a pariah dog. Father needs your care more than I. I'm surprised you haven't been at him already. He was too hungry. I watched him pull a shirt from the cupboard and slip into it. He said he'd fallen off his horse when the poor creature stepped into a hole and broke his leg. What happened? He fell, yes. So did the gelding, when it was struck by a bullet. He finished buttoning his shirt. Can you wait for the rest of it? No, I suppose not. We were ambushed. The fellow had us pinned down, and with father injured, it seemed advisable to stay where we were until dark. The man was a German spy. He came out of hiding, and we had a little skirmish. He killed himself rather than be taken prisoner. We started back. When we got onto the caravan road, I fired off a few shots, which eventually attracted the attention of the camel corps. They escorted us to the barracks at Abyssia. The narrative had been as crisp and unemotional as a report. I knew he hadn't told me everything, and I also knew it was all I was going to get out of him. Ramses tucked his shirt in. May we go down now? Everyone was having a second breakfast, to Fatima's delight. She liked nothing better than feeding as many people as she could get hold of. As soon as she saw Ramses, she concentrated her efforts on him, and for some time he was unable to converse at all, as she stuffed him with eggs and porridge and bread and marmalade. Emerson was telling Selim and Daoud, who had not gone home, about the ruins in the desert. A temple, he declared dogmatically. Nineteenth dynasty. I saw a cartouche of Ramses the second. We'll spend a few days out there, Selim, after the end of our regular season. Oh, yes, of course, I thought. A few peaceful days in the desert with German spies skulking about and the Turks attacking the canal and the camel corps shooting at anything that moved. What had they done with the body of the dead spy? That would be a pretty thing to come upon in the course of excavation. Finally, I put an end to the festivities by insisting that Emerson bathe and rest. Selim said they would return to Atiyah and await Emerson's orders. Tomorrow, he began. Tomorrow, Emerson exclaimed. I will join you at Giza in two hours or less, Selim. Good gad, we've missed half a morning's work as it is. I took Emerson away. We had a great deal to talk about. Two more shirts ruined, I remarked, cutting away the remains of both garments. I want the fret to have a look at your shoulder, Emerson. I am sure Ramses did the best he could, but... No one could have done better. Did he tell you what happened? A synopsis only. He was distressed about something I could tell. Emerson gave me a somewhat longer synopsis. The fellow was no older than Ramses, if as old. No one could have stopped him in time. And Ramsey's finger was on the trigger when the gun fired. No wonder he was upset. Upset? You have a gift for understatement, my dear. It was a ghastly sight, and so damnably unnecessary. I hope the bastards who fill the heads of these boys with empty platitudes and then send them out to die burn in the fires of hell for all eternity. Amen. But Emerson... A tap on the door interrupted me. 
That must be Nefret, I said. May as well let her in, Emerson muttered. She's as bullhead, as determined as you. Nefret's examination was brief. I'm glad to see Ramsay's paid close attention to my lecture. It will be tender for a few days, Professor. I suppose there's no point in my telling you to favour that arm. I'll just strap it properly. No, you will not, said Emerson. I want to bathe, so take yourself off, young lady. Why are you still wearing your dressing gown? Put on proper clothing. We will leave for the dig as soon as I'm ready. I encouraged her departure, for I still had a good many questions to put to Emerson. To some of them he could only offer educated guesses, but it was evident that the ambush had been arranged by a man high in military or official circles, and that he was in communication with the enemy by wireless or other means. We knew that, I said pacing up and down the bath chamber while Emerson splashed in the tub. We are no closer to learning his identity. You say a number of officers overheard your conversation? Yes. Maxwell also knew of our intentions. He may have let something slip to a member of his staff. Curse it. Quite. Emerson agreed. Too damned many people know too damned much. I don't suppose you've heard from Russell. Um... Emerson heaved himself up and stood like the Colossus of Rhodes after a rainstorm, water streaming down his bronzed and muscular frame. Out with it, Peabody. I knew you were guilty of something. You have a certain look. I had every intention of telling you all about it, Emerson. Ha! said Emerson. Hand me that towel and start talking. Having determined, as I had said, to conceal nothing from my heroic spouse... I told him the whole story, from start to finish. I rather pride myself on my narrative style. Emerson certainly found it absorbing. He listened without interrupting, possibly because he was too stupefied to compose a coherent remark. The only sign of emotion he exhibited was to turn crimson in the face when I described Sethos's advances. He kissed you, did he? That was all, Emerson. More than once? Uh, yes. How often? That would depend on how one defines and delimits... And held you in his arms? Quite respectfully, Emerson. Uh, on the whole. It is impossible, said Emerson, to hold respectfully in one's arms a woman married to another man. I began to think I ought to have heeded Abdullah's advice. Forget that, Emerson, I said. It's over and done with. The most important thing is that Sethos has got away. I'm afraid, I'm almost certain, he knows about Ramses. You think so? I told you what he said. Mm, yes. I had insisted upon helping him to dress, since it is difficult to pull on trousers and boots with only one fully functional arm frowning in a manner that suggested profound introspection rather than temper. He slipped his arm into the shirt I held for him and made no objection when I began buttoning it. What are we going to do? I demanded. About Savos? Leave it to Russell. Ouch! he added. I beg your pardon, my dear. Stand up, please. He stood staring into space with all the animation of a mummy while I finished tidying him up and wound a few strips of bandage across his shoulder and chest to support his arm. Then I said, Emerson. <clears throat> yes, my dear. What is it? I would like you to hold me, if it won't inconvenience you too much. Emerson can do more with one arm than most men can do with two, yielding to his hard embrace, returning his kisses. I hoped I had convinced him that no man would ever take his place in my heart. There were three statues in the Serdab. The most charming depicted the prince and his wife in a pose that had become familiar to me from many examples, and one which never failed to please me. They stood close to one another, with her arm round his waist, and the two figures were of almost equal height. The lady was a few inches shorter, just as she may have been in life. She wore a simple straight shift, and he a kilt pleated on one side. 
Their faces had the ineffable calm with which these believers faced eternity. Some of the original paint remained, the white of their garments, the black of the wigs, the yellowish skin of the lady, and the darker brown of her husband's. Women were always depicted as lighter in colour than men, presumably because they spent less time under the sun's rays than their spouses. There was another, smaller statue of the prince, and one of a youth who was identified as his son. By the middle of the afternoon, we had them out. Not even the largest was anything like the weight of the royal statue. Get them back to the house, Selim, Emerson ordered, passing his sleeve over his perspiring brow. Nefret announced her intention of going to the hospital for a few hours and started toward Manor House, where we had left the horses. As soon as she was out of earshot, Ramsay said, I'm off too. Where? I demanded, trying to catch hold of him. I have a few errands. Excuse me, mother, I must hurry. I'll be home in time for dinner. Put on your hat, I called after him. He turned and waved and went on, without his hat. When Emerson and I reached Manor House, we found Asfur, whom Ramses had ridden that day, still in the stable. He's taken the train, I said, out of the corner of my mouth. That means... I know what it means. Mount Asfur, Peabody, and I'll lead the other creature. And do keep quiet. I realised I ought to have anticipated that Ramses would have to communicate with one or another or all of several people. That did not mean I liked it. My nerves had not fully recovered from the anxiety of the previous day and night. Emerson and I jogged on side by side, each occupied with his or her own thoughts. I could tell by his expression that his were no more pleasant than mine. Superstition is not one of my weaknesses, but I was beginning to feel that we laboured under a horrible curse of failure. Every thread we had come upon broke when we tried to follow it. Two of the most hopeful had failed within the past 24 hours. My unmasking of Sethos and Emerson's capture of the German spy. Now Sethos was on the loose with his deadly knowledge, and the failure of the ambush would soon be known to the man who had ordered it. What would he do next? What could we do next? Emerson and I discussed the matter as we drank our tea and sorted through the post. I hadn't done so the day before, so there was quite an accumulation of letters and messages. Nothing from Mr. Russell, I reported. He'd have found some means of informing us if he'd caught up with Sethos. Emerson said, hmm, and took the envelopes I handed him. There is one for you from Walter. So I see. Emerson ripped the envelope to shreds. We've had another communication from David, he reported, scanning the missive. I wish we could do the same. Do you think Ramses will speak with him this afternoon? I don't know. Emerson plucked irritably at the strips of bandage enclosing his arm. Curse it, how can I open an envelope with one hand? I will open them for you, my dear. No, you will not. You always read them first. Emerson tore at another envelope. Well, well, fancy that. A courteous note from Major Hamilton congratulating me on another narrow escape, as he puts it and reminding me that he made me the loan of a Webley. I wonder what I did with it. Does he mention his niece? No, why should he? What does Evelyn say? He had recognised her neat, delicate handwriting. I knew what he wanted most to hear, so I read the passages that reported little Senia's good health and remarkable evidences of intelligence. She keeps us all merry and in good spirits, Lately she has taken to dressing Horace up in her dolly's clothing and wheeling him about in a carriage. You would laugh to see those bristling whiskers and snarling jaws framed by a ruffled bonnet. He hates every minute of it, but is putty in her little hands. Thank God her youth makes it possible for us to keep from her the horrible things that are happening in the world. Every night she kisses your photographs. They're getting quite worn away, especially Ramses. Even Emerson would be touched, I think, to see her kneeling beside her little cot, asking God to watch over you all. That is also the heartfelt prayer of your loving sister. And here, I said, holding out a grubby, much-folded bit of paper, is an enclosure for you from Sania. 
Emerson's eyes were shining suspiciously. After he had read the few printed words that staggered down the page, he folded it again and tucked it carefully into his breast pocket. There was no message for Ramses that day or the day after, or the day after that. Days stretched into weeks. Ramses went almost every day to Cairo. I never had to ask whether he had found the message he was waiting for. Govern his countenance as he might, his stretched nerves showed in the almost imperceptible marks round his eyes and mouth, and in his increasingly acerbic responses to perfectly civil questions. Some of his visits were to Wardani's lieutenants. Like the rest of us, they were becoming restive, and Ramses admitted he was having some difficulty keeping them reined in. Rumours about the military situation added another dimension of discomfort. In my opinion, it would have been wiser for the authorities to publish the facts. They might have been less alarming than the stories that were put about. There were 100,000 Turkish troops massed near Beersheba. There were 200,000 Turkish troops heading for the border. Turkish forces had already crossed the border and were marching toward the canal, gathering recruits from among the Bedouin. Jamal Pasha, in command of the Turks, had boasted, I will not return until I have entered Cairo. His chief of staff, von Kressenstein, had an entire brigade of German troops with him. Turkish agents had infiltrated the ranks of the Egyptian artillery. When the attack occurred, they would turn their weapons on the British. Some of the stories were true. Some were not. The result was to throw Cairo into a state of panic. A great number of people booked passage on departing steamers. The louder patriots discussed strategy in their comfortable clubs and entered into a perfect orgy of spy hunting. The only useful result of that was the disappearance of Mrs. Fortescue. It was assumed by her acquaintances that she had got cold feet and sailed for home. We were among the few who knew that she had been taken into custody. That gave me another moment of hope, but like all our other leads, this one faded out. She insisted, even under interrogation, that she did not know the name or identity of the man to whom she had reported. He's probably telling the truth, said Emerson, from whom I heard this bit of classified information. There are a number of ways of passing on and receiving instructions. I understand that chap we saw at the Savoy, one of Clayton's lot, what's his name, is claiming the credit for unmasking her. Herbert, Ramses supplied, with a very slight curl of his lip. He's also unearthing conspiracies. According to him, he doesn't even have to go looking for them. The malcontents come to him, burning to betray one another for money. One of them hasn't, said Emerson. Damnation! The insufferable complacency of men like Herbert will cost us dearly one day. I also learned from Emerson that Russell agreed with his and Ramsey's deductions about the route the gunrunners had followed. The Camel Corps section of the Coast Guards had been alerted, and since their pitiful pay was augmented by rewards for each arrest, one might suppose they were hard at it. However, as Russell admitted, the corruption of a single officer would make it possible for the loads to be landed on the Egyptian coast and carried by camel to some place of concealment near the city where the Turk eventually picked them up. Thus far, Russell had been unable to track them. It was during the penultimate week of January that Ramses returned one afternoon from Cairo with the news we had so anxiously awaited. One look at him told me all I needed to know. I ran to meet him and threw my arms round him. Eyebrows rising, he said, Thank you, Mother, but I haven't come back from the dead, only from Cairo. Yes, Fatima, fresh tea would be very nice. I waited, twitching with impatience, until after she'd brought the tea and another plate of sandwiches. Talk quickly, I ordered. Your friend has gone to the hospital, but she'll soon be back. She didn't go directly to the hospital. Ramses inspected the sandwiches. You followed her? It was a foolish question. Obviously he had. I went on. Where did she go? To the Continental. I presume she was meeting someone, but I couldn't go into the hotel. No, Emerson said, 
giving his son a hard look. Has she given you any cause to believe she was doing anything she ought not? Good God, Father, of course she has. Over and over, she... He broke off. His preternaturally acute hearing must have given him warning of someone's approach, for he lowered his voice and spoke quickly. I need to attend that confounded costume ball tomorrow night. What confounded costume ball? Emerson demanded. I told you about it several weeks ago, Emerson, I reminded him. You didn't say you wouldn't go, so I procured some embarrassing, inappropriate rig for me. Curse it, Peabody. You needn't come if you'd rather not, Father, Ramsay said, somewhat impatiently. We'll come, of course, Emerson said, if you need us. What do you want us to do? Cover my absence while I trot off to collect a few more jolly little guns. I got the message this afternoon. The parlour door opened, and he stood up, smiling. Yeah, Nefret, how many arms and legs did you cut off today? Hello, Anna. Still playing Angel of Mercy. Chapter 12 Over the years, we'd become accustomed to take Friday as our day of rest, in order to accommodate our Muslim workmen. The Sabbath was therefore another workday for us, and Emerson, who had no sympathy with religious observances of any kind, refused even to attend church services. He had often informed me that I was welcome to do so if I chose, knowing full well that if I had chosen, I would never have felt need of his permission. But it was too much of a nuisance to get dressed and drive into Cairo for what is, after all, only empty ceremony, unless one is in the proper state of spiritual devotion. I feel I can put myself into the proper state wherever I happen to be, so I rise early on Sunday morning and read a few chapters from the good book and say a few little prayers. I say them aloud, in the hope that Emerson may be edified by my example. Thus far, he has displayed no evidence of edification. In fact, he is sometimes moved to make critical remarks. I do not claim to be an authority, Peabody, but it seems to me that prayer should take the form of a humble request, not a direct order. My prayers that Sunday morning may have had a somewhat peremptory tone. Emerson was dressing when I rose from my knees. Finished? he inquired. I believe I covered all the necessary points. It was a comprehensive lecture, Emerson agreed. He finished lacing his boots and stood up. I was under the impression that you believed that God helps those who help themselves. I am doing all I can. My voice was somewhat muffled by the folds of my nightdress, which I had started to remove. Emerson put his arms round me and pressed me close. My darling, I know you are. Don't cry, my love. It will be all right. I am not crying. I have several layers of cloth over my nose and mouth. Ah, that's easily dealt with. After a time, Emerson said, Am I hurting you? Yes. I have no objection to what you're doing, but perhaps you could do it a little less vigorously. All those buttons and buckles, they are also easily dealt with. I presume you've got some tomfool costume for me to wear this evening, Emerson said. He finished lacing his boots and stood up. I have a costume for you, yes, but I shan't show it to you until it is time to put it on. You always complain and protest and bellow and... Not this time, Peabody. Is there any way you can conceal my absence as well as that of Ramses? This is the first time they've left the weapons to be picked up later, instead of delivering them directly. I want to be there. Do you think it's a trick? An ambush? No, Emerson said a little too quickly. Only I... Um... Want to be there. Are you going to ask Ramses if you may go with him? Ask him if I may? Emerson's indignation subsided as quickly as it had arisen. I can't do that. The boy is a trifle touchy about accepting my assistance, though I don't see why he should be. Don't you? No, I've the greatest respect for his abilities. And you have, of course, told him so. Emerson looked uncomfortable. Not in so many words. Oh, curse it, Peabody. Don't practice your bloody psychology on me. Make a practical suggestion. 
Very well, my dear. Let me think about it. I did so, at intervals during the day. We had got the second chapel cleared down to floor level. The walls had all been painted, and there was a delightful little false door, with a rock-cut, half-length, from the waist up, statue of the owner, looking as if he were emerging from the afterworld with hands extended to seize the foodstuffs placed on the offering table before him. Ramses rambled about the room, reading bits and pieces of the inscriptions and commenting on them. An offering which the king gives of bread and beer, oxen and fowl, alabaster and clothing, a thousand of every good and pure thing. They had such practical minds, didn't they? An all-inclusive everything in case some desirable item had been overlooked. One honoured before Osiris, Lord of Busiris. Nothing new, just the usual formulas. And stop mumbling over them, and help no fret with the photography, Emerson ordered. This was a more complex process than it might appear to be, for photographs were the first step of the method Ramses had devised for copying reliefs and inscriptions. They had to be taken from a carefully measured distance in order to allow for overlap without distortion. A tracing was then made and compared with the wall itself. The final version incorporated not only the reliefs, but every scratch and abrasion on the surface. Ramses did not suffer from false modesty regarding his talents as a linguist, but he would have been the first to admit that some future scholar might find something he had missed in those seemingly unreadable scratches. It was an extremely accurate method, but it took a long time. Ramses began setting up his measuring rods. I went out to watch Emerson, who was directing the men who were clearing the section south of the mustaba. The intervening space between ours and the one next to it had been filled in by extensions and or later tombs. There were bits of wall everywhere looking like an ill-organized maze. Emerson's scowl would have told me, had I not already realized, that he had a hard task ahead trying to sort them out. Come here, he shouted, waving at me. So I went there and began taking notes as he crawled about, measuring spaces and calling out numbers and brief descriptions. My mind wandered a bit. I had managed to draw Ramses aside long enough to squeeze a little information out of him. He would not tell me where he had to go that night, but he did give me a rough estimate of how much time he would need. Not less than two hours, probably not more than three. Probably. I repeated. To be on the safe side, we'd better allow for more. What I propose... What he proposed was that I plead fatigue or indisposition and ask Emerson to take me home during the supper break. Cyrus and Catherine would be happy to look after Nefret, and when Ramses failed to turn up, the others would assume he'd gone with us. Given the crowds and the confusion and a certain amount of alcoholic intake, there was a good chance it would work. The only remaining difficulty was how to conceal from Ramses the fact that his father meant to follow him that night. For that was what Emerson must do if he wanted to avoid an argument or even a flat refusal from his son. Emerson may sneer at psychology all he likes, but it was not difficult for me to understand why Ramses was reluctant to accept his father's help. According to the best authorities, all boys go through such a stage when they approach manhood and trying to live up to a father like Emerson would put a strain on any individual. It was difficult to concentrate with Emerson demanding, I repeat back, the numbers he kept calling out, so I gave it up for the time being. No doubt something will occur to me, I thought. It usually does. We stopped work a little earlier than usual, since Catherine and Cyrus were dining with us. Something had occurred to me. I knew Emerson wouldn't like it at all. I had certain reservations of my own, but I put these aside. Emerson's objections would also have to be put aside, since I did not intend to give him time to argue. The Vandergelts arrived in time for tea. After they had extricated themselves from the muffling garments motoring requires, we women retired to the roof, leaving Cyrus to admire our latest discoveries, while Emerson told him all about them and Ramses hung about trying to get a word in. 
Lefret would have liked to stay with them, I think, but Anna did not bother to conceal her disinterest. And my daughter has been too well brought up by me to abandon a guest. Anna was more than happy to talk about her nursing duties. A single courteous question from me produced a spate of information, some of which I could have done without. It was her mother who cut her short. Don't talk about wounds and infections, Catherine exclaimed, especially at tea time. Anna's lips set. Her physical appearance had improved greatly these past weeks. Lefret had been giving her gentle hints about clothes and hairstyles. But the greatest change was in her expression. Even a plain woman may look attractive when she is happy and proud of herself. Watching the old, sullen look dim the girl's face, I thought I just might drop a little hint to Catherine not to be so hard on Anna. Bertie had always been her favourite, and at the present time she was desperately worried about the boy. I asked whether she'd heard from him, and she nodded. Not much of a letter, Amelia. It was full of holes, where the censor had cut out various phrases. It's so stupidly unfair. What could he possibly tell me that would give aid and comfort to anyone except me? Some of the censors are overly conscientious, I believe, I agreed. Evelyn says the same of Johnny's letters. Willie's seem to come through relatively intact, but he has always been more discreet than his brother. It is Johnny's sense of humour that leads him into indiscretions, Lefret said with a fond smile. I can easily imagine him making rude personal remarks about one of his officers or giving a vulgar description of the food they're served. That would be destructive of civilian morale, said Anna, whose sense of humour left a great deal to be desired. The men finally joined us, followed by Seshat, who, I was pleased to observe, had decided not to contribute to the canopies. She settled down next to Ramses. Cyrus was still talking about the royal statue, which he had the expertise and experience to appreciate fully. It just doesn't seem fair, he declared, shaking his head. Not to take away from you folks, but I sure would like to find some little treasure myself. Such as an unrobbed royal tomb, or a cache of mummies decked out in jewels? Nefret inquired. She and Cyrus were good friends, and he enjoyed her teasing him. His dour face broadened into a grin. Something like that. Doesn't it seem to you folks that I'm overdue for a little luck? All those years in Luxor without a single find? Excuse me, sir, but that is a slight exaggeration, Ramsey said. The tomb you found at Dra Abul Naga was unique. The plan cast new light on our knowledge of second intermediate period architecture. Well, there wasn't anything in it, Cyrus protested except a few pots and a broken-up mummy. How are you doing it, Abushir? Emerson inquired, taking out his pipe. Well, now there's another thing. I thought sure there'd be private tombs next to that miserable excuse for a pyramid. But what we've come across seems to be a temple. What? Emerson shouted. The mortuary temple of the unfinished pyramid of Abushir? Goodness gracious, Emerson, you make it sound like the lost city of Atlantis, I said. There are a number of unfinished pyramids, too many in my opinion. This one hasn't even a substructure. And that is the only part of a pyramid that interests you, said Emerson. Dark, dusty, cramped underground passages. The existence of a mortuary temple suggests that there was a burial after all. What is more important is the temple plan itself. Only a few have been excavated, and... Spare us the lecture, Emerson, I said with a smile. We all know you prefer temples to pyramids, or even tombs. I dropped you a hint on Christmas Day, Cyrus said. Been expecting you'd drop by to have a look. <laughs> Emerson fingered the cleft in his chin. I've been busy, Vandergilt. I reckon you have, what with one thing and another. Cyrus's keen blue eyes moved from Emerson to me. After a moment, he went on, with seeming irrelevance. I called on McMahon the other day. 
I'm supposed to be neutral in this war, but I've got friends and sons of friends in both armies. But I figure a fella has to take a stand, and I've made up my mind what side I'm on. Told him I was offering my services, such as they are. He was offering his services to us as well. He didn't have to say so. Coming from Cyrus, who knew us so well, the hint was enough. If it had been up to me, I would have confided fully in these loyal friends, on whose assistance and advice I had so often depended. I hadn't the right. I, too, was under orders. We had an early dinner, and then separated in order to assume our costumes. The Vandergelts had brought several pieces of luggage, since I'd invited them to spend that night and the next with us. Emerson was gracious enough to approve the ensemble I had selected for him, that of a crusader. I was his lady, in flowing robes and a pointed headdress. Emerson liked his sword and beard very much, but he objected to my pointed hat, on the grounds that it wobbled a bit and would probably poke someone's eye out. Brushing this complaint aside, I took his arm, and we proceeded into the drawing-room, where we found Catherine and Cyrus waiting, dressed as a lady and gentleman of Louis XIV's court, complete with powdered wigs. Before long, Ramses joined us. I was relieved to see that he had not assumed one of his more disgusting disguises, a verminous beggar or odorous camel-driver. He had better sense than that, of course. It would have been folly to advertise his ability to assume such roles. He hadn't gone to much trouble. A broad-brimmed ten-gallon hat borrowed from Cyrus, a neckerchief tied round his bared throat, and a pair of six shooters strapped round his waist made him into a dashing and fairly unconvincing model of an American cowboy. I doubted very much that American cowboys wore white shirts and riding breeches. "'For pity's sake, Ramses!' I exclaimed, as he swept off his hat and bowed. "'Are you carrying those weapons into Shepherds?' "'They're not loaded, Mother.' "'What happened to the spurs?' Cyrus inquired, his eyes twinkling. "'I feared they might constitute a hazard on the dance floor.' "'You were right about that,' I said. "'Nefret had taken Anna to her room. "'They came in together.' Anna looked quite nice in a bright-skirted gypsy costume and large gold earrings, but the sight of my daughter, in the full trousers and low-cut shirt of an Egyptian lady, wrung a cry of distress from my lips. The shirt was a very fine fabric and reached only just below the waist. Nefret, you are not going to wear that in public, I hope. Why not? She spun round, so that the legs of her voluminous trousers flared out. At least they were opaque, being made of heavy corded silk. It covers more of me than an ordinary evening dress. But your... your shirt is... Are you wearing anything under it? My dear girl, when a gentleman's arm encircles your waist in the dance, he will enjoy it very much, said Nefret. I may have to shoot someone after all, Ramses drawled. Nefret gave him a bright smile. The professor's wearing a sword. He can challenge the offender. That would be much more romantic. Now, Aunt Amelia, don't fuss. This is only the underneath part. I'll wear a yellek and a girdle over it. Chuckling over the little joke they had played on us, Fatima duly appeared with the garments in question and helped Nefret into them. The yellek was of silk in a delicate shade of pearly white. It was practically transparent, but at least it covered her. Emerson closed his mouth, which had been hanging open since he set astonished eyes on his daughter, breathed a gusty sigh of relief, and offered me his arm to lead me to the motor car. I will not describe the ball. It was like others we had attended, except for the uniforms. The patches of khaki were like muddy stains upon the sparkle and brilliance of the costumes. I lost sight of Ramses after he had performed his duty dances with me and Catherine. He might have been avoiding Percy, who made rather a point of putting himself in our way without having the temerity actually to address us. Whenever he was in our vicinity, Emerson made grumbling noises and put his hand on the hilt of his sword. 
I had to remind him that, first, dueling was against the law. Second, his weapon was only for show. And third, Percy had done nothing to provoke a challenge. Not yet, said Emerson, hopefully. They are playing a waltz, Peabody. Will you dance? You promised me that if I let you leave off the strapping, you wouldn't use that arm. Oh, bah, said Emerson, and demonstrated his fitness by sweeping me onto the floor. Emerson's terpsichorean talents are limited to the waltz, which he performs with such enthusiasm that my feet were only on the floor part of the time. After one particularly vigorous spin, I looked round and saw that Percy was dancing with Anna. Her cheeks were flushed, and she gazed sentimentally into his smiling face. Look there, I said to Emerson, and then wished I'd kept silent when Emerson came to a dead stop in the middle of the dance floor. It required some argument to get him started again. Doesn't she know about the bastard? he demanded. Perhaps not. Catherine and Cyrus are aware of his Machiavellian machinations with regard to Senea, but Catherine wouldn't have passed the information on to Anna without my permission. The time for discretion had passed, in my opinion. He cannot be courting her good opinion because he admires her. That isn't very kind to the girl, Emerson murmured. It is true, however. She is not handsome enough or rich enough or accommodating enough to interest him. He is using her to insinuate a wedge. She must be told of his true nature. I will leave that to you, said Emerson. I can't see that it matters. You wouldn't take that attitude if it were Nefret dancing with him instead of Anna. Damned right. When the music ended, Percy led Anna off the floor and left her. I lost sight of them after that. Some time later, I realized I had also lost sight of Nefret. I felt obliged to go in search of her. The Moorish Hall was the first place I looked. I disturbed several couples who were enjoying the intimacy of the shadowy alcoves, but Nefret was not among them. After I'd finished searching the other public areas, I went to the long bar. Women were not supposed to be there, except at certain times, but Nefret often went where she wasn't supposed to be. It didn't take me long to find her, seated at a table toward the back of the room. When I recognized her companion, my heart sank down to my slippers. Khadija had been right after all. How Nefret had managed to elude my supervision, I did not know. But it was clear that this was not her first meeting with Percy. Their heads were close together, and she was smiling as she listened. Mother? I was leaning forward, peering round the doorframe. He startled me so badly I lost my balance and would have stumbled into the room had he not taken my arm. What are you doing here? I demanded. The same thing you're doing, said Ramses, spying on Nefret. I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am. His even controlled voice made a shiver of apprehension run through me. You are not to go near Percy. Give me your word. Do you suppose I'm afraid of him? No, I do not. I am, though. You could beat him senseless with one hand. Ramses let out an odd sound that might have been a muffled laugh. Your confidence is flattering, Mother, if somewhat exaggerated. I might have to use both hands. That wasn't what I meant, though. He can never deceive us again, Ramses. We know his real nature too well. Surely you don't believe Nefret has succumbed to his flattery and his advances? No. The word was too quick and too vehement. No, I insisted. He is everything she loathes and despises. Perhaps, yes, it can only be because she thinks Percy has some new villainy in mind and that she is helping to protect you. That's what I'm afraid of, Ramsay said. Time to retreat, Mother. She's standing up. We returned to the ballroom. Nefret was not far behind us. Had she seen us? I hoped not. She had some cause for resentment if she believed I'd been spying on her. Emerson had been prowling round the room, looking for me, as he explained accusingly. Hand her over, Ramses, he ordered. The waltzes are all mine, you know. Yes, sir. Emerson took my arm, and I turned to see Nefret beside us. Except for being a trifle flushed, she displayed no evidence of self-consciousness. 
She put her hand on Ramsay's sleeve. Will you dance with me? Aren't you engaged for this one? I have disengaged myself. Please? He could not in courtesy refuse. With a formal bow, he offered her his arm. The music was a waltz, a piece with which I was not familiar, sweet and rather slow. Instead of leading me onto the floor, Emerson stood watching our son and daughter. This is the first time they've danced together in a long while, he said. Yes. We look well. Yes. They'd always looked well together, but that night there was a kind of enchantment about the way they waltzed, every movement so perfectly matched they might have been directed by a single mind. She moved lightly as a bird in flight, their clasped hands barely touching, her other hand brushing his shoulder. They were not looking at one another. Nefret's face was averted, and his was the usual impassive mask. But as I gazed, the forms of the other dancers seemed to fade away, leaving the two alone, like figures, captured and held forever in a globe of clear glass. With an effort, I shook off this somewhat unnerving fantasy. As I glanced about, I realized Emerson and I were not the only ones watching the pair. Percy's eyes followed their every moment. His arms were folded, and his face bore a complacent smile. When the dance ended, he turned and withdrew. Nefret had not seen him, her hand still on Ramsay's shoulder. She looked up into his face and spoke. Composed and unresponsive, he shook his head. Then another gentleman approached Nefret. She would have refused him, I think, had not Ramsay stepped back, bowed, and walked away. Emerson took hold of me. My eyes on the retreating form of my son, I said absently, It is not a waltz, Emerson. It is a chartiche. Oh, said Emerson. Threading his way through the whirling forms, Ramses reached the door of the ballroom. Not until that moment, when he stepped aside to allow a party to enter, did I catch a glimpse of his face. Excuse me, Emerson, I said. Ramses was not in the lounge, or the long bar, or the Moorish Hall, or on the terrace. Unless he had left the hotel altogether, there was only one other refuge he would have sought. I went round the hotel into the garden. I heard their voices before I saw them. She must have left her partner and followed him, as I had done. But a surer instinct, even than mine, had led her to the right spot. A little dell where a circle of white rose bushes surrounded a curved stone bench. The flowers glimmered like mother of pearl in the moonlight, and their scent hung heavy in the still air. They must have been talking for some little time, for the first words I made out from Nefret were obviously a response to something he had said. Don't be so damned polite. Would you rather I called you rude names? Or knocked you about. That is, I'm told, a demonstration of affection in some circles. Yes, anything but this... This... Keep your voice down, Ramsay said. I moved slowly and carefully along the graveled path until I reached a spot from which I could see them. They stood facing one another. All I could see of Ramsay's was the white of his shirt front. Her back was to me... Her robe shone with the same pearly luster as the roses that formed a frame round her, and the gems on her wrist twinkled as she raised a gloved hand and placed it on his shoulder. Her touch was not heavy, but he flinched away, and Nefret's hand fell to her side. I'm sorry. Sorry for what? We were friends once. Before, and still are, I hope. Really, Nefret, must you make a scene? I find this very fatiguing. I did not hear what she said, but it had the effect of finally breaking through his icy and infuriating self-control. He took her by her arm. She twisted neatly away and stood glaring at him, her breast rising and falling. You taught me that one, she said. So I did. Here is one I did not teach you. His movement was so quick, I saw only the result. One arm held her pressed to his side, her body arched like a bow in his hard grasp. 
Putting his hand under her chin, he tilted her head back and brought his mouth down on hers. He went on kissing her for quite a long time. When at last he left off, they were both exceedingly short of breath. Naturally, Ramses was the first to recover himself. He released her and stepped back. My turn to apologise, I believe. But you really oughtn't trust anyone to behave like a gentleman when you're alone with him in the moonlight. No doubt Percy has better manners. Nefret's hand went to her throat. She started to speak, but he cut her off. However, he's not much of a gentleman if he skulks in the shrubbery, looking on while a lady is being kissed against her will. He's a little slow, perhaps. Shall we give it another try? I could hardly blame her for striking at him. It was not a genteel, ladylike slap, but a hard swing with her clenched fist. Learn from him, I didn't doubt. That would have staggered him if it had landed. It did not. As his hand went up to block the blow, she caught herself, and for a long moment they stood like statues, her curled fingers resting in the cradle of his palm. Then she turned and walked away. Ramses sat down on the bench and covered his face with his hands. Naturally, if I had happened upon such a scene that involved mere acquaintances, I would have discreetly retired without making my presence known. Under these circumstances, I did not hesitate to intrude. To be honest, I was not myself in a proper state to think coolly. How could I have missed seeing it? I, who prided myself on my awareness of the human heart. He must have heard the rustle of my skirts. He'd had time to compose himself. When I emerged from the shrubbery, he rose and tossed away the cigarette he'd been smoking. Continue smoking, if it will calm your mind, I said, seating myself. You too, Ramses inquired. I might have known. Perhaps in another ten or twenty years you'll consider me mature enough to go about without a chaperone. Oh, my dear, don't pretend, I said. My voice was unsteady. The cool, mocking tone jarred on me as never before. I am so sorry, Ramses. How long have you... Since the moment I set eyes on her. Fidelity, Ramses said in the same cool voice, seems to be a fatal flaw of our family. Oh, come, I said, accepting the cigarette he offered and allowing him to light it for me. Are you telling me you have never... No, mother. I'm not telling you that. I discovered years ago that lying to you was a waste of breath. How the devil do you do it? Look at you, ruffled trailing, gloves spotless, blowing out smoke like a little lady dragon and prying into the most intimate secrets of a fellow's life. Spare me the lecture, I beg. My moments of aberration, and there were, I confess, a number of them, were attempts to break the spell. They failed. But you were only a child when you saw her for the first time. It sounds like one of the wilder romances, doesn't it? Most authors would throw in hints of reincarnation and souls destined for one another down the long centuries. It wasn't so simple as I've made it sound, you know, or as tragic. A weakness for melodrama is another of our family failings. Tell me, I urged. It is unhealthy to keep one's feelings to oneself. How often you must have yearned to confide in a sympathetic listener... Uh, quite, said Ramses. Does David know? Some of it. Glancing at me, Ramses added, It wasn't the same, naturally, as confiding in one's mother. Naturally. I said no more. I could feel his need to unburden himself. Experienced as I am in such matters, I knew that sympathetic silence was the best means of inducing his confidences. Sure enough... After a few moments, he began. It was only a child's infatuation at first. How could it be anything more? But then came that summer I spent with Sheikh Mohammed. I thought that being away from her for months, with the Sheikh providing interesting distractions, 
Catching himself, he added hastily, "'Riding and exploring and strenuous physical exercise. "'Of all varieties,' I muttered. "'Shameful old man. I ought never have allowed you to go.' "'Never mind, mother. "'I would apologise for referring, however obliquely, "'to a subject unsuitable for female contemplation, "'if I weren't certain that you are thoroughly conversant with it. "'When David and I came back to Cairo, "'I thought I'd got over it. "'But when I saw her on the terrace at Shepherd's that afternoon, "'and she ran to meet me, laughing, and threw her arms round me, "'he plucked one of the drooping roses.' Twirling the stem between his fingers, he went on. I knew that day I loved her, and always would. But I couldn't tell anyone how I felt. A declaration of undying passion from a sixteen-year-old boy would have provoked laughter or pity, and I couldn't have stood either. So I waited, and worked, and hoped, and lost her to a man whose death came close to destroying her. She had begun to forgive me for my part in that, I think. Forgive you? I exclaimed. What had she to forgive? You were the soul of honour throughout that horrible business. It is for her to ask your forgiveness. She ought to have had faith in you. And I ought to have gone after her and shaken some sense into her. I realised now that that was what she wanted me to do. That perhaps she had the right to expect it of me. Especially after... He checked himself. I said helpfully, after having been such good friends for so long, that is what your father always did. To you. But surely you never gave father cause to shake some sense into me? My laughter was brief and rueful. I am ashamed to admit that I did, more than once. There was one occasion, one woman in particular... I need not say that my suspicions were completely unfounded. But if love has an adverse effect on common sense, jealousy destroys it completely. Of course, the cases are not entirely parallel. No. I could tell that he was trying to picture Emerson shaking me as I shouted accusations of infidelity at him. He was obviously having some difficulty doing so. He shook his head. Unfortunately, I'm not like father. I've never found it easy to express my feelings. When I'm angry or, or offended, I pull back into my shell. That's my weakness, Mother, just as impulsiveness as Nefret's. I know it's stupid, infuriating and selfish. One ought at least give the other fellow the satisfaction of losing one's temper. I've seen you lose it a few times. I've been practising, Ramses said with a wry smile. Last year I thought she was beginning to care a little. But then this other business came up, and I didn't dare confide in her. I hoped that one day, when this is over, I could explain and start again. But what I did tonight was the worst mistake I could have made. One doesn't force oneself on a woman like Nefret. In my opinion, it was a distinctly positive step, I said. Faint heart never won fair lady, my dear. And without wishing in any way to condone the employment of physical force, there are times when a woman may secretly wish... Hmm. Let me think how to put this. She may hope that the strength of a gentleman's affection for her will cause him to forget his manners. Ramses opened his mouth and closed it again. I was pleased to see that my sympathetic conversation had comforted him. He sounded quite his normal self when he finally found his voice. Mother, you never cease to amaze me. Are you seriously suggesting I should... Why, Ramses, you know I would never venture to urge a course of action on another individual, particularly in affairs of the heart. Ramses had lit another cigarette. He must have inhaled the wrong way, for he began to cough... I patted him on the back. However, a demonstration of an attachment so powerful it can't be controlled, particularly by a gentleman who has controlled it only too well, would, I believe, affect most women favourably. I trust you follow me. I think I do, Ramsay said in a choked voice. Rising, he offered me his hand. Will you come back to the ball now? 
They'll be serving supper soon, and I know. You can depend on me, but I believe I will sit here a few minutes longer. Do you go on, my dear? He hesitated for a moment. Then he said softly, I love your mother. He took my hand and kissed it, and folded my fingers round the stem of the rose. He had stripped it of its thorns. I was too moved to speak. But maternal affection was not the only emotion that prevented utterance. As I watched him walk away, his head high and his step firm, anger boiled within me. I knew I had to conquer it before I saw Nefret again, or I would take her by the shoulders and shake her and demand that she love my son. That would have been unfair as well as very undignified. I knew it, but I had to force my jaws apart to keep them from grinding my teeth with outrage and fury. She ought to love him. He was the only man who was truly her equal in intelligence and integrity, in loving affection and... Still waters run deep, it is said. I, his affectionate mother, ought to have realised that beneath that controlled mask his nature was as deep and passionate as hers. The heat of anger faded, to be replaced with an icy chill of foreboding. Ramsay's feet were set on a path fraught with peril, and a man who fears he has lost the thing he wants most in life takes reckless chances. The young are especially susceptible to this form of romantic pessimism. Rising, I shook out my skirts and squared my own shoulders. Another challenge. I was up to it. I would see those two wed if I had to lock Nefret up on bread and water until she agreed. But first, there was the little matter of making certain Ramses lived long enough to marry her. The last dance before supper was beginning when I entered the ballroom to find Emerson lying in wait for me. Where have you been? he demanded. It's almost time. Has something happened? You are grinding your teeth. Am I? I was. Hastily, I got my countenance under control. Never mind. The crucial hour is upon us. Tell them to bring the motor car round and I will inform Catherine that we are leaving. I was fortunate enough to find her sitting with the chaperones. I didn't give a curse whether those tedious gossips overheard me, but I did not want to have to explain myself to Nefret or face that knowing blue gaze of Cyrus. Catherine responded as I had hoped and expected, even anticipating my request that she look after Nefret and bring her home with them. She did not ask about Ramses. No, oh, yes, I thought, as I hurried to the cloakroom. She and Cyrus suspect something is afoot. After all, this would not be the first time we'd been involved in a deadly and secret game. It happened almost every year. Emerson had already retrieved my evening cloak. He tossed it over my shoulders, grunted, Take off that damned pointed hat! and led me out the door. The motor car was waiting, and so was Ramsay's hat in hand. He got into the tonneau. I took my place beside Emerson and watched him closely as he went through the procedures necessary to start the vehicle moving. There was a grinding noise. There always was when Emerson started it. And off we went. We were several miles south of the city, on the road to Helwan, when Ramses tapped his father on the shoulder. Stop here. Emerson complied. Even in the dark, and it was very dark, he knows every foot of the terrain of Egypt. The quarries of Tula, he asked. Nearby. The door opened and Ramses got out. He wasn't nearly as odorous as he'd been before, but the galabia covered his costume and the turban his hair. Good night, he said, and disappeared noiselessly into the darkness. Emerson got out of the vehicle, leaving the engine running. Now then, Peabody, he said, as he began removing the jangly bits of his armour. Would you care to explain that brilliant scheme you mentioned? Did you arrange for Selim to meet you and drive you home? Or did you intend to await me here? Or... Not at all. 
I slid over into the seat he had vacated and took firm hold of the steering wheel. Show me how to drive this thing. I was teasing my dear Emerson. I knew how to operate the confounded machine. At my request, Nefret had taken me out once or twice and shown me how to do it. For some reason, she hadn't been able to continue the lessons, but, after all, once the fundamentals were explained, the rest was only a matter of practice. I had a little argument with Emerson. It would have been longer if I'd not pointed out he must not delay. He is already some distance ahead of you, my dear. It is vitally important that you watch over him tonight. I handed him the nice, clean, striped robe I had brought in my evening bag. Why tonight? Curse it, Peabody. Just take my word for it, Emerson. Hurry! Torn between his concern for his son and his concern for me and the motor car, Emerson made the choice I had hoped he would make. Swearing inventively but softly, he ran off along the path Ramses had taken. Pride swelled my bosom. No husband could have offered a greater testimonial of confidence. As he told me later, he had concluded that I was bound to run the vehicle into a ditch or a tree before I got a hundred feet. There would not be time for me to get up much speed in that distance, and he would find me waiting bruised and embarrassed but relatively unscathed when he returned. Naturally, no such thing happened. I did hit a tree or two, but not very hard. Since I was not entirely confident of my ability to turn the car, I had to go all the way to Hell One before I found a space large enough to drive in a nice circle and head back the way I'd come. That was when I hit the second tree. It was only a glancing blow. The distance from Cairo to Hell One is approximately 17 miles. It took me almost an hour to reach Hell One. Steering the thing was more complicated than I'd realized, and the clutch as I believed it is termed, gave me a little trouble initially. Fortunately, there was no traffic on the road at that hour. By the time I started back, I had got the hang of it and was beginning to understand why Emerson had insisted on driving himself. It was just like a man. They always invent feeble excuses to keep women from enjoying themselves. I reached the bridge in a little over a quarter of an hour. There was no time to waste. I had to be home before the others returned from the ball. I slowed down a bit as I passed the spot where I'd left Emerson, but there was no sign of anyone, so I didn't stop. The motor car was as conspicuous as a signpost. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. From the point where he had left the car, the distance was less than two miles, there were paths, since the quarries were still being worked, and intrepid tourists sometimes visited them, usually by donkey from Helwan. The fine white limestone of Tura had provided the shining exterior coating of the pyramids and faced temples and mastabas for thousands of years. Some of the ancient workings penetrated deep into the heart of the Jebel. All of which made Ramses wonder why this spot had been chosen as a hiding place, it was the most dangerous one yet, the most likely to be discovered by chance. The change in the arrangements was also disturbing. There had been a long interval between this delivery and the last, and this time the Turk had avoided direct contact. It might have been only a precautionary measure on his part, but the time was drawing near, and if the man in charge of the operation doubted Wardani's commitment, this could be a way of testing him or removing him. The insects and lizards that infested the cliffs were somnolent now, their body temperature lowered by the cold air. Other animals were on the prowl, hunting and being hunted. He heard the bark of a jackal and a distant rattle of rock under the hooves of an antelope or ibex. Those sounds helped to mask the noises he was making. He had exchanged his boots for sandals, but there was no way of moving in complete silence, Bits of bleached bone snapped under his feet and pebbles rolled. He left the path after a time and made his cautious way down into and up out of a series of small wadis. More pebbles rolled. When he came up out of the last depression, he was several hundred feet east of the spot the message had indicated. The brilliant desert stars cast an ethereal ivory light over the white cliffs, 
Shadows like ink strokes outlined their uneven contours and formed black holes at the entrances of the ancient diggings. He stood still, knowing that immobility served as a kind of camouflage, but his shoulder blades felt naked and exposed, and he didn't relax until a man stepped out of one of the openings and raised an arm to wave him on. It's all right, David said when Ramses reached him. Dead quiet. I found the cash. He'd come by one of the paths that were used to transport stone down to the river. A small cart and a pair of patient donkeys stood nearby. Is it all here? Ramses asked. Don't know. I didn't want to start dragging the boxes out till you got here. Give me a hand. Wait a minute. Somewhere to the south, a lovesick dog raised its voice in poignant appeal, and Ramses raised his, three words uttered before the howl died away. Father, come ahead. David let out a strangled expletive. You didn't tell me. He didn't tell me. Emerson's large form was hard to make out until he moved. The white and black striped robe faded into the pattern of moonlit rock and dark shadows, he came toward them with the light, quick stride unusual in so heavy a man. Curse it, he remarked calmly. I thought I made very little noise. It's impossible not to make some noise. I had a feeling you'd follow me. Where did you leave? Please don't tell me you brought her with you. No, no. Emerson's beard split in a grin. It was an incredible beard, covering half his face and reaching to his collarbone. Don't worry about your mother. Let's get the job done. With his help, the job was done in half the time Ramses had allowed. His skin prickled when he saw how carelessly the load had been hidden. The artificial nature of the cairn of stones covering the hole was dangerously obvious. Flat on his belly, lifting canvas-wrapped bundles one-handed, Emerson said, Not a very professional job. No. Ramses passed the bundles to David, who placed them in the cart. Was that all? Emerson grunted and reached down. He'd used both hands to lift the rough wooden boxes. Grenades and ammunition, Ramses said, tight-lipped. What's that one? It was larger and heavier. Emerson hauled it out. I think I could hazard a guess, but you'd better have it open. The lid gave way with a hideous screech. Ramses pried it up just enough to look in. Holy God, it's a machine gun. A maxim, I think. And here, I suspect, is the mount, said Emerson, removing another box. That's the last. I wonder how many more there were, and where they are now. So do I, Ramsay said grimly. He hoisted the box into his arms and deposited it in the cart. Someone else has been here. It looks that way. His father stood up. I'll drive the cart. You boys go on your way. But, Father, if I'm intercepted by a patrol, I have a better chance of talking my way out of it than either of you. Ramses couldn't argue with that. All his father would have to do was identify himself. No one would dare ask what he was doing or what the cart contained. I had intended to take them to Fort Tura, Ramses began. Emerson nodded approval. The place is in ruins and nobody goes there. After I've unloaded, I will proceed placidly back along the main road, a poor, hard-working peasant with an empty cart. Where shall I leave your equipage, David? Um, Emerson climbed up onto the seat and picked up the reins. He was obviously impatient to be off. Where did you hire it? I stole it, David admitted in a small voice. The owner farms a few fedans near Kashlakat. She's a very heavy sleeper. Emerson chuckled appreciatively. Then he probably won't notice it's missing until morning. I'll abandon it near the village. He'll find it eventually. He spoke to the donkeys in Arabic, and they groaned into motion. Ramses and David stood watching as the cart jounced along the path. He'll be all right, won't he? David asked anxiously. The father of curses. He'll be telling those donkeys before he's gone much farther. We might just follow along the same path for a while, though, at a distance. The creak and rumble of the cart was audible a long way off. It stopped once. David stiffened, and Ramses laughed. 
I told you he'd get off and tow the donkeys. There, he's gone on. There wouldn't be any trouble now. If an attack had been planned, it would have already taken place, and he was certain no one had followed Emerson. The release of tension left him limp. He yawned. You've got a long walk ahead, David said. Not as long as yours. I slept most of the day. How was the ball? Jolly. I'm sure it was. Here, watch out. He steadied Ramses with a hand on his arm. Stubbed my toe, said the latter, hopping. Damn these sandals. Let's go back to the road. It's easier walking. There was no sign of the cart or the motor car when they reached the road. The dusty surface lay like a pale ribbon in the moonlight. How are you and Nifret getting on? David inquired. Why do you ask? Something has happened, David said calmly. I can always tell. Yes, you can, can't you? He was tired, and the comfort of David's companionship loosened his tongue. The truth is... It's been more difficult than I expected, staying at a safe distance and trying not to be alone with her. I slipped a few times. And then tonight, she asked me to dance with her. I couldn't refuse. And I wanted to. God, how I wanted to. I got the hell away as soon as I could, but she followed me into the garden. And I... I couldn't stop myself. From doing what? What do you suppose? The options were limited in their surroundings. I kissed her, that's all. Finally, David exclaimed. Then what happened? Damn it, Ramses said, half laughing and half angry. You're as bad as mother. She gave me plenty of advice. I don't need any more from you. About Nifret and you? David asked in surprise. I thought you didn't want her to know. I didn't. I was afraid she'd do precisely what she did tonight after she saw us together. Lecture, sympathize, advise. She was, in fact, she was very sweet. And she told me a few things about her and father that came as a considerable shock. Did you tell her you and Nefret had... David hesitated delicately. Tell my mother we'd been lovers? Good God, David, are you out of your mind? The professor doesn't know either, I suppose. Not from me, said his son grimly. He's a Victorian gentleman, and you know how he feels about Nefret. If I'd confided in anyone, it would have been you. But I didn't think I had the right. Leah shouldn't have told you either. I'm glad she did. It helped me to understand why Nefret acted as she did. You never showed me that letter she wrote Leah. Leah never showed it to me. Nor should she have done. It was meant for her eyes only. She told me enough, though. Ramses, you damned fool. Nefret was head over heels in love with you. And I believe she still is. Why won't you tell her how you feel? Haven't you forgiven her for doubting you? I forgave her long ago. And I would trust her with my life. But I won't trust her with yours, David. She's been seeing Percy. Secretly. David sucked in his breath. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. She's met with him several times, and he was hiding in the shrubbery while we uh, talked. I spotted him before I lost complete control of myself, but the only way I could keep matters from proceeding further was to say something utterly unforgivable to Nefret. Ah, said David. So she was not unwilling. Hang it, Ramses. When are you going to stop making a martyr of yourself? As soon as this is over. Once we're in the clear, I'll plead with her, humble myself, or drag her off by her hair, whatever it takes. Just now I don't risk it. Passes on to me, you know. Oh, not the Wardani business. At least I hope to God not. But he suspects I'm involved in something, and he's trying to find out what it is. That's why he's been paying me those extravagant and very public compliments. He's probably approached Nefret in the hope that he could learn more. She's the weak link in our circle. Or so Percy would assume. He's such a conceited bastard. He thinks no woman can resist him. And she, in turn, is hoping to learn something from him. That sounds like Nefret, all right. I don't understand, though. Why should Percy care what you're doing? Doesn't a possible reason occur to you?
aside from the fact that he hates you and would stop at nothing to injure you? There's no chance of that. Even if he found out what you're doing, which, God forbid, he couldn't use it against you. You don't understand, Ramsay said angrily. Even after all the other things he's done, you don't realize what he's capable of. Why do you suppose I wanted Sunia to stay in England this winter? I knew I'd be preoccupied with this other business and unable to watch over her as closely as I've done before. Passe hates the lot of us, and the sweetest, neatest revenge he could find would be through that child. Can you imagine the effect on father if anything happened to her? On all of us? Yes. She's safe from him, but Nefret is another matter. You may think I'm making a martyr of myself without sufficient cause, but I had to do what I did tonight. Have you forgotten what happened the last time he saw Nefret and me in what he took to be a lover's embrace? His vanity is as swollen and as fragile as a balloon. God knows what he might do to her if he thought she was only feigning interest in him in order to trick him. She's too brave and reckless to recognize danger and too impulsive to guard her tongue when a slip could be disastrous. And he's always wanted her. And he... Stop it! David put an arm round his shoulders. Don't do this to yourself. Not even Percy would injure Nefret to get back at you. Ramses felt like Cassandra, howling warnings into deaf ears. He forced himself to speak slowly and calmly. He raped a 13-year-old girl and left her child, his child, to be raised as a prostitute. If he didn't kill Rashida with his own hands, he hired someone to kill her. There's nothing he wouldn't do if his safety and reputation were threatened. He wouldn't dare harm Nefret, David insisted. She's not a poor little prostitute. She's a lady and the beloved daughter of the father of curses. Your father would tear Percy to pieces if he laid a hand on her. Ramses realized he hadn't a chance of making David understand. He was too decent and too honorable to recognize evil. Or, Ramses rubbed his aching forehead, was he the one who refused to recognize reality? Had his loathing of Percy turned into dementia? They tramped on in silence until they reached the train station at Babylon. Ramsay stopped. I'm tired, he said dully. There's a cab. I'm going to hire it, unless you want to. You take it. I can sleep as late as I like. Are you angry? No, just a bit on edge. This will boil over within the next few days. The signs are all there. I need to be able to reach you in a hurry if that does happen. Any ideas? I'll be peddling my wilted blossoms outside Shepherd's every day, as we arranged. Fine so far as it goes, but I can't always be certain of getting away during the day. Give me an alternative. David thought for a minute. There's always the useful coffee shop or cafe. Do you remember the one that's just off the Sharia Abul Ella near the Presbyterian Church? I'll be there every night from now on, between nine and midnight. All right. David's hand rested for a moment on his shoulder. Get some rest. You need it. Ramses woke the sleeping driver and got into the cab. He was tired, but his mind wouldn't stop churning. Had his father made it home safely? And what the devil was his mother doing? Emerson had pointedly refused to answer questions about her. Worst of all was the mounting conviction that had been forced on him by one fact after another. He doubted he could convince anyone else, especially when a crucial clue had been supplied by a transvestite Nubian pimp. He could picture Russell's face when he heard that one. But he had gone to El Garbi to ask where the ineffectual terrorist had procured his grenades, and El Garbi had kept dragging Percy into the conversation. Elgabe knew everything that went on in the dark world of prostitution, drugs and crime and he had kept talking about Percy hiding his real motive behind a screen of fulsome compliments and pretended sympathy Elgabe was approximately as romantic as a cobra that final sting about Percy's role in tricking Nefret into marriage had been designed to give Ramses a single piece of vital information 
Percy's connections with Nefret's husband had been closer than anyone had suspected. Close enough to be a partner in Geoffrey's illegal business activities, drugs and forged antiquities. Percy had spent several months in Alexandria with Russell while Russell was trying to shut down the import of hashish into Cairo from the coast west of the Delta. One way or another, Percy knew the roots and the men who ran the drugs. They were, Ramses believed, the same roots being used now to transport arms. As Ramses had good cause to know, the grenades hadn't come from Wardani's people. So whom did that leave? A British officer who had access to a military arsenal? A man who wouldn't scruple to kill an innocent passerby in order to play hero and impress his alienated family? Most damning of all was the fact that Farouk had known about the house in Mahdi. It had been a closely guarded secret between Ramses and David until Ramses took Zania and her young mother there to hide them from Kalan. Ramses had never known how the pimp tracked her down. She might have been the innocent agent of her own betrayal, slipping back to El Wasa to visit friends and boast of the new protector who had incredibly offered her safety without asking anything in return. Rashida was dead, and Kalan had not shown his face in Cairo since, and there was only one other person who had been a party to that filthy scheme. Percy, who was now paying him extravagant, hypocritical compliments and defending his tarnished reputation. If Percy was the traitor and spy Ramses suspected him of being... His interest in his cousin's present activities was prompted by more than idle curiosity. It made a suggestively symmetrical pattern. But what chance had he of convincing anyone else when even David thought his hatred of Percy had become an irrational idée fixe? Would any of them believe a member of their own superior caste, an officer and a gentleman, would sell out to the enemy? He knew he couldn't keep the knowledge to himself. He'd have to tell someone. But I'm damned if I'm going after him myself, he thought. Not now. Not until I'm out of this, and I've got David out, and he can go home to Lear, and I can shake some sense into a fret and keep her safe. I couldn't stand to lose her again. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript. H. Chapter 13. After seeing Nefret and the Vandergelts and Fatima, who had insisted on waiting up for them, off to bed, I put on a dressing gown and crept downstairs. The windows of the sitting room faced the road, and it was on the cushioned seat under them that I took up my position after easing the shutters back in order to see out. It was very late, or very early, depending on one's point of view those dead, silent hours when one feels like the only person alive. The moon had set, beyond the limited circles of light shed by the lamps we kept burning at our door. The road lay quiet in the starlight. I was not aware that Ramses had returned until the sitting-room door opened just wide enough to enable a dark figure to slip in. Two dark figures, to be precise. Seshat was close on his heels... Did you enjoy climbing that trellis? I inquired somewhat snappishly. Relief often has such an effect. He sat down next to me. I had to report myself to Seshat. How did you know I was here? I knew you weren't in your room. I looked in. I trust you'll overlook the impertinence. I was a trifle anxious about father. So you saw him, I murmured. Heard him, rather. He gave me a brief account of what had transpired... I hope you don't think I did wrong in letting him go off alone. Good gracious, no. Short of binding him hand and foot, you couldn't have prevented him. How did it go on your end? There was no difficulty. I arrived home well before the others. The area of illumination looked very small against the enveloping darkness. He's a long way to come, I said uneasily. Perhaps I ought to take the motor car out again and go to meet him. We were sitting side by side, our heads together, so we could converse quietly. 
I felt his arm and shoulder jerk violently. Again? He gasped. Didn't your father tell you? No. He seemed to be having trouble catching his breath. I wondered why he... You drove the car home? Not all the way from Tura. Where is it? In the stable yard, of course. Take a glass of water, my dear. Father would say the situation calls for whiskey, Ramses muttered. Never mind. Just tell me what happened. I don't think I can stand the suspense. I concluded my narrative by remarking somewhat acerbically, I do not understand why you and your father should assume I am incapable of such a simple procedure. I believe you're capable of anything, said Ramses. I was pondering this statement when Seshat sailed past me and out the window. A thump and a faint rustle of shrubbery were the only sounds of her passage through the garden. Your father, I exclaimed. A mouse, Ramses corrected. Don't credit her with greater powers than she has. Oh, I do hope she will eat it outside and not bring it to you. As for the motor car, shh, he held up his hand. According to Daoud, Ramses can hear a whisper across the Nile. My hearing was sharpened by affectionate concern, but it was several moments before I made out the sound that had alerted him. It was not the sound of booted feet. A camel, I said, unable to conceal my disappointment. Some early rising peasant? The early rising peasant was in more of a hurry than those individuals usually are. The camel was trotting. As it entered the lamplight, I beheld Emerson, upright and bareheaded, legs crossed on the camel's neck, smoking his pipe. He yanked on the head rope to slow the beast and whacked it on the side of the neck to turn it toward the front of the house and the window. I winced as my tenderly nurtured roses crunched under four large flat feet. At Emerson's command, the camel settled ponderously onto the ground, crushing a few hundred marigolds and petunias, and Emerson dismounted. Ah, he said, peering in the window. There you are, Peabody. Move aside, I'm coming in. I found my voice. Emerson, get that damned camel out of my garden. The damage is done, I fear, said Ramses. Father, where did you acquire it? Stole it. Emerson climbed over the sill. Got the idea from David. You can't just leave it there, I exclaimed. How are you going to explain its presence? And the owner... Don't concern yourself about the camel. I'll think of something. What did you do to the car? Put it in the stable yard, of course. In what condition? Let's not waste time on trivialities, Emerson. The most important thing is that you are here. Ramses is here. I am here. I suggest we all go to bed and... No point in that. It'll be light in an hour or two, said my indefatigable spouse. What about breakfast, eh, Peabody? It would be unkind to rouse Fatima at this hour, when she was so late getting to bed last night. Good God, no, I wouldn't do that. I'll just cook up some eggs and coffee and... No, you will not. You always burn the bottoms off the pans. I would offer, said Ramses, but... But you always burn them too. The idea of breakfast had some merit. I wanted to hear how Emerson had carried out his task, and I knew he would be in a much better humour after he had been fed. The dents in the motor car were bound to provoke some recriminatory remarks. And the missing lamp... No, oh, very well. I'll see what's in the larder. There was a lot in the larder, and Emerson tucked into a roast chicken wing with a hearty appetite. Between bites, he gave us a description of his adventures. It went off without a hitch. What did you expect? After I'd stowed the stuff away, I drove the cart back to Kashlakat and left it outside the mosque. You walked off and left it? The donkeys weren't going anywhere. As for walking, I concluded I would rather not. He stopped chewing and gave me a reproachful look. I'd become very anxious about you, my dear. I expected to find you not far from where I'd left you. Oh, you did, did you? My interest in Emerson's narrative had not prevented me from noticing that Ramses had put very little food on his plate and had eaten very little of that. He finished his cup of coffee and rose. No, I said. Please, Ramses, don't go out again. Mother, I must. 
I ought to have taken care of it earlier, but I wanted to make certain Father got home all right. I should be back by daylight. The others will sleep late, Emerson said. But um, don't be any longer than you can help, my boy. Do you know who it was? What? I began. Emerson waved me to silence, and Ramsay said, Not for certain, but Rashad is the most likely candidate. If he wakes to see me squatting on the foot of his bed, glowering like a gargoyle, he'll be in a proper state for interrogation. I said, What? And Ramsay said, Tell her, father, I must hurry. You aren't going on foot, I hope, said Emerson. Ramsay's tight lips parted in a smile. I'll take the camel. He was gone. I put my elbows on the table and my face in my hands. Now, now, Peabody, Emerson patted me on the shoulder. How much longer is this going to continue? It can't be much longer. If the last delivery's been made, dear Tug must be imminent. Don't you suppose he is as anxious as you are to get this over? I know he is. That is what frightens me. Desperation drives a man to recklessness. I take it Rashad is one of Bordani's lieutenants? Not another of the same ilk as Farouk, I hope. Unlikely, said Emerson, with infuriating calm. Part of the cash was missing. Someone had got there before us. That means there are a hundred rifles and possibly a machine gun or two in unknown hands and an unknown location. Not enough to win a war, but enough to kill quite a number of people. The most likely suspect is this fellow, Rashad, who had been exhibiting signs of insubordination, egged on, no doubt, by Farouk. That has been one of Ramsay's difficulties all along, keeping that lot of young radicals under control. I know that type. Good gad, I was one of them myself once upon a time. Naive and idealistic, and itching to prove their manhood by rioting in the streets. Fists and rocks and clubs can do a limited amount of harm, but a gun is entirely different. It makes a weak man feel like a hero, and a strong man feel as if he is immortal, and it removes the last inhibition a killer might feel. You don't have to be close to a man to put a bullet into him. You don't have to see his face. Were you a radical, Emerson? I still am, my dear. Ask anyone in Cairo. Emerson's grin faded. Peabody, Ramses took on this assignment for one reason and one reason only. To keep people from being injured, even those young fools of revolutionaries. He won't rest until he's got those guns back, and when he does, he will have accomplished what he set out to do, and this damned business will end, if I have to collect the damned weapons and the damned young fools myself. Are you trying not to cry, let it out, my darling, let it out. You look dreadful with your face screwed up like that. I'm trying not to sneeze. I rubbed my nose. Though your words moved me deeply, Emerson. You have given me new heart. I am ready to act when you are. We'll give Russell time to act first. Not much time, though. Curse it. Something is going to happen in the next two or three days... The Turks are within five miles of the canal in some areas. They've begun digging themselves in east of Kantara and Kubri and El Fadan. In the meantime, that lot of Claytons is drawing up maps and examining broader questions of strategy, as they put it. What we need is detailed information, precisely where and when the attack will take place, how many men, what kind of armaments, and so on. Our defences are dangerously undermanned, but if we knew that we might be able to hold them. Might? Really, Emerson, you're not very encouraging. Not to worry, my dear. Emerson's handsome blue eyes took on a faraway look. If the enemy takes Cairo, we will retreat into the wadis and hold out until reinforcements arrive from England. The weapons I concealed at Fort Tura. You'd like that, wouldn't you? I? Emerson's dreamy smile stiffened into a look of rigid disapproval. I only want to get on with my excavations, Peabody. What do you take me for? I went to him and put my arms round his shoulders. The bravest man I know. One of them. Ow! Emerson, don't you dare kiss me while you're wearing that beard. 
The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Ramses knew where Rashad and the others lived. He kept track of changes of address, which were fairly frequent. This wouldn't be the first time he had dropped in on one of them without warning. He preferred these epiphanies, not only for the sake of safety, but because they added to his own mystique. Wardani knows all. Rashad, whose father was a wealthy landowner in Asyut, had a room to himself in a building near El Azar, where he was, in theory at least, a student. Whether from inertia or self-confidence or love of comfort, he hadn't shifted quarters lately, and Ramses had decided the best approach was through the window, which gave on to a narrow street leading off the Sharia El Tableta. The window was on the first floor with a blank wall under it, but the camel would help him with that little difficulty if he could force the balky beast into position. As he might have expected, the camel walked out from under him as soon as he got hold of the sill, and he had a bit of a scramble to get in. Fortunately, Rashad was a heavy sleeper. He was snoring peacefully when Ramses took up a position at the foot of his bed. The darkness paled with the approach of dawn, and Ramses decided irritably that he couldn't wait for the lazy lout to have his sleep out. He had to be out of the room before it was light enough for Rashad to get a good look at him. The tweed coat and trousers were the ones he had worn before, and the hat shadowed his face, but he hadn't had time to alter his features with makeup. He lowered his voice to the resonant pitch he had learned from Hakim the Seer of Mysteries, also known as Alfred Jenkins, who did a mind-reading stunt at the London Music Halls. Rashad. The response would have been entertaining if Ramses had been in a mood for broad humour. Rashad thrashed and squawked and squirmed, fetching up in a sitting position with his back against the wall and his knees drawn up and the sheet clumsily arranged over his naked body. Camille, you, how, where, Ramses corrected, where did you take them? There was no argument. But there were plenty of excuses. Ramses interrupted him. The ruined mosque. You haven't much imagination, have you? They must be moved. I'll see to it myself. I will overlook your insubordination this time, Rashad. But if it happens again... He left the threat unspecified, knowing Rashad had enough imagination to picture a variety of ugly possibilities, and went to the door. Rashad had not only barred it, but shoved a chair against it. As he removed these pathetic impediments, Rashad continued to squeal apologies. Ramses left without replying. He didn't suppose Rashad would work up nerve enough to follow him, especially since he had taken the precaution of borrowing the glabilla Rashad had laid out across a chair, ready to put on in the morning. There was no sign of the camel. He didn't waste time looking for it. It would not be lonely for long, and its original owner would be anonymously and generously reimbursed. In Ramsay's opinion, he was lucky to be rid of the brute. It had the gait of a three-legged mule, and it had tried to bite him on the leg. He quickened his steps, reaching the mosque as the call to morning prayer ended. After removing his shoes and hat, he went inside, pausing by the fountain to bathe his face, hands and arms. There were few worshippers, since most people preferred to pray at home, and as Ramses went through the prescribed positions, kneeling at last close to the left wall, he hoped that what he was doing would not be regarded as profanation. He slipped his hand into the opening in the wall, and paper crackled under his fingers. The train left him off at Giza station. Since it was now broad daylight, he was as likely to be seen climbing up the trellis as walking in the front door, so he did the latter. The smell of frying bacon floated toward his appreciative nostrils, and he followed it toward the breakfast room. The Vandergelts weren't down yet, but Nefret had joined his parents at the table. They all turned to stare when he sauntered in. Enjoy your walk his father inquired, giving him a cue he didn't need. Nefret yawned prettily, covering her mouth with her hand. Such energy! Early to bed and early to rise. I hope you're feeling wealthy and wise, because you don't look especially healthy. 
kind of you to say so. You've got those dark smudges under your eyes, Nefret explained. Very romantic looking, but indicative, in my experience, of too little sleep. I thought you came home early last night. I also woke early. Couldn't get back to sleep, so I went for a long walk. Fatima put a plate of eggs in front of him. He thanked her and told himself to shut up. He was explaining too much. You should have hoarded your strength, said his father, with a wolfish smile. I mean to get in a full day's work, so hurry and finish breakfast. Ramses nodded obediently. His mother hadn't spoken, but he hadn't missed the signs of silent relief when he walked into the room. She always carried herself like a soldier, even when she was sitting down. It made him feel like a swine to see those straight shoulders sag and that controlled face lose a little of its colour. What he was doing was unfair to David and Nefret, but it was brutal to his parents. Perhaps the news he brought would cheer them up. He had to wait until they were on their way to Giza before he had a chance to speak with his mother alone. His father had gone on ahead with Nefret, and Ramses held Risha to the plodding pace of his mother's mare. I know where he's hidden them, he said without preamble. It was the man you suspected? Yes. He was only trying to be helpful. A feeble excuse, but he wasn't in a state to think clearly. His mother was. She was blind as a mole about some things, but every now and then she hit the nail square on the head. The Turks are communicating directly with him. They must be, or he wouldn't have known where the cash was located. You didn't tell him, did you? No. You're right, of course. They know where he lives, too. The message was pushed under his door. They're having doubts of you, of Wardani. They always have had. Now that they've lost their agent, they're trying to undermine my control another way. I doubt it means anything more than that. Time's running out for them. I collected another little missive this morning. She held out her hand. Ramses couldn't help smiling. I destroyed it. It said, be ready. Within two days. Then you can confiscate the weapons and put an end to this. Now, today. She yanked on the reins. Ramses halted Risha and reached for her hand, loosening her clenched fingers. In her present mood, she was quite capable of galloping straight to Russell's office and yelling orders at him across the desk. Leave it to me, Mother. Russell is waiting for word. As soon as he gets it, he'll act. It's all been worked out. The worst is over. Don't lose your head now. I have your promise? Yes. Very well. They started forward. After a moment, he heard a loud sniff and a muffled... I apologise. It's all right, Mother. Oh, damnation, are you crying? What did I say? There were only two tears, after all. She wiped them away with her fingers and squared her shoulders. Hurry on, your father will be waxing impatient. Ramses gave his father the same information shortly afterwards, while they were measuring the outer dimensions of the second burial shaft. He didn't get off quite as easily this time. Emerson wanted to know where Rashad had put the guns and how Ramses meant to inform Russell, and a number of other things that he was probably entitled to know, just in case. Having been gracious enough to approve the arrangements, Emerson turned his attention to excavation. Ramses didn't doubt his father fully intended to round up a few revolutionaries himself and was looking forward to it, but he had a scholar's ability to concentrate on the task at hand. We may as well see what's there, he announced, indicating the opening of the shaft. Get back to work on your walls, my boy. I will start the men here. Selim is down there helping Nefret take photographs. They don't need me. Oh? Emerson gave him an odd look. As you like. He didn't want to go near Nefret. It would be like showing a hungry child a table loaded with sweets and telling him he must wait until after supper. In a few days, perhaps a few hours, he could confess, beg her forgiveness, and ask her again to marry him. And if she said no, he would follow his mother's advice. The idea was so alluring it dizzied him. 
They didn't put in a full day's work after all. His mother dragged them back to the house for an early luncheon, pointing out that it would be rude to ignore their guests. Emerson had to agree, though he hated to tear himself away. As the shaft deepened, they began to find scraps of broken pottery and finally a collection of small model offering vessels. The Vandergelts had planned to spend that day and night with them to enjoy what his mother called the two long delayed pleasures of social intercourse with our dearest friends. She'd enjoy it at any rate, and Lord knew she deserved a respite. Catherine Vandergelt wasn't looking her usual self either. War was hell, all right, not only for the men who fought, but for the women who stayed at home waiting for news. Ramses knew his father had every intention of working that afternoon, no matter what anyone else did. His description of what they had found that morning made the discovery sound a good deal more interesting than it actually was, and Cyrus declared his intention of joining them. I doubt we'll find an untouched burial, Ramses warned him. Those pottery sherds look like bits of the funerary equipment. There may be something interesting left, Cyrus said, hopefully. Catherine? I suppose I may as well come too, said his wife resignedly. No, Amelia, I know you're aching to see what's down there, and if I stay here, you will feel obliged to stay with me. What about you, Anna? I'm going to the hospital. She looked challengingly at Nefret. You needn't overdo it, Anna. I rang Sophia earlier. Things are quiet just now, and she promised to let me know if anything arose that required my presence. Or yours. You aren't going in today? No, I have other plans. You can spare me for a few hours, can't you, Professor? Well, Emerson stopped himself and looked at his wife, who said, Will you be back for dinner? Yes, I think so. Enjoy yourself, Anna said. I shall go to the hospital. There's always something to be done. The fret shrugged, excused herself, and left the room. She and Anna must have quarrelled. Their stiff smiles and sharp voices were the female equivalents of an exchange that would have ended in a brawl if they'd been men. Be back in time for tea, Catherine ordered. I will stay as long as I'm needed, Anna snapped. Without excusing herself, she left the table and the room. Now what is wrong with her? Catherine demanded. She's been in a much better frame of mind lately. One must expect occasional relapses when dealing with the young, said Ramsay's mother. It took only half an hour to reach the burial chamber. Ramsay's was glad of the distraction the work provided. He knew the chance of finding an undisturbed burial was slight, but it always gave him a queer feeling to penetrate a chamber that hadn't been entered for thousands of years. This one opened off the south side of the shaft and was almost filled by a large stone coffin. It hadn't given its owner the protection he wanted. His bones lay scattered on the floor beside the coffin, whose lid had been shifted just far enough to enable the thieves to drag the body out. They had overlooked only a single piece of jewellery, a small scarab which one of them must have dropped. They made a clean sweep, curse them, said Emerson, after he'd climbed up out of the shaft. He and Ramses and Selim had been the only ones to go down. Cyrus would have disregarded his wife's objections if there'd been anything to see, but he wasn't inclined to risk the crude wooden ladders for a few dried bones. Do you want photographs? Ramses asked. It can wait until tomorrow, his mother said firmly. No thief is going to bother with those scraps. We've done enough for today. More than enough. The look she gave Ramses was pointed and somewhat reproachful. If she had had her way, he would have been in Cairo at this moment, making the arrangements he had promised to make. As he had tried to tell her, it wasn't that simple. He had rung Russell before luncheon, only to learn that Russell was out of the office and wasn't expected back until late afternoon. There was a prearranged signal. Inform him that Tufik Bay has a camel for him. He had left that message, and if Russell received it, he would be at the turf club that night. The others went back to the house. 
Ramsay stayed on for a bit to help Selim clean up the site and cover the shaft. When he entered the courtyard, Fatima darted out of the sitting room and intercepted him. There is someone here to see you, she whispered. Wondering why she was behaving like a stage conspirator, he glanced round. Where? In your room. My room? He echoed in surprise. Fatima twisted her hands together. She asked me not to tell anyone else. She said you had invited her. Did I do wrong? No, it's all right, he smiled reassuringly. Thank you, Fatima. He took the stairs two at a time, anxious to solve this little mystery. He couldn't imagine who the woman might be. Anna, one of the village women seeking help from an abusive husband or father. It was well known that the Emersons wouldn't tolerate that sort of thing, and some of the younger women were too much in awe of his mother and father to approach them. Obviously, they weren't in awe of him. The smile on his lips faded when he saw the small figure seated on his bed. Reflexively, his arm shot out and slammed the door. What the... What are you doing here? The child's face was limpid with innocence. Streaks had ploughed a path through the dust on her cheeks. They might have been caused by perspiration or by tears. She'd got herself up in proper visiting attire, but now her pink, low-necked frock was wrinkled and her hair was loose on her shoulders. With the cool confidence of an invited guest, she had made herself at home. Her hat and handbag and a pair of extremely grubby white gloves lay on the bed beside her. I wanted to play with the cat, she explained, but it scratched me and ran away. A low grumble of confirmation came from Seshat, perched atop the wardrobe, beyond the reach of small hands. Don't be childish, Melinda, Ramsay said sternly. Come downstairs with me at once. Before he could open the door, she had flung herself at him and was hanging on like a frightened kitten. No, you mustn't tell anyone I'm here. Not yet. Promise you'll help me. Promise you won't let him send me away. He put his hands over hers, trying to detach them, but they were clenched tight as claws, and he didn't want to hurt her. He lowered his arms to his side and stood quite still. Your uncle? Yes. He wants to send me back to England. I won't go. I want to stay here. If he's decided you must go, there's nothing I can do to prevent it. Even if I would. Melinda, do you realise what an ugly position you've put me in? If your uncle found out you were here with me, alone in my room... If anyone saw us like this, they would blame me, not you. Is that what you want? No. Then let go. Slowly, the hard little fingers relaxed. She was watching him closely, and for a moment there was a look of cold adult calculation in her eyes. It passed so quickly, drowned in twin pools of tears, he thought he must have imagined it. He hurt me, she said. With a sudden movement... She tugged the dress off one shoulder and down her arm, almost to the elbow. Her bones were those of a child, fragile and delicate, but the rounded shoulder and the small, half-bared breasts were not. There were red spots on her arm, like the marks of fingers. Don't send me away, she whispered. He beats me. He's cruel to me. I want to be with you. I love you. Oh, Christ, Ramsay said under his breath. He couldn't retreat any farther. His back was against the door, and he felt like a bloody fool. Then he heard footsteps. The cavalry had arrived. And in the nick of time, too. Pull your dress up, he snapped. She didn't move. Ramses grasped the handle and opened the door. Mother, will you come here, please? The girl wasn't crying now. He had never seen so young a face look so implacable. Hell hath no fury. He turned with unconcealed relief to his mother, who stood staring in the doorway. We have a runaway on our hands, he said. So I see. She crossed the room, heels thudding emphatically, and yanked the girl's dress into place. 
What are you running away from, Melinda? My uncle. He beat me. You saw the bruises? He took you by the shoulders and shook you, I expect. I can't say I blame him. Come with me. She shrank back. What are you going to do with me? Give you a cup of tea and send you home. I don't want tea. I want... I know what you want. She directed a quizzical look at Ramses, who felt his cheeks burning. You cannot have it. Go downstairs to the sitting room. Now. Ramses had seen that voice galvanize an entire crew of Egyptian workers. It had a similar effect on the child. She snatched up her hat, gloves, and bag, and Ramses stepped hastily out of the way as she ran past him and out the door. His mother looked him over from head to foot and back. She shook her head and pursed her lips. No, there is nothing that can be done about it, she said cryptically. You'd better stay here. I can deal with her more effectively if you are not present. After he'd bathed and put on clean clothes, Ramses skulked in his room for an additional quarter of an hour before he summoned courage enough to go downstairs. Weeping women unnerved him, and this one wasn't even a woman. She was only a little girl, but remarkably mature for her age. She had a small, nasty voice in the back of his mind. He buried it under a pile of guilt. What else could he have done, though? I must be cruel only to be kind. What a smug, self-righteous thing to say to someone whose heart you had cleft in twain. Hamlet had always struck him as something of a prig. That concludes this excerpt from Manuscript H. I did not have to deal with the young person after all. She had actually ventured to disobey me. When I came down into the courtyard, I saw that the front door stood open and that Ali and Catherine were looking out. Catherine turned as I approached. What was that all about? she demanded. What was what all about? The frantic flight of little Miss Hamilton. I was crossing the courtyard when she came pelting down the stairs. She almost knocked me over in her wild rush for the door. I didn't know she was here. Should we go after her? From where I stood, I could see along the road in both directions. There was no sign of a flying pink figure, only the usual pedestrian and vehicular traffic. I considered Catherine's question. The girl had got here by herself. So far as I was concerned, she could get herself away without my assistance. It was not the decision of a kind Christian woman, but at that moment I did not feel very kindly toward Miss Molly. I think not, I replied. She is out of sight now. We have no way of knowing whether she went to the train station or hired a conveyance. She ran out into the road and stopped a carriage, Sitakim, Ali volunteered. She had money. She showed it to the driver. That news relieved my conscience, which had been struggling to make itself heard over my justifiable annoyance. I promised myself that I would telephone her uncle later, on some pretext, to make sure she'd got home safely. Catherine was frowning slightly. As we returned to the courtyard, she said, Something must have happened to upset her. What was she doing here? The others had come down for tea. I heard voices in the sitting room and Cyrus's deep chuckle. I saw no need to discuss the affair with the men, so I stopped and gave Catherine an explanation, which was the truth, if not the whole truth. Her uncle is sending her home. She doesn't want to go. You know how unreasonable children can be. She had some nonsensical notion of staying with us. She's old enough to know better, Catherine said. But badly spoiled. There is no need to mention this to the others, Catherine. As you like, Amelia, dear. Ramses was slow in making an appearance. After a quick involuntary glance at me, to which I responded with a nod and a smile, he avoided my eyes. I trust I may not be accused of maternal prejudice when I say that I did not wonder at the child or at any of the other women who had made nuisances of themselves about him. He was a fine-looking young man, with his father's handsome features and the easy grace of an athlete. But there was something more, 
the indefinable glow cast upon a countenance by the beauty of a noble character, of kindness and modesty and courage. What are you smiling at, Muller? He had seen my fond look. It made him extremely nervous. He adjusted his tie and passed his hand over his hair, trying to flatten the clustering curls. A pleasant little private thought, my dear, I replied. And private it must remain. He would have been horribly embarrassed if I'd voiced my thoughts aloud. When we parted to dress for dinner, neither of the girls had returned. I was not uneasy about Anna, for I supposed her tardiness was designed solely to annoy her mother. But I had begun to be a bit concerned about Nefret. Fatima had seen her leaving the house dressed in riding kit, so I betook myself to the stables, where I met Ramsay's coming out. "'She isn't back yet.' he said. So I gather. Was she alone? Yes. Jamal offered to go with her, but she said she was meeting someone. She might have told Jamal that to prevent his accompanying her, I said. He has developed a boyish attachment to her. She might. We may as well go and change. She'll be along soon, I'm sure. We returned to the house together. After Ramsay's had gone upstairs, I stole away into the telephone room and rang through to the Savoy. When I asked for Major Hamilton, the servant informed me he was out. Miss Nordstrom was in, however, and in a few moments I was speaking with her. I am, if I may say so, something of an expert at extracting information while giving away very little. I didn't have to be especially clever this time, Poor Miss Nordstrom was in such a state of bustle and exasperation that a single statement set her off. I hear that you and your charge will be departing soon for England. She didn't even ask who had told me. She thanked me effusively for having the courtesy to bid her bon voyage, apologised for the suddenness of their departure, which left her no time to pay the proper farewell calls, lamented over the discomfort of a sea voyage in winter, and told me how glad she was to be returning to civilization. Not until the end of the conversation did she mention, as an additional grievance, that Molly had got away from her that afternoon and hadn't returned until tea time. You can imagine my state of nerves, Mrs. Emerson. I was about to send for the police when she came back, as cool and unconcerned as if she hadn't frightened me half to death. She flatly refused to tell me where she'd been. Thank goodness, I thought. I could have invented a story to explain why Molly had come to us. Or rather, I could have told that part of the truth that did not involve Ramsay's. But now I didn't have to. So... Miss Nordstrom continued. It is just as well we're sailing tomorrow. She's a very willful young person, and I cannot control her properly here. I shudder to think of what could happen to her in this wicked city. Not so wicked a city as London. I kept this thought to myself, since I did not wish to prolong the conversation. My conscience being at ease about the child, I was able to concentrate on my uneasiness about Nefret. It was not unheard of for her to go riding, alone or with a friend, but the fact that she had not mentioned a name roused the direst of suspicions. Instead of going to my room, I lingered in the hall, rearranging a vase of flowers, straightening a picture, and listening. I hadn't realised how worried I was until I heard a prolonged howl from the infernal dog. Relief actually weakened my frame. Nefret was the only one... He greeted in that manner. The door opened, and she slipped in. Seeing me, she stopped short. I thought you'd be changing, she said. It sounded like an accusation. I could only stare in consternation. Her loosened hair hung down below her shoulders, and her hands were gloveless. There was something odd about the fit of her tailored coat. It had been buttoned askew. I seized her by the shoulders and drew her into the light. "'Have you been crying?' I demanded. "'What happened?' "'Nothing. "'Aunt Amelia, please don't ask questions. "'Just let me—' "'She broke off with a gasp, "'and I turned to see what she was staring at. "'So, you're back,' Ramsay said. "'Is something wrong?' "'He hadn't changed, or even brushed his hair, "'which looked as if he'd been tugging at it. 
As his eyes moved over Nefret's dishevelled form and dust-smeared face, a wave of burning red rose from her throat to her hairline. I'm late. I'm sorry. I'll hurry. Face averted, she ran for the stairs. Though I despise social conventions in general, I would be the first to admit that there are sensible reasons behind certain of them. For example, the avoidance of controversial subjects and heated argument at the dinner table promotes digestion. Despite my best efforts, I was unable to keep the conversation that night on a light, pleasant note. Anna had been so late in arriving that there wasn't time for her to change before Fatima called us to dinner. I felt certain the girl had done it deliberately to annoy Catherine and perhaps make the rest of us feel like slackers. The dress she wore for her hospital duties was as severe as a proper nurse's uniform. I caught Catherine's eye before she could speak and shook my head. We must go in, I said, or Mahmoud will burn the soup. Disappointed in her hope of starting a row, Anna continued to be as provoking as possible. Many of the bobs she slipped into the conversation were aimed at Nefret. In fact, I knew what had set her off. I had by pure accident overheard part of a dialogue between the two girls after luncheon. The first complete sentence was Nefret's. It's the uniform. Don't you see that? You want to be in love with a soldier, any soldier. I don't care how many of them you pursue, but stay away from him. He... You're only saying that because you're jealous. I saw you come in from the garden with him. You lured him out there. You want him yourself. Lured? Nefret gave a strange little laugh. Perhaps I did. You're mistaken about the rest of it, however. Listen to me, Anna. No, leave me alone. She went running off. It hadn't required much effort to guess whom they were discussing... I had meant to warn Anna about Percy myself, but if she would not heed Nefret, there was little chance she would listen to me, and I did not believe there was any danger of a serious attachment, at least not on Percy's part. Like the generous-hearted man he was, Cyrus had made testamentary provisions for his stepchildren, but Anna was not by any definition a wealthy heiress. It may have been Anna's sullen mood that infected the rest of us, there was certainly something in the air that night. It would be superstitious to speak of premonitions and forebodings, so I will not. Heaven knows there were sufficient reasons for concern in the events of those times. It was Cyrus who first mentioned the war. I was only surprised we'd managed to keep off it so long. Heard anything more about an attack on the canal? His question was directed at Emerson, who shook his head and replied somewhat evasively, one hears a great deal. Rumours, most of them. Nefret looked up. People are leaving Cairo. They say the steamers are completely booked. The same they who spread such rumours, Emerson grunted. One never knows who they are. But there will be an attack, Anna said suddenly. Won't there? Don't get your hopes up, Nefret said. The wounded would be sent to the military hospitals. Anyhow, most of the troops guarding the canal are Indian, Punjabis and Gurkhas. Not romantic in your terms. The venom in her voice was like a slap in the face, and Anna's cheeks reddened as if from an actual blow. The 42nd Lancashire is there, Cyrus said, obliviously. And some Australian and New Zealand troops. And the Egyptian artillery, Ramses added. They're well trained and the Indian regulars are first-rate fighting men. He was trying to reassure Catherine and me. From my conversations with Emerson, I knew the situation was not so comfortable as Ramsay's implied. The British Army of Occupation had been sent to France, and their replacements were raw and untrained. The safety of the canal hung on the loyalty of the so-called native troops, most of whom are Muslim. Would they be swayed by the Sultan's call for a jihad? They certainly are splendid-looking fellows, Nefret said. I've seen some of them in Cairo on leave. On the street, that is. They're not allowed in the hotels or the clubs, are they? I don't suppose any of the patriotic ladies of Cairo 
have gone to the trouble of providing them with a decent place to relax from their duties? I don't suppose so either, I said. There are not enough decent recreational facilities for any of the enlisted men. No wonder the poor lads resort to grog shops and cafes and other even less reputable places of amusement. I will take steps to correct that. I beg your pardon, Ramses, did you speak? No, mother. He looked down at his plate, but not so quickly that I failed to see the glint of amusement in his black eyes. What he had said under his breath was, tea and cucumber sandwiches. So it went, through three additional courses. Cyrus's questioning of Emerson was a transparent request for reassurance. I did not doubt he had seriously considered sending Catherine home, or trying to. Anna and Nefret continued to snipe at one another, and Ramses contributed nothing useful to the conversation. After dinner, we retired to the parlour, where Catherine sank into a chair. If anyone else mentions the war, I will scream, she declared. Nefret, will you please play for us? Music is said to soothe a savage breast, and mine is quite savage just now. Nefret looked a trifle sheepish. She'd certainly done her bit to contribute to the unpleasantness. Of course. What would you like to hear? Something cheerful and comic, Cyrus suggested. There are some pretty funny songs in that stack I brought with me. Something soft and soothing and sweet, Catherine corrected. Something we could all sing, said Emerson, hopefully. Nefret, already seated at the piano, laughed and looked at Ramses. Have you any requests? So long as it isn't one of those sentimental, saccharine ballads you favour, or a stirring march. Her smile faded. No marches. Not tonight. She played the old songs that were Emerson's favourites. At her request, Ramses stood by to turn the pages for her, and if he found the songs too sentimental for his taste, he did not say so. I managed to prevent Emerson from singing by asking Nefret to do so. Her voice was untrained, but very sweet and true, and Emerson loved to hear it. Catherine put her head back and closed her eyes. That was charming, my dear, she said softly. Go on, if you're not too tired. Nefret sorted through the sheet music. Here's one of Cyrus's new songs. Ramsey, sing it with me. He'd been watching her, but he must have been thinking of something else, for he started when she addressed him. I knew he was as keenly aware of the time as I was. Within an hour, he must leave to meet Thomas Russell. With a smile and a shrug, he held out his hand. Let me see the music. If you're going to be that particular, I only want to look through it first. He'd learned to read music, though he didn't play, once I had wondered why he bothered. After a quick perusal, he curled his lip. It's worse than saccharine. It's precisely the sort of romantic propaganda I was talking about the other day. Please, Ramses, Catherine murmured. This is so pleasant, and I haven't heard you and the Fred sing together for a long time. Ramses' cynical smile faded. All right, Mrs. Vandergelt, if it will please you. It was the first time I had heard the song, which was to become very popular. It did not mention the war, but the wistful reference to the long, long night of waiting before the lovers could again walk together into the land of their dreams made its message particularly poignant in those days. Music may be a tool of the warmongers, but it can also bring solace to aching hearts. They went through it twice, and the second chorus was nearing its final notes when Ramsay's smooth voice cracked. Damn it, Nefret, what did you do that for? She was shaking with laughter. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to kick you so hard. I just didn't want you to spoil it by breaking into falsetto. A scream of pain is preferable. He rubbed his shin. I said I was sorry. Pax? She held out her hand. His lips quivered, and then he was laughing too, his hands enclosing hers. The door opened. Fatima was there. She had neglected to veil her face, and in her hand 
she held a flimsy bit of folded paper. It is from Mr. Walter, she said, holding out the paper as if it were burning her fingers. How did she know? How did any of us know? Oh, there was a certain logic behind the instinctive expectation of bad news that brought us all to our feet. Telegrams and cables were used primarily for news of great joy or great sorrow. And after only a few months of war, English households had learned to dread the delivery of one of those flimsy bits of paper. But it was more than that, I think. After a moment, Catherine sank back into her chair with a look of unconcealed relief. And shame at that relief. News of her son would not come to her through Walter. Bertie was safe. But some other woman's child was not. It was my dear Emerson who went to Fatima and took the telegram from her. The lines in his face deepened as he read it. Which of them? I asked evenly. Young John. Emerson looked again at the paper. A sniper. Killed instantly and without pain. Nefret turned to Ramses and hid her face against his shoulder. He put his arm around her in a gentle but almost perfunctory embrace. His face was as cold and remote as that of Caffrey's alabaster statue. Evelyn's bearing up well, Emerson said. He kept looking at the telegram, as if he could not remember what it said. She would, of course, said Ramses. That's part of our code, is it not? Part of the game we play, like the marches and the songs and the epigrams. Killed instantly and without pain. Dulce et decorum est pro patria more. He let the sheet of music fall to the floor. With the same detached gentleness, he took Nefret's hands and guided her to a chair. He left the room without speaking again. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. He saddled Risha himself, waving aside the sleepy stableman's offer of assistance. The great stallion was as sensitive as a human being to his master's moods. As soon as they had left the stable yard, Ramses let him out, and he ran like the wind, avoiding the occasional obstacle of donkey or camel without slackening speed. There was more traffic on the bridge and in the city streets, but by that time Ramses had himself under better control. He slowed Risha to a walk. It was half past eleven when he reached the club. Too early for the rendezvous, but Russell would probably be there. Leaving Risha with one of the admiring doormen, he ran up the stairs and went in. Russell was in the hall. He was alone, reading or pretending to read a newspaper. He was watching the clock, though, and when he saw Ramses, he dropped the newspaper and started to rise. Ramses waved him back into his chair and took another next to him. What are you doing here? Russell demanded in a hoarse whisper. I got the message. Has something gone wrong? Nothing that affects our business. There's been a slight change in plans, though. You can empty the arsenal whenever you like, but it must be done in absolute secrecy, and you mustn't make any arrests. There's another cache hidden in the ruined mosque near Burkhardt's tomb. Russell's eyes narrowed at the peremptory tone. He was accustomed to giving orders, not taking them. Why? Do you want the man who's behind this? You mean, do you know who it is? Yes. He laid it out with the cold precision of a formula, point by point, ignoring the scepticism that formed a stony mask over Russell's face. Only a slight crack appeared in the mask, but Russell said nothing until he was finished. When he was in Alexandria, we missed two deliveries. He was at the wrong place. Then you believe me. You can convince General Maxwell. Slowly, Russell shook his head. It might have been pure incompetence. I thought it was. That's why I relieved him and sent him back to Cairo. He's one of Maxwell's fair-haired boys, and Maxwell would resent my interference. Ramses knew he was right. Inter-service jealousy was a damned nuisance and a fact of life. Military intelligence hasn't been able to get a line on him, he argued. At least give me a chance to find the proof. How? 
Whether you're right or wrong, the fella hasn't made a false move. There's someone running the show here. Even Maxwell admits that. But he'll never believe it's one of his pets. We've rounded up a few of the underlings, like that Fortescue woman, but none of them have ever spoken personally with him. He must communicate directly with his paymasters, though. Probably by wireless. Obviously, he can't keep the equipment in his quarters. That means he's got a private hideaway. I think I know where. He takes women there sometimes. Russell's lips tightened. Where did you get that? Your pederast friend? My friend is more familiar with his habits than Maxwell or you. Your fine, upstanding young officer is well known in El Wassa. Maxwell probably wouldn't believe that either. Allow me to return to the point, please. There's no use raiding the place. He wouldn't keep anything there that would incriminate him. I'll have to catch him in the act. No, don't interrupt me. The uprising is set for tomorrow or the next day. He's too fond of his precious skin to stay in Cairo during a riot, so he'll head for a safe place, possibly the hideaway I mentioned. I'll follow him. He cut off Russell's attempt to speak with a peremptory gesture. That is why you mustn't do anything to put him on his guard. You can't arrest Wardani's lot without his finding out about it. And then he'll do something. God knows what. I can never predict what the bastard is likely to do. He might decide to sit tight and make no move at all. He might bolt. Or he might take steps to protect himself by removing potential witnesses. You really hate his guts, don't you? Russell said softly. My feelings don't come into it. I'm asking a single favour from you, and I believe I have the right. Russell nodded grudgingly. You don't have to do this, you know. You've done your job. Ramses went on as if he hadn't spoken. I'll look for a communication tomorrow morning. If it's there, I'll ring you and leave the message about the camel. If you don't hear from me tomorrow, you'll know it will be the next day. He rose to his feet. We've talked long enough. Would you care to call me a few names or slap my face? People have been watching us. A reluctant, hastily hidden grin curved Russell's lips. I doubt anyone would believe from our expressions that this was a friendly conversation. Where is this hideaway? Ramses hesitated. I won't move until I hear from you, Russell said, or until I haven't heard from you. In the latter case, I ought to know where to look. For the body, you've got a point. He described the place and its location. Russell nodded. Do me one favour. No, make that two. What? Don't play hero. If he's our man, we'll get him sooner or later. And the other favour? Russell wet his lips. Don't tell your mother. Ramses backed away, trying to appear angry and insulted. God forgive him. He'd almost burst out laughing at the look of abject horror on Russell's face. After he'd mounted, he turned Risha not toward home, but toward the railroad station and the narrow lanes of Bulak. There was one more appointment he had to keep. He dreaded it even more than he had the other. The café was a favourite rendezvous for a variety of shady characters, including some of the less reputable antiquities dealers and the thieves from whom they obtained their illegal merchandise. It had been a good choice, even if Ramses was recognised, which was more than likely, considering his wide circle of acquaintances in the antiquities game, the assumption would be that he had come on business. David was there, as promised, wearing a tarbouche and a cheap, badly-fitting tweed suit and sitting alone at a table. He was unable to conceal a start of surprise when he saw Ramses, and when the latter joined him, he said at once, Ortan is here. He's seen you. It doesn't matter. You look very neat and respectable, he added, for a change. Tell me, David said quietly. There was no putting it off. David knew he wouldn't have risked coming there undisguised without a good reason. He got the news out in a single blunt sentence before David could imagine even worse. David sat without moving for a time, his eyes downcast. Johnny had been his foster brother before he became his brother-in-law. 
But it was of Leah he was thinking now. We'll get you on a boat next week, Ramsay said, unable to bear the stoic silence any longer. Somehow, I promise. David raised his head. His eyes were dry and his face frighteningly composed. Not until this is over and you're in the clear. It's over. I saw Russell before I came here and told him to go ahead. There'll be no uprising. What about the canal? That's not our affair. I'm through. So are you. So you're going to let Percy get away with it? Ramses had always prided himself on schooling his features so as to give nothing away. But David could read him like a book. He started to speak. David spoke first. I've been thinking about what you said last night and what you didn't say, because I didn't give you the chance. I can put the pieces together, too. The house in Mardi, Percy's extraordinary interest in your activities. He's afraid you're after him, isn't he? David, don't lie to me, Ramses. Not to me. When I think of him, smug and safe in Cairo, preening himself on his cleverness, while men like Johnny are dying, I feel sick. You aren't going to let him get away with it. If you don't tell me what you're planning to do, I'll kill the bastard myself. Do you suppose Leah would thank you for risking yourself to avenge Johnny? Killing Percy won't bring him back. But it would relieve my feelings considerably. David's smile made a chill run through Ramsay's. He'd never seen that gentle face so hard. I have a few ideas, Ramsay said reluctantly. Somehow I thought you would. The smile was just as chilling. It didn't take long to explain his plan, such as it was. As he listened, David's clenched hands loosened. There were tears in his eyes. He could grieve for Johnny now. Oddly enough, it wasn't Johnny's face that Ramses kept remembering. It was that of the young German. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. The following is an excerpt from Letter Collection B. Dearest Leah, at least a week will have passed before you receive this. What good is a letter? It's all I can do. If I were with you, I could put my arms round you and cry with you. There's no use saying the pain will lessen and become, in time, endurable. What comfort is that to someone who is suffering here and now? You were there to comfort me when I needed you, selfish, ungrateful, undeserving worm that I was. And now I can't be with you when you need me. Believe one thing, Leah. Hold on to it and don't lose heart. Someday, someday soon, there will be joyous news. I can't say any more in a letter. I shouldn't be saying this much. Just remember that there is nothing I would not do to bring us all together again. Thus ends this excerpt from Letter Collection B. Chapter 14 The Vandergelts left us immediately after breakfast next morning. They would have stayed had we asked them to, but I think Catherine understood we wanted to be alone with our grief. The worst of it was that we could do nothing for the loved ones who had suffered most. I had written, and Nefret had done the same. Emerson had cabled, and Ramses had taken the messages to the central post office in Cairo so that they would arrive as soon as was humanly possible. It was little enough. Ramses came back in time to bid the Vandergelts farewell. He had left the house before daybreak, and I knew that before posting the letters, he had looked for the message that would announce the final end of his mission. Meeting my anxious eyes, he shook his head. Not today, then. It would be for tomorrow. Knowing he'd eaten almost nothing before he left, I suggested we return to the breakfast room and give Fatima the pleasure of feeding us again. Her face brightened when I asked her for more toast and coffee. Yes, said Hakim, yes. You must keep up your strength. Will you go to Giza today? I told Selim you might not wish to. 
We could close down for the day, Emerson said heavily. It would be the proper thing to do. I doubt Johnny would care about the proper thing, said Ramses. But we might plan some sort of ceremony. Dowd and Selim would like it, and the others will want to show their affection and respect. Oh, yes, it, Fatima exclaimed. They will all want to come. Those who did not know him have heard of him, of his laughter and his kindness. It is a nice thought, I said, trying to conceal my emotion. But not today. Perhaps in a day or two we'll be able to bring stronger hearts to such a ceremony. I was thinking of David. It would be infinitely comforting to have him with us again. How that part of the business was to be managed, Ramses hadn't said. But if the authorities did not acknowledge his courage and sacrifice immediately, I would just have to have a few words with General Maxwell. We may as well go to Giza for a while, then, Emerson said. Keep ourselves occupied, eh? We will stop at midday. I have other plans for this afternoon. Ramsay's eyebrows shot up. Father, may I have a word with you? You certainly may, said his father with considerable emphasis. The fret, that frock is very becoming. But hadn't you better change if you're coming with us, that is? It was not a frock, but one of her ruffled negligees. I hadn't reproached her for coming down to breakfast en déshabillé, for she did not look at all well. Her eyes shadowed and her cheeks paler than usual. However, she was quick to express her intention of accompanying us and hurried off to change. With a wink and a nod, Emerson led us out into the garden. I am bloody damn tired of this sneaking and whispering, he grumbled. What is it now, Ramses? If you tell me the business has been put off, I may lose my temper. God forbid, Ramses said. No, sir, it hasn't been put off, but there's been a slight change in plan. Russell wants to wait another day or two before he rounds up the malcontents. If that is what you had in mind for this afternoon, you'll have to put it off. Emerson's heavy brows drew together. Why? Well, they're harmless enough, aren't they? They're waiting for word, which they won't get because I won't give it. And without weapons, there isn't much they can do. Emerson was obviously not convinced of the logic of this. He was itching to hit someone, nor, if possible, a great number of people. You weren't thinking of warning certain of them, were you? he demanded. You seem to have a soft spot for that fellow, Assad. I am thinking, said Ramses, whose narrowed eyes and flushed cheeks indicated that he was close to losing his temper, that you should leave this in my hands. To my astonishment, Emerson shuffled his feet and looked sheepish. Um, yes, as you say, my boy. There's no fret. Let's go. Once we were mounted and on our way, Ramses took the lead, with Nefret not far behind. It was a grey, misty morning, and the gloomy skies reflected my unhappy mood. Let them go on ahead, I said to Emerson. I want to talk to you. And I to you. Proceed, my dear. Ladies first. I was surprised to see you so meek with Ramses. Are you really going to take orders from him? Yes, I am. And so are you. He has earned the right to give them. I have a great deal of respect for the boy. Have you told him so? Have you told him you love him and are proud to be his father? Emerson looked shocked. Good God, Peabody! Men don't say that sort of thing to other men. He knows how I feel. What the devil brought this on? I was thinking of Johnny, I said with a sigh. When it is too late, one always wishes one had said more. "'expressed one's feelings more openly. "'Damn notion, Peabody, what a morbid thought. "'You will have ample opportunity to express any feelings you like to Ramses and David. "'The only thing left for them to do is to pass on the final message to Russell, "'so that he will know when to act. "'There was no message this morning, so it must be for tomorrow. "'Will the attack on the canal occur at the same time?' "'I don't know.' "'Emerson stroked his chin reflectively.' We cannot assume it will coincide with the hour of the uprising. They may want their little insurrection to get under way before they strike at the canal. If it's bloody enough, it will tie down the troops stationed in Cairo, 
and perhaps necessitate sending reinforcements from the canal defences. Oh, the devil with it, Peabody. There won't be an insurrection. And if those idiots on the staff don't know an attack is imminent, they haven't been paying attention. If you say so, my dear. <clears throat> Your turn now. What was it you wanted to tell me? He replied with a question. When is Lear's child due? March. Unless grief and worry induce premature birth. You'd like to be with her, wouldn't you? And with Evelyn? Of course. They say the steamers are fully booked, but I have some influence. We will sail early next week. Emerson, do you mean... Well, curse it, Peabody. I want to be with them, too. I want Ramses out of Egypt for a while. And I want to see the look on Leah's face when David walks in the door. You would actually close down the dig? Um, <laughs> I uh, thought I might return for a brief season at the end of March. Um, no need for you to come with me if you don't want to. Stop for a moment, Emerson. Embraces between two persons mounted on horseback are not as romantic as they sound. We managed it nicely, though. After Emerson had returned me to my saddle, I said, You mean David to go with us next week? Can it be done, Emerson? It will be done. Emerson's jaw was set. Since I am not to be allowed to arrest revolutionaries, I will call on Maxwell this afternoon and order... request him to start the legal proceedings. David will need official clearance and papers. But in the meantime, is there any reason why he cannot be here with us? Ramsay saw him last night and told him about Johnny. He will be in deep distress. We could keep him hidden and feed and comfort him. Fatima wouldn't breathe a word. You'd enjoy that, wouldn't you? Emerson grinned at me. Let me hear what Maxwell has to say. If he won't cooperate, we will do it your way and smuggle David out of the country in a packing case labelled pottery sherds. Or disguised as Selim with Selim's papers, I mused. A packing case would be very uncomfortable. Selim could then go into hiding until... Control your rampageous imagination, Peabody, Emerson said fondly. For the time being, at any rate. One way or another, it will be done. A ray of sunlight touched his resolute, smiling face. The sky was clearing. I hoped that could be regarded as another omen. Our efforts to distract ourselves with work failed miserably. Not even Emerson could concentrate, and Nefret and Ramses got into a violent argument about one of the photographs she'd taken of the false door. The lighting's all wrong, Ramses insisted. What were you thinking of? I need more shadow. The lower part of the left-hand inscription... Do it yourself, then. I will. No, you won't. Give me that camera. I was about to intervene when Nefret let loose her hold on the camera and passed a trembling hand over her eyes. I'm sorry, she muttered. I don't think I'm in a fit state to work today. It's quite understandable, my dear, I said soothingly. Perhaps this was not such a good idea after all. I'll tell Emerson we'd better stop. Fatima had prepared a large lunch, which no one ate much of. We were still at table when she brought in the post. She handed it to Emerson, who distributed the various messages. As usual, the bulk of them were for Nefret. She sorted rapidly through them and then excused herself. Her desire for privacy was suspicious. I followed her. So had Fatima. As I approached, I heard her say, Do you know now, Nur Misur, whether you will be here for dinner? Yes, Nefret said abstractedly. Yes, it appears that I will be here after all. She had opened one of the envelopes and was holding a sheet of paper. She started guiltily when she saw me. Did you have an appointment for this evening? I inquired. You didn't mention it to me. Nefret stuffed the paper into the pocket of her skirt. I'd almost forgot. It was of long standing. I rang earlier to cancel it. This was not up to Nefret's usual standard of prevarication. The cancellation hadn't come from her, or by the telephone, but from her correspondent. Percy? He was the only one she was likely to lie about. At least, I wouldn't have to worry about her being out that evening. 
Ramses and Emerson were still at table when I returned. What was that all about? the latter inquired. You went pelting out of here like a hound on the scent. Nefret had expressed her intention of going to her room for a little rest, so I could speak freely. I told them of my suspicions. You are always making mysteries, Emerson grumbled. Haven't we enough on our minds? Ramsay's inexpressive countenance had gone even blanker. Excuse me, he said, and pushed his chair back. Where are you going? I demanded. I've finished. Is it necessary for me to wait for your permission before leaving the table? I'll be in my room if you want me for anything. His brusque tone did not distress me. I gave him a forgiving smile. Have a nice rest. I had meant to have one myself, but I couldn't settle down. A troubled mind is not conducive to slumber. When I wasn't thinking of Johnny and his bereaved parents, I was worrying about Leah and the effect of shock on her unborn child, and about David grieving alone in some squalid hut, and about the Turks advancing and Ramses doing something I wouldn't like. I didn't trust him. I never had. After a while, I gave it up and went out to work in the garden. Gardening can minister to a mind diseased, as Shakespeare puts it, referring in his case to something else. But when I got a good look at what the camel had done to my flowers, I lost the remains of my temper. But the cursed beast had not mashed, he had eaten, including several rose bushes. To a camel, thorns are a piquant seasoning. I went in search of the gardener, woke him up, and brought him and several gardening implements with me back to the violated plot. It would all have to be dug up and replanted. Feeling the need for further relief, I took up a rake and sailed in myself. I was still at it when Nefret came hurrying out. She was wearing street clothes, a hat, and gloves. There you are, she exclaimed. Good heavens, why are you digging up the garden? I plunged my pitchfork into the earth and wiped the perspiration from my brow. I became bored with nasturtiums. Where are you going? I was under the impression you meant to be here for dinner. Sophia rang. They just brought in a woman who may require surgery. I must go at once. I don't know when I'll be back. Good luck to her and to you, my dear. Thank you. You'll be here this evening, all of you? Why, yes, I believe so. She looked as if she would have said more, but nodded and hurried off. I watched her until she was out of sight. Then I left Jamal to his digging and went into the house. When I got through to Sophia, she was obviously bewildered that I'd taken the trouble to tell her Nefret was on her way. She thanked me very nicely, though. At least I knew Nefret hadn't lied to me this time. Where the devil had she been? And more important, with whom had she been the previous afternoon? Whatever she was doing, for whatever reason, I must put a stop to it. My only excuse for having avoided a confrontation was my preoccupation with the other matter. And that was over now. Tonight, I thought, as soon as she comes home. After my brisk exercise in the garden, a nice soak in the tub was now not a luxury, but a necessity. I hadn't seen Emerson all afternoon. He'd gone to his study to work or to worry in private. I decided to surprise him by assuming one of the pretty tea gowns Nefret had given me for Christmas. He had expressed his particular approval of a thin yellow silk garment that fastened conveniently down the front. Convenient to put on, that is. Sunny yellow is always cheerful. I have never believed in wearing black for mourning. It is a poor testimonial to a faith that promises immortality for the worthy. When Emerson joined me in the parlour, the brightening of his countenance assured me my selection of attire had been wise. I was about to pour when Ramses came in. I won't be here for dinner. I told Fatima. His face was so guileless, I was immediately filled with the direst of forebodings. He was wearing riding breeches and boots, tweed coat and khaki shirt, without a collar or waistcoat an ensemble that might have been designed for camouflage. I said, you aren't dressed for dinner. My engagement is with one of the Indian NCOs. They aren't allowed in the hotels, you know. We're meeting at a cafe in Bulak. 
What for? I asked suspiciously. A language lesson and perhaps a friendly wrestling match. That is what comes of showing off. He'll probably break both my legs. They're allowing men like him to go on leave with the Turks about to attack the canal? Emerson demanded. Folly, absolute folly. Maxwell still doesn't believe an attack is imminent, or that the Turks stand a prayer of getting across. I hope he's right. Don't wait up for me. I may be late. He started for the door. Are you going to see David tonight? He stopped. Are you suggesting I ought? I recognized his irritating, oblique manner of avoiding a lie, and my temper slipped a little. I am suggesting that if you do, you bring him home with you. The need for caution is past. If you deem it necessary, we can keep him in seclusion for a day or two. It shouldn't be necessary. He turned round to face me. You're right. It's time David came home. Good night. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. He got to the place at dusk, while it was still light enough to see where he was going, yet dark enough to hide his movements. David had objected to his going alone, but he wanted to make a preliminary reconnaissance. Percy won't turn up before dark, if he comes at all, he had pointed out. The show isn't supposed to start until midnight. Everything is set. Russell will raid the warehouse and the mosque at nine. And once he's got the weapon safely tucked away, he'll return to his office and wait to hear from me. Do you think I can't handle Percy by myself? Anyhow, I need you to be my lookout. Don't get the wind up now, David. By tomorrow morning it'll be over, and we'll be home, and Fatima will be cooking breakfast for you. And he would be explaining to his irate parents why he hadn't told them the truth. He wasn't looking forward to it. But if they had known tonight was the night, they wouldn't have let him out of the house, or else they'd have insisted on accompanying him, which would have been even worse. In the twilight, the old palace looked so forbidding, it was no wonder the locals avoided it. It had been built in the late 18th century by one of the Mameluke Bays, whose reputation for cruelty was even greater than those of his peers. It was said that the spirits of his victims roamed the ruins in company with jinn and afrits, moaning and gibbering. There were certainly a great many owls nesting in the broken walls, avoiding the derelict fountain and fallen columns of the courtyard, Pushing through a rampant jungle of weeds and weedy shrubs, he reached a small building that was still in good repair. Ramses had brought a pocket torch and masked it so that only a narrow slit of light would show. Using it sparingly, he inspected all four sides of the building, which had perhaps been a pleasure kiosk. The arched windows were now closed with crude but heavy wooden shutters, and the door also appeared to be a new addition, there was another entrance at the bottom of a short flight of stairs that must lead to rooms underground. Both doors were equipped with new Yale locks. Picking the lock would take time and might leave traces. It would have to be one of the shutters. They were locked too, or bolted from the inside. The lever he had brought took care of that. Once inside, he had to use the torch, and as the narrow beam moved round the room, his lips pursed in a silent whistle. The room looked like a cross between a bordello and a boudoir, all silk hangings and soft rugs. The bed that occupied most of the space was a bird's nest of tangled linen and scattered cushions. His search of the room was quick and cursory. Even Percy wouldn't be lunatic enough to keep incriminating documents in the room where he entertained his female visitors. The only item of interest he came across was a length of narrow silken ribbon, the kind that might have been threaded through the insertion on a woman's garment. He stood for a moment holding it before he tossed it aside and left the room. A door across the narrow hallway opened onto a more promising chamber. Percy certainly liked his comforts, Oriental rugs covered the floor and hung from the walls, and the furnishings included several comfortable chairs, as well as a well-stocked liquor cabinet 
several oil lamps, and a large brass vessel that had served as a brazier. For burning documents? If so, they'd been completely consumed. Nothing in the room betrayed the identity of the man who sometimes occupied it. Acutely aware of the passage of time, Ramses searched the rest of the little building. A door at the end of the hall between bedroom and study opened onto a flight of stairs going down. The cellar was more extensive than the upper floor. There was nothing there now except rats and mouldy straw and a few scraps of wood but he suspected it at once contained the weapons sent on to Wardane. And elsewhere? One section had been subdivided into a series of small cell-like rooms. All were empty, except one. The sturdy wooden door creaked when he pushed it open. The narrow beam of light showed a floor of beaten earth and walls of mortared stone. The room was about ten feet by fifteen, and it contained two pieces of furniture, a chair and a rough wooden table. A large earthenware jug stood on the table. Dead flies floated on the surface of the stagnant water. There was only one other object in the room, aside from several heavy hooks on the wall opposite the door. Coiled and sleek as a snake, it hung on one of the hooks. It had been wiped clean and oiled, but when he looked more closely... He saw the dark stains that had soaked into the beaten earth and dried, and he knew with a sick certainty that this was where Farouk had died. One of the heavy hooks was about the right height from the floor. He went back up the stairs, thankful that David wasn't with him. He was sweating and shaking like a timid old woman. Anger at himself and at the man who had used the kurbash stiffened him and he went back to the makeshift office. Damn it, there had to be something somewhere. Before he began a more intensive search, he unbolted the shutters and opened one of them a few inches. It was always a good idea to have another exit handy, and with the window open, he would more easily hear an approaching horseman. There was no certainty that Percy would come tonight, but if that letter of Nefret's had been from Percy... He had cancelled an engagement that would have kept him in Cairo that evening. Not proof of anything, but suggestive. David was waiting at the crossroads near Mit Ukbe. Percy would have to pass him whether he came north on the Giza Road or crossed the river at Bulak. And once Percy had got that far, his destination was certain. Mounted on Asfur, whom Ramses had delivered to David before coming on, David could easily outstrip Percy and arrive in time to give the signal that would warn Ramses his cousin was on the way. The hiding place wasn't difficult to find after all. Behind one of the hangings was a largish niche, the plaster of its painted walls flaking. The wireless was there, and on a shelf under it, a portfolio containing a mass of papers. Ramses picked one at random, and examined it by the light of his torch. At first, he couldn't believe what he saw. It was a sketch map of the area around the canal, from Ismailia to the Bitter Lakes. The drawing was crude, but all the landmarks were noted, the roads and the rail lines and even the larger jebels. In mounting incredulity, he sorted through the other papers. Only Percy would be fool enough to keep such documents... Copies of the messages he had sent and received, in clear and in code, memoranda, even a list of names, with notations next to each. None of the names was familiar to Ramses, but he wouldn't have been surprised to learn that certain of the code names referred to individuals he knew or had known. Three of them were crossed out. What the hell had prompted Percy to keep such incriminating evidence? Couldn't he even remember the names of his own agents? Maybe he was planning to write his memoirs some day, when he was old and senile. To do him justice, there wasn't anything in the papers that incriminated him. The handwriting was rather clumsily disguised, but it would take more than the conflicting evidence of handwriting experts to convince a military court. He was about to close the portfolio 
when belated realization struck him. He extracted one of the papers and read it again. The notes were mere jottings, most of them numbers, without explanation or elaboration. But if that number was a date, and that a time, and the letters indicated the places he thought they stood for, the sound from beyond the hanging made his heart stop. It was the creak of a hinge. The door of the room had opened. His fingers found the switch of the torch, and blackness engulfed him. There was just time enough for him to damn himself for carelessness and overconfidence before he heard someone speak, and then he realised it wasn't Percy. The voice was deeper and slower, and it had spoken in Turkish. No one here. He's late. The response was in the same language, but Ramses could tell from the accent that it wasn't the speaker's native tongue. I do not like this place. He could have met us in Cairo. Our heroic leader does not take such risks. The other man spat. He is not my leader. We have the same master as you and I, and he. He passes the orders on. There will be orders for us tonight. Sit. As they spoke, Ramses had closed the portfolio and replaced it and slipped the torch into his pocket. When silence fell, he stood absolutely still, hoping his breathing wasn't as loud as it sounded to him. He hadn't missed David's signal after all. This was a meeting, or perhaps a celebration. So far as the conspirators knew, their job was done. He thought he knew who one of them was. The Turk had been playing a part too. He was no illiterate hired driver. His Turkish was that of the court. Who was the other man? Ought he to risk lifting the rug a fraction of an inch? The strengthening glow of light round the sides of the hanging told him he ought not. There were only two things he could do. Stay in concealment and pray no one would need to use the radio or consult the papers or make a run for it and pray the element of surprise would give him a chance of getting away. He wasn't carrying a gun. He doubted he would ever use one again. It wouldn't have done him much good anyhow. He'd got a lot more than he'd bargained for that evening, and the odds against him were increasing. Remaining in hiding was probably the better of the two alternatives, at least for the time being. He adjusted the belt that held his knife so that it was more accessible, and then the door opened again. For a moment, no one spoke. Then the newcomer said, in English, Not here yet, eh? Now, now, my friend, don't point that rifle at me. I am not the one you await, but I am one of you. What proof have you? Do you carry papers identifying you as a Turkish agent? The fact that I know of this place should be proof enough. That's the trouble with this profession, he added in tones of mild vexation. Not enough trust among allies. You two don't indulge in alcohol, I suppose. Hope you don't mind if I do. Footsteps, slow and deliberate, crossed the room and were followed by the click of glass against glass. Ramsay stood motionless. Three of them now. And one, the latest to come, was someone else he knew. The Scots accent had been discarded, but the voice was the same. His father had been on the right track after all. Hamilton might not be Sethos, but he was in the pay of the enemy. The exchange had given Ramses another useful piece of information. It would not be a good idea to make a break for it while the Turk had a rifle in his hands. Hamilton hadn't bothered to close the door. Ramses heard the thump of booted feet. They came to a sudden halt, and Hamilton said coolly, Finally, what kept you? What the devil are you doing here? Percy demanded. Delivering your new orders from Berlin, was the smooth reply. You don't suppose the high command let you in on all their little secrets, do you? But I thought I was... The top man in Cairo? How naive. You've done well so far. Von Überwald is pleased with you. The name meant nothing to Ramses. But Percy obviously recognised it. You... you report to him? 
directly to him. Will you join me in a brandy? Enough of this, the Turk said suddenly. Let us complete our business. There's no hurry, Percy said expansively. In a few hours, the streets of Cairo will be running with blood. Lord, it's close in here. One of you open the shutters. Ramses knew he was only moments away from discovery. The opened shutter would tell them there'd been an intruder, and the niche was the first place they would look. He was already moving when the Turk exclaimed, They have been opened. Who? There's someone out there. He'd meant to head straight for the door, but that exclamation changed his mind. Trapped behind the heavy hanging, Ramses could not have heard David's imitation of an owl's screech. But David must have got there before Percy. He might even have been on the spot in time to see the other three arrive. He would assume Ramses was still inside, possibly a prisoner, and he wouldn't wait long before investigating. Not David. The Turk was at the window, the rifle at his shoulder, his finger on the trigger. There wasn't time to do anything except throw himself, not at the Turk, but at the rifle. His hands were on it when it went off. The explosion almost deafened him, and the recoil loosened his clumsy grip. He stumbled forward into a hard object that caught him square across the forehead. When he came to, he was lying on the floor with his hands tied behind him. They'd searched him, removing his coat and his knife. The useful items and the heels of his boots were undisturbed, but he couldn't get to them while he was being watched. There were four feet within the range of his vision, one pair belonging to the Turk, he thought. The second set of feet was encased in elegant leather slippers. Presumably Hamilton and Percy were also among those present, but he couldn't see them without turning his head. There were several excellent reasons for not doing that, including the fact that his head felt as if it would explode if he moved it. Someone was talking. Percy. Get the window over nothing. Even if they know, they won't have time to bother with us tonight. You fool. That was Hamilton, caustic and curt. Didn't you recognize the man who got away? He won't get far. He was hit. He could barely hang on. With an effort, Ramses kept his breathing shallow and slow. Hamilton was quick to reply. It was David Todroth. Who? Impossible. He's in... He's not. I got a good look at him. Now think, if the effort isn't too much for you. If Todros is here, it's because the British sent him here. He looks enough like your cousin to pass for him. They've pulled that stunt before. Why wouldn't they do it now? And why was it imperative that Todros's presence here shouldn't be known? And what about those rumours about the man in India? There was no reply from Percy. For God's sake, Hamilton said impatiently. Isn't it obvious? You told that miserable young thug we planted on Wardani to get rid of him. That was not a bad idea. I never trusted Wardani either. And if we had made a martyr of him, his people would be raging for revenge against the British. That was part of the plan. It would have worked, too, if Farouk hadn't been such a rotten shot. He only wounded the fellow. How badly? Well, bad enough, I suppose, to judge from Farouk's lurid description. He wasn't seen for three days. Where was he during that time? Where was he the rest of the time? You knew where all the others lived, but you never found Wadani's hideouts, did you? Neither did the police, and God knows they looked hard enough. Damn it! Don't patronize me! Percy shouted. I see what you're getting at, but you're wrong. Yes, I heard the rumors, and yes, I knew there was only one man who could have taken Wardani's place. It wasn't Ramses. I sent Fortescue to Giza to see if he was... if he... Oh, my God! Has the penny dropped at last? I wouldn't count on your little revolution coming off tonight. Ten to one, those weapons are already in the hands of the police. Percy let out a string of obscenities... 
The toe of his boot caught Ramses in the ribs and rolled him onto his back. Get him up, Percy snapped. On his feet! Two of the hands that hauled him upright belonged to the Turk. The man who gripped his other arm wore the long white woolen hake wound round his body and over his head. The Senussi were religious reformers, but not ascetics. This fellow's kaftan was of yellow silk trimmed with red braid, and his undervest glittered with gold. Percy's tone had been that of master to servant, the same tone he used to all non-Europeans, and although the two men had complied with his order, their scowling faces showed their resentment. Leaning negligently against the back of one of the chairs, a glass in his hand, Hamilton met Ramsay's curious gaze with smiling affability. He had abandoned his kilt that evening in favour of ordinary civilian clothes and boots, but that wasn't the only difference in his appearance. The face was that of another man, harder and more alert. How much did you hear? Percy demanded. Quite a lot, Ramsay said apologetically. I know eavesdropping's rude, but... Percy cut him off with a hard, open-handed slap across the mouth. Was it you? It wasn't, was it? It couldn't have been. He grabbed Ramsay's by the front of his shirt. Ramsay stared back at him. He was not unwilling to prolong the discussion, but he couldn't think of a response. It was such a simple-minded question. What did Percy expect him to say? Why didn't he look for the unmistakable evidence that would verify Hamilton's theory? Ramses knew the answer. Percy couldn't admit the possibility that he'd been outwitted, that all his brilliant plans had collapsed into ruin. He'd deny the truth until someone rubbed his nose in it. Percy raised his hand for another slap, but before he could deliver it, Hamilton came up behind him and knocked his arm down, and it was Hamilton who opened Ramsay's shirt and pulled it off his shoulders. Is that proof enough for you? he said sardonically. The Turk let out a muffled exclamation. Ramses wondered idly how detailed Farouk's description had been. Not that it mattered. The scars were there, some of them still healing. Percy's cheeks turned crimson and his lips puckered into a pout like that of a spoiled child. Because Ramses had half expected it, he was able to keep from crying out when Percy's fist drove into his shoulder. After the dizziness had passed, he discovered he was still more or less upright. A furious argument was in progress. The Turk was doing most of the shouting. Stay then, fool, and wait for the police. Do you suppose he came here without their knowledge? We have lost this skirmish. It is time to retreat and regroup. Percy began gabbling. No, no, you can't go. I need you to help me deal with him. Ramses raised his head and met the cool, appraising eyes of Hamilton. Our Turkish friend does it right, he said. We mustn't waste any more time. There's no need to question him when the answers are obvious. Tie his feet and arms and let's get out of here. Percy's jaw dropped. Leave him alive? Are you mad? He knows who I am. Kill him, then, the Turk said unless the blood tie holds your hand. Shall I cut his throat for you? D don't trouble yourself on my account, Ramsay said. He was pleased to find that his voice was steady. The Turk laughed appreciatively. It was well played, young one. I regret we will not match wits again. Keep talking, Ramsay thought. Keep them arguing and debating and delaying. It wouldn't delay the Turk for long. He was an old hand at this. There was still a chance, though, so long as David was alive, and he must be. The alternative was unthinkable. Ironically, his only hope of surviving for more than 60 seconds depended on Percy. Oh, no, Percy said. I've looked forward to killing him for years. I'm looking forward to it even more now. Take him downstairs. Take him yourself. You don't give orders to me. The Turk released his grip, and Ramsay sagged to his knees. Good old Percy, he thought insanely. 
always predictable. Go then, damn you, Percy shouted. Both of you, all of you, I can handle him by myself. I doubt that, the Turk said with a sneer. So, rather than take the chance, I will make certain he is securely bound and helpless before I go. That is how you want him, isn't it? The contempt in his voice didn't even touch Percy. Yes, he said eagerly. Good. You needn't bother to carry him, just... He will walk to his death, the Turk said flatly, as a man should. Help him up, Said Ahmad. Ramses appreciated the implied compliment, but as they pulled him to his feet, he wished the Turk's notions of honour were not so painful. Swaying in the grasp of his captors, he said, I wouldn't at all object to being carried. This sort of thing is somewhat tiring. The Turk let out a bark of laughter. Percy reddened. You wouldn't be so cocky if you knew what's in store for you. I have a fairly good idea. Whatever would Lord Edward say? Torture's caddish, you know. So they had to carry him after all. Percy got in two hard blows across the face before the Turk's blistering comments stopped him. Ramses was only vaguely aware of being lifted by his feet and shoulders and after a time of being lowered onto a hard surface. When they cut the ropes that bound his hands, he reacted automatically, striking out with feet and knees and the stiffened muscles of his arms. It gained him a few precious seconds, but there were four of them, and it didn't take them long to put him out. There was water dripping off his chin when he came to his senses. He passed his dry tongue over the traces of moisture on his lips and tried to focus his eyes. He was where he had expected to be, in the foul little room in the cellar, stripped to the waist, his hands tied to a hook high on the wall. The lantern was burning brightly, naturally. Percy would want to see what he was doing. His cousin put the water jug on the table, caught hold of Ramsay's jaw, and twisted his head painfully round so their faces were only inches apart. How did you find out about this place? he demanded hoarsely. What? Did she tell you? Was that why she... Answer me! At first he couldn't imagine what Percy meant. She couldn't be El Garbi. That variety of insult was far too subtle for Percy. Then it came to him, and with it, a flood of emotion so strong he almost forgot his aching body. He had told himself she wouldn't be taken in by Percy ever again. He had believed it, but there had always been that ugly doubt, born of jealousy and frustration. The last rotten core was gone now, washed away by the realisation of what she had risked for him. He got his feet under him, relieving the strain on his arms and wrists, and met Percy's eyes squarely. I don't know what you're talking about. My informant was a man. You would say that, wouldn't you? You would lie to keep her out of it. Damn the little bitch! I'll get even with her. I'll... He went on with a string of vile epithets and promises to which Ramses listened with a detachment that surprised even him. Chivalry demanded that he defend his lady, verbally if not otherwise, and words were about all he was capable of just then. But she was beyond that, beyond praise or blame. When Percy stopped raving, he wasn't literally foaming at the mouth but he looked as if he were about to. Well, say something. I would if I could think of anything pertinent, Ramsay said. He hadn't meant to laugh. It was the sort of thing some posturing hero in a melodrama would do, but he couldn't stop himself. Now's your chance to say something clever, he added helpfully. He who laughs last laughs best. Or fools laugh at men of sense? Or what about... 
the side of his head struck the wall as Percy released his grip. He took off his coat and hung it neatly over the back of the chair, removed his cufflinks and rolled his sleeves up. Watching his careful preparations, Ramses was vividly reminded of a scene from their childhood. The bloody, flayed body of the rat Percy had been torturing when Ramses came into the room. Too late to prevent it. And Percy's expression, lips wet and slightly parted, eyes shining. His face had the same look now. He tried to blame that atrocity on Ramses too. Once, Ramses had believed that he feared the Kurbash more than anything in the world, more than death itself. He'd been wrong. He was as frightened as he had ever been in his life, dry-mouthed and sweating, his heart pounding and his stomach churning. But he didn't want to die. And there was still a chance, maybe more than one, if he could hang on long enough. Percy gripped the handle of the whip, lifted it from the hook, and let it uncoil. Ramses turned his face to the wall and closed his eyes. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. Emerson and I dined alone and then retired to the parlour. A long evening stretched ahead of us. As a rule, Emerson and I had no difficulty finding things to talk about, but I could see he was no more inclined toward conversation than I. The prospect of seeing David, of keeping him safe in my care, was a cheering thought, but the closer the moment came, the more impatient I was to see it. Emerson had sought refuge in the newspaper, so I took up my darning. I had scarcely finished one stocking before Nama began to howl. The door burst open and Nefret ran in. She flung her cloak aside. It slipped to the floor in a tumble of blue. They aren't here, she said, her eyes sweeping the quiet lamplit room. Where are they gone? Who? I sucked a drop of blood from my finger. She struck her hands together. Her eyes were so dilated they looked black. Her face was deathly pale. You know who? Don't lie to me, Aunt Amelia, not now. Something has happened to Ramses, perhaps to David as well. Emerson put his pipe aside and went to her. My dear, calm yourself. What makes you suppose they're... Confounded! How do you know that David is... Here in Cairo? She moved away from him and began to walk up and down, her hands clasped and twisting. I knew the moment I set eyes on him that the man Russell took us to meet wasn't Wadani. I thought it must be Ramses, even though he didn't move quite the same way. And then Ramses produced that convenient alibi, and I saw the whole thing. I don't blame him for not telling me. How could he ever trust me again after what I did? But you must trust me now. You must. Do you suppose I would do anything to harm him? You must tell me where he went tonight. She dropped to her knees before Emerson and caught hold of his hand. Please, I beg you. Emerson's expressive countenance mirrored his distress and pity. He raised her to her feet. Now, my dear, get hold of yourself and try to tell me what this is all about. What makes you suppose Ramses is in danger? She was a little calmer now. Clinging to those strong brown hands, she looked up at him and said simply, I've always known, since we were children, a feeling, a fear, a nightmare if I was asleep when it happened. Those dreams of yours, I exclaimed, were they... Always about him. What do you suppose brought me home that night a few weeks ago? I came straight to his room. I wanted to help, and... Her voice broke into a sob. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Turning and walking away. Pretending to believe he wasn't hurt, that nothing was wrong. But at least I knew you were with him, caring for him. She clasped her hands and gave me a look of poignant appeal. This is one of the worst feelings I've ever had. Even worse than when he was in Ricchetti's hands. Or the time he... I'm not imagining things. I'm not hysterical or superstitious. I know. Abdullah's words came back to me. There will come a time when you must believe a warning that has no more reality 
than those dreams of yours. Emerson, I cried. He lied to us. He must have done. It is for tonight. Something's gone wrong. What can we do? Hmm. Emerson fingered the cleft in his chin. There is only one person who might know their intentions for this evening. I'm going to see Russell. Ring him, I urged. Waste of time. He won't tell me anything unless I confront him and demand the truth. Wait here, my dears. I will let you know the moment I have information. He hastened from the room. A few minutes later, I heard the engine of the motor car roar. For once, I did not worry about Emerson driving himself. If he did not run into a camel, he would reach his destination in record time. Wait, Nefred said bitterly. She jumped up from her chair. I thought she meant to follow Emerson and was about to remonstrate when she began tugging at her dress. Help me, she whispered. Please, Aunt Amelia. What are you doing? I'm going to change so as to be ready. I did not ask for what, but went to assist her. My brain still reeled under the impact of the astonishing revelations she had flung at us. Exerting the full strength of my will, I considered the implications of those revelations. So all this while, you have known the truth about what Ramses and David were doing? And you said nothing? You said nothing to me? I couldn't. I was sworn to secrecy, as was he, under orders, like any soldier. That's not the only reason. He was afraid I would betray him again, as I did before. But, dear heaven, surely I've paid for that. Losing him and our baby, and knowing that I'd only myself to blame. I had believed myself impervious to surprise by now. But this latest revelation made my knees buckle. I collapsed into the nearest chair. Good Gad, do you mean when you miscarried two years ago, it was... it was his... ours? The tears on her cheeks sparkled like crystals. Perhaps now you understand why I went to pieces afterwards. I wanted it and him so much. And it was all my fault, from start to finish, every step of the way. If I hadn't lost my temper and betrayed Ramsay's secret to Percy, if I hadn't rushed out of the house without even giving him a chance to defend himself, if I hadn't married Geoffrey in a fit of spite, if I'd had the wits to realize Geoffrey was lying when he told me he was deathly ill. I didn't know I was pregnant, Aunt Amelia. Do you suppose I would have married Geoffrey or stayed with him under any circumstances if I'd known I was carrying Ramsay's child? Do you suppose I wouldn't have used that without shame or scruple to get him back? I did not ask how she could be certain. Presumably she was in a position to know. She had mistaken the reason for my silence. Dropping to her knees, she took my hands and looked straight into my eyes. You mustn't think we were... we were sneaking behind your back, Aunt Amelia. It only happened once. A faint touch of colour warmed her pale face. One night. We came to you next morning to tell you and ask your blessing. And that was when... You found Kalan and the child and her mother with us. Good heavens. You can't imagine how I felt. I'd been so happy, happier than I could ever have imagined. It was like Lucifer falling from the heights of heaven into the deepest pits of hell in one long descent. Not that there is any excuse for what I did. I ought to have believed in him, trusted him. He will never forgive me for that. How could he? I stroked the golden head that now rested on my lap. He has forgiven you, believe me. But I am in a considerable state of confusion, my dear. I understand some of what you've told me, but what was it you said about betraying Ramses to Percy? She raised her head and brushed the tears from her face with the back of her hand. You're trying to distract me, aren't you? 
to keep me from losing my head and acting without direction or thought. I've done it before, only too often. It was from me that Percy learned it was Ramses who rescued him from Zal's camp. David and Leah knew, and they told me, and swore me to secrecy, and I gave my word. And then one day, Percy came sneaking round to see me, and he made me so angry, paying me sickening compliments and making insulting remarks about Ramses and... and... I had tried not to stop her. It was only when her breath gave out that I managed to get a word in. I understand. My dear, you mustn't blame yourself. How could you have known how Percy would react? Ramses knew. That was why he didn't want Percy to find out. That isn't the point, Aunt Amelia. Don't you see? I lost my temper and betrayed a confidence. And that broken promise was the start of it all. If I can't be trusted to keep my word... Enough of this, I exclaimed, breaking into a tirade of self-approach. You meant no harm, and Percy might have used Sinea to injure Ramses anyhow. He has hated Ramses since they were children. Really, in a fret, I thought you had better sense. Sympathy would have broken her down. My stern but kindly tone was precisely what was needed. She stiffened her shoulders and gave me a watery smile. I'll try, she said humbly. I've been trying to think. There is only one place they might have gone. But I don't think Ramses could have known of it. And surely he wouldn't... She got to her feet, and I did the same, taking firm hold of her. But I feared she was on the verge of losing control again. We cannot act on doubtful grounds, Nefret. If you are mistaken, we would lose valuable time. And we would not be here when Emerson rings. I know. I wasn't suggesting... Then she stiffened and pulled away from me. Listen. Her ears were keener than mine. She was halfway to the door before I heard the hoofbeats, and then a shout from Ali the doorman. I followed Nefret through the hall to the front door, in time to see Ali trying to lower a body from the horse that stood sweating and shivering outside. It was that of a man, dead or unconscious. Nefret sprang to Ali's assistance. Take his shoulders, Ali, she said crisply. Get him into the drawing room. Aunt Amelia? I helped her to raise the man's feet, and the three of us, staggering under his dead weight, bore him through the hall and into the lighted room, where we lowered him onto the rug. It was David, deathly pale, insensible and bleeding, but alive, thank God. There was blood everywhere, on my hands, on those of the fret, and on her skirts. David's right leg was saturated from hip to foot. Kneeling beside him, the fret pulled his knife from the scabbard and began cutting away his trouser leg. She snapped out orders as she worked. Ring for Fatima and the others. I want a basin of water, towels, my medical bag, blankets. Within seconds, the entire household was assembled. The shock to poor Fatima on seeing her beloved David... Not only here, but desperately injured, was extreme. But she pulled herself together, as I had known she would, and flew into action. A bullet wound, Nefret said, tightening the strip of cloth cut from her skirt. He's lost a great deal of blood. Where the devil is my bag? I need proper bandages. Ali, take Aswa to the stable and have a look at her. The bullet went straight through David's thigh. It may have injured her. Then saddle two of the other horses... Fatima, hold this. Aunt Amelia, ring the hospital. Ask Sophia to come at once. I did as she asked, telling the doctor to make haste. When I went back to Nefret, she was knotting the last of the bandages. Twenty minutes, I reported. Nefret, don't talk to me now, Aunt Amelia. I've stopped the bleeding. He'll do until she arrives. Fatima, obey Dr. Sophia's orders implicitly. David... She leaned over him and took his face between her small, bloody hands. David, can you hear me? Nefret, don't. He cannot. He can. He must. David. His eyelids lifted. Pain and weakness and the effects of the injection she had given him dulled his eyes, but not for long. His gaze focused on her face. Nefret. Go after him. They 
I know. Where? Palace. His voice was so faint, I could scarcely make out the word. Ruin. Ah, on the road to... Yes, all right, I've got it. Don't talk any more. Hurry. Took me too long. Don't worry, dear. I'll get him back. He did not hear. His eyes were closed and his head rested heavily in her hands. Nefret kissed his white lips and rose. She looked as if she'd been in a slaughterhouse. Skirts dripping, hands wet, face streaked with blood, but not with tears. Her eyes were dry and as hard as turquoise. I'm going with you. I said. She looked me over, coolly appraising, as she would have inspected a weapon to make certain it was functional. Yes. Change. Riding kit. Leaving Fatima with David, we hastened up the stairs. Will he live? I asked. David? I think so. She went into her room. I exchanged my tea gown for trousers and boots and shirt and buckled on my belt of tools. Nefret seemed to know where we were going. How, I wondered. David hadn't given us precise directions. I felt torn apart leaving him, even though he was in good hands. How much harder had it been for Nefret, who loved him like a brother and who had the medical skill he needed. There was only one thing on her mind now, however. I did not doubt she would have passed my bleeding form without a second glance if she had to make the choice. When I hastened to her room, I found her lacing her boots. Not your belt, Aunt Amelia, she said, without looking up. It makes too much noise. Very well, I said meekly, and distributed various useful articles about my person. Shouldn't we try to reach Emerson? Write him a note. Tell him where we've gone. But I don't know. I'll do it. She rose and snatched a sheet of writing paper from the desk. Send Ali or Yusuf after him. Russell's headquarters first. If he isn't there, they must track him down. I'll make a copy and leave it with Fatima in case the professor comes back here before they find him. She thought of everything. I'd seen her in this state before and knew she would hold up until she had accomplished her aim. Or had seen it fail. A shiver ran through my frame. What in God's name would become of her if she were unable to save him? What would become of me and his father... We paused in the drawing room long enough to give Fatima her final instructions. David lay where we had left him, covered with blankets, and so still my heart skipped a beat. Nefret bent over him and took his pulse. Holding steady, she said coolly. I have sent for Daoud and Khadija, Fatima whispered. I hope I did right. Exactly right. She has a healer's hands, and Daoud is always a tower of strength. Don't forget, Fatima, if the professor rings instead of coming, read him that note. Yes, she smiled a little. It was good that I learned to read, Nur Misur. Nefret hugged her. Take care of him. Come, Aunt Amelia. The horses were ready, Nefret's moonlight and another of the Arabs. As Nefret swung herself into the saddle, I said urgently, Shan't we take some of the men? Dowd will be here soon, and Ali is... No. She had taken the reins in her hands and was so anxious to be off she was quivering like a hound at the traces. But she spared enough time to explain. He's not dead. Not yet. I would know. But if the place were to be attacked openly, they would kill him at once. We must get into the house without being discovered and find him before help arrives. If it does... And if it does not, I said, we will do the job ourselves. I had heard of the place, but I could never have found it without a guide, nor indeed would I have had any reason to seek it out, since it was without archaeological or artistic interest. How Nefret knew its location, I hadn't had time to inquire. That she knew was all that mattered. Once we had passed the crossroads at mit Ukbe, there were few people on the road, and she let moonlight out. Never once did she stop or slow her pace, even when she turned off the road onto a scarcely discernible track. Before long, the cultivation was behind us, and the track grew steeper. 
The waxing moon was high in the sky. Its light and that of the stars must have been enough to show her where to go, for there were few landmarks. A huddle of tumble-down houses, a grove of trees. When she pulled moonlight to a walk, I saw ahead a dark mass that might have been almost anything, so shapeless were its outlines. We drew nearer, and I began to make out details. Fallen stones, a clump of low trees, and a light. The regularity of the shape indicated that it issued from a window somewhere beyond the trees. Nefret stopped and dismounted, and gestured me to do the same. When I would have spoken, she put her hand over my mouth. Then from her lips issued the soft but penetrating whistle Ramses used to summon Risha. It was not long before the stallion's familiar shape emerged from the night. He came toward us, stepping lightly and silently, and Nefret caught hold of his bridle and whispered in his ear. If the noble beast could only speak, his presence proved that Ramses was here, somewhere in that ruinous blackness. There was no need for us to confer. The lighted window was our guide and our destination. We left the horses and crept forward. Once, after stubbing my toe on an unseen rock, I tugged at Nefret's sleeve and held out my torch. She shook her head and took my hand. The window was on the ground floor of a small structure, well inside the outer walls. It might once have been a pavilion or kiosk. Crouching, picking our way with painful slowness, we approached. Then, cautiously, we raised our heads just enough to look inside. It was a strange place to find in an abandoned palace of the 18th century, a poor imitation of a gentleman's study, with leather chairs and Persian rugs and a few sticks of furniture. In the centre of the floor was a large copper brazier or shallow tray. It must have served the former function quite recently, for it was filled with ashes and bits of scorched paper, and the stench of their burning was still strong. Of more immediate interest was the fact that the room was occupied. Two of the men were unknown to me. One of them was tall and heavily built, grey-bearded and fair-skinned as a European under his tan. The other wore traditional Senussi garb. The third man... The hair of bright auburn, artistically dulled by grey, was a wig, and his face was turned away. But I would have known that straight, lithe form anywhere. I felt a pang... Yes, I confess it. Though he had all but openly confessed his treachery, I had cherished a forlorn hope that I might have misunderstood. There could no longer be the slightest doubt. He was guilty. And if Ramses was a prisoner here, Sethos was one of his captors. That's the lot, then, Greybeard said, in heavily accented but fluent English. What sort of incompetent is this man? Keeping the documents was bad enough, leaving us to destroy them while he amuses himself with a prisoner as inexcusable. I am tempted to let the thrice-accursed British catch the thrice-accursed imbecile. There was not a sound from Nefret, not even a catch of breath. I did not need the painful pressure of her fingers to warn me I must be equally silent. One is certainly tempted, the false Scot agreed. I would have ground my teeth had I dared make the slightest sound. I ought to have known that Sethos would have had more than one identity. No wonder he'd agreed so readily to give up that of the Count. In his other role, he had taken even greater pains to avoid me. Hamilton, as I knew he must be, continued in the same lazy drawl. We can't risk letting him fall into the hands of the police. He knows too much about us, and they won't have to beat him to get the information out of him. He'll squeal like a pig. The Senussi's lips curled. He is a coward and a fool. So, we take him with us? By force, if necessary, Sethos said. And you'd better go at once. Leave the back entrance unlocked for me. 
I'll have a final look round to make certain he hasn't left anything else incriminating. What about the prisoner? Greybeard asked. I'll take care of him on my way out, if there's anything left of him. The grey-bearded man nodded. Rather you than me. Squeamish, Sethos inquired softly. This is war. I kill when I must. But he is a brave man, and he deserves a quick death. He will get it. Sethos opened his elegantly tailored coat, and I saw the knife strapped to his belt. There was no exchange of farewells or instructions. Greybeard and the Senussi simply walked out of the room, leaving Sethos standing by the smoking brazier. After listening for a moment, his head cocked. Sethos turned, knelt, and began sorting through the half-burned scraps, tossing them carelessly onto the floor after examining each. Whatever it was he was looking for, he did not find it. A soft but heartfelt dam was heard, and then he rose to his feet. Nefret was trembling, but she remained motionless, and her well-nigh superhuman restraint helped me to control my own fury and anxiety. We couldn't take the slightest chance, not now. I had my pistol and she her knife, but Sethos had other weapons of strength and skill that could overcome us both. We must wait until he left the room and then follow him and catch him off guard before he could carry out his grisly promise. Sethos drew back his foot and gave the brazier a hard kick that scattered ashes across the rug. He was in a temper, so much the worse for us or for anyone else who got in his way. He took one of the lamps from the table and strode out of the room, leaving the door swinging on its hinges. Nefret pulled herself up and over the sill, as quickly and neatly as a lad might have done, and then reached down her hand to assist me. Through the open door, I saw what appeared to be a narrow hallway with another door opposite. I indicated this to Nefret, raising my eyebrows inquiringly. Her lips tightened, and she shook her head. This way, she whispered, and led me along the hallway to a flight of narrow stone stairs. The light from the open door of the room we had left and the light of the lantern below enabled us to descend them quickly and noiselessly. There was no sign of Sethos when we reached the bottom of the stairs. He must have entered the room from whose open door the lantern glow came. Nefret darted forward, with me close on her heels. She did not even pause in the doorway, but flew like a stone from a catapult at the man we had followed, pushing him aside with such force that he dropped the knife he held and staggered back. I do not believe she saw him as an individual only as an obstacle between her and her goal. Standing on tiptoe, she drew her own knife and sawed at the ropes binding Ramsay's wrists to a hook on the wall. His bare back was a sickening sight, covered with blood and raised wheels, and he appeared to be unconscious. When his arms were free, he sank to the floor, clasped tightly in her arms. I levelled my pistol at the man who stood against the wall. Don't move! I might have known I'd find you here, and I ought to have anticipated you would turn up. He had the effrontery to smile at me. We always meet under the most extraordinary circumstances. Perhaps, some day... Be quiet! I shifted position slightly, so that I could keep him covered, while I shot quick glances at the tableau slightly behind me. Ramses lay sprawled across Nefret's lap, her arms pressing him to her breast and his head resting against her shoulder. His face was bruised and blood-stained and his eyes were closed, but I saw his lips move in a sigh or a groan and I knew he lived. See if you can rouse him, Nefret, I ordered. We must make haste and I doubt we can carry him. You might try... Oh! He is less of a man than I believe him to be if that doesn't rouse him. Sethos remarked. I assure you, Amelia, your kisses will bring me back from the dead. Nefret's bowed head hid Ramsay's face, but I saw him raise one arm and place it over her shoulders. The ensuing conversation was extremely incoherent. Most conversations of that nature are. 
I do not believe Ramses was aware of where he was or why he was there, but I will say for him that he went straight to the point. I love you. I was a fool. Forgive me. No, it was my fault, all of it. Tell me you love me. I did. I do. I... Her voice rose. So you went off without a word when you knew you might never come back. That wasn't how... I didn't intend... Damn it, I left you a letter. Telling me what? That you loved me and were sorry you were dead? Yes, well, what about you? Coming here with that filthy... Stop it at once, I ordered. There will be ample time for that sort of thing later. At least I hope there will. Nefret, did you hear me? Oh, curse it, Ramses. Yes, mother, Ramses murmured. He looked round, blinking. Good Lord, it is mother. What's going on? Is David... He'll be all right, Nefret said. She kissed him. And for a time, I was afraid I would have to shout at them again. However, Ramses seemed to have got a grip on reality at last. Leaning on the fret, he got slowly to his feet. I need you to bind and gag this villain while I hold him at gunpoint, I explained. Sethos's smile faded. Amelia, you're on the verge of making a disastrous mistake. I came here to... To murder my son, you villain, I cried. You have betrayed your country and broken your word to me. Wrong as usual, my obstinate darling. But do you think this is an appropriate time for a discussion of my character? Possibly not, I admitted. Definitely not, Ramses said, though I was not entirely myself at the time. I got the impression that my amiable host was dragged away by two... Large, angry men. However... However, said a voice from the doorway, he got away from them. You didn't suppose I would allow someone else the pleasure of finishing you off, did you? Chapter 15 His well-bred friends would have had some difficulty in recognising him. His coat was torn and his shirt front speckled with small drops of blood. The features I had once thought bore a slight resemblance to my own were dark and distorted with collar, and his lips were drawn back over his teeth. Put your little gun away, Aunt Amelia. Now be honest for once. You never suspected me, did you? Rapidly, I appraised the situation. It was not promising. Percy's gun was one of those large, ugly German weapons, and at such close range, he could hardly have missed any target he selected. At the moment, he appeared to have selected me. If I shot him, Sethos would overpower me before I could fire again, even supposing Percy did not kill me first. Uh, not of this, I said. I hadn't believed that even you could stoop so low. Ramses straightened, with what effort I could only imagine. Give it up, Percy. The game is over. You've lost. To you? His lips writhed. No, not to you, damn you. I'll get out of this. No one would believe. Russell knows, Ramses said. 
He knows about this place. My failure to report back to him will confirm my accusations. The words fell as quietly and deadly as stones piled on a grave. Another sort of man might have heeded them, but not Percy. His face was twitching uncontrollably, and a look of cunning narrowed his eyes. Report back, he repeated. Not for a while, though, eh? Aunt Amelia and dear little Nefret are all the rescue party. Excellent. There's plenty of time for me to get to the border. I can still be of use to them, and the reward they promised is waiting for me. A handsome villa in Constantinople, with everything I've ever wanted. Let me see now, he mused. How shall I go about this? One bullet for dear Aunt Amelia, and one more for the lovers, so closely entwined. Or shall I shoot the gun out of her hand first? It'll be extremely painful, though perhaps not as painful as watching me put a half a dozen bullets into her son. Then there is no fret. I hold a grudge against her for tricking me. A more suitable punishment would be to let her live with me in that pleasant villa. Yes, I think I'll take her along when I leave Cairo. Over my dead body, I exclaimed. Precisely what I had in mind, said Percy. I grasped at the last frail straw. Your confederate is unarmed. I will shoot him if you don't drop your gun. Sethos, who had not moved, now shook his head and sighed. Percy laughed. Go ahead. You'd probably miss, but our association was about to end anyhow. All right, Ramses, old chap. Here's your chance to die like a hero. Shove it out of the way and let me have a clear shot, or I'll put a bullet through the two of you. The gun turned in their direction. Mine turned back toward Percy. Before I could fire, the weapon was swept from my hand and a hard shove sent me staggering back. Unable to keep my balance, I sat down with such force that I was momentarily paralysed and my ears were deafened by a series of explosions so rapid they sounded like those of a machine gun. Too many things were happening at once. My eyes couldn't focus. Where was Nefret? Where was Sethos? Percy was screaming and pawing at his chest. But he was still upright, and the gun was in his hand. Ramses launched himself at Percy, and the two fell to the floor. Ramses could not hold him. They rolled over, and as his scored back struck the floor, Ramses cried out and lay still. Percy crouched by him, groping for the gun he had let fall. And as I half crawled, half stumbled toward them, Nefret ran back with her knife in her hand. The look on her face stopped me like a blow. It was as remote and merciless as that of the goddess whose high priestess she had once been. Raising the knife in both hands, she brought it down with all her strength, up to the hilt into Percy's back. For a moment, she stood unmoving. Then her face crumpled like that of a frightened child, and she turned with a cry into the arms of... Emerson? Emerson! He wasn't alone. Mending uniform pushed into the room. There were others in the corridor outside. Still on hands and knees, I turned my head. Leaning against the wall, drenched in blood, Sethos tossed my gun away and gave me a twisted smile. As usual, I have been upstaged. Don't waste a bullet on me, Radcliffe. I haven't much time left. You shot Percy, I gasped. And he shot... I hit him first, said Sethos, with a shadow of his old arrogance. Twice, and both square on target. I don't mean to sound critical, Amelia, dear, but you might consider carrying a larger... 
He swayed and would have fallen if I hadn't hastened to support him. Almost at once my hands were pushed aside and replaced by the strong arm of Emerson. He lowered his old enemy carefully to the floor. It might be advisable for you to talk fast, Sethos. The Turks are advancing and 10,000 lives depend on you. When will the attack come and where? Kantara? What in heaven's name are you talking about, Emerson? I cried. The man is dying. He gave his life for... You? No doubt, no doubt. But what concerns me at this moment is the fact that he is an agent of British intelligence and that he was sent here to get that information. Don't stand there gawking at me, Peabody. Raise his head. He is choking on his own blood. Stupefied by disbelief, I sat down and lifted Sethos's head onto my lap. Emerson opened his coat and ripped the bloody shirt away from his body. Damn, he said. Fret, come here, see what you can do. She came, and Ramsay's with her. They were intertwined like Siamese twins, and both looked as dazed as I felt. After she had examined the gruesome wounds, she shook her head. It has penetrated his lung. We must get him to the hospital immediately. But I don't think... Can he talk? The man who had spoken was a stranger to me, one of General Maxwell's aides, to judge by his uniform. An ambulance is on the way, but if he can tell us where... Sethos opened his eyes. I don't know. They burned the papers. I couldn't find... Then a spark of the old malicious amusement shone in the grey, brown, green depths. You might ask, my nephew. I rather think he got a look at them. Who? Emerson's strong jaw dropped. Who? I gasped, glaring wildly around the small chamber. Me, I think, said Ramses. By a process of elimination, I had begun to wonder. Don't try to talk, Ramses, I cried. He was leaning heavily on the fret, and under the bruises and streaks of blood, his face was ashen. I think I'd better, Ramses said, drawing a long, difficult breath. Kantara is a feint only. The main attack will come between Tusum and Serapeum at half past three. They have steel pontoons to bridge the canal. Uh, two infantry brigades and six guns are to hold a position two miles northeast of Serapeum. Half past three? Today? The officer broke in. It's already after midnight. Damn it, man, are you sure? Headquarters expected the attack would be farther north. It'll take at least eight hours to get our reserves from Ismailia to Serapeum. Then you'd better get them started, hadn't you? Said Ramses. Damnation! Emerson exclaimed. The only troops near Tusum are the Indian infantry, and most of them are Muslims. If they don't hold, they will hold. Ramses looked down at the man whose head rested on my lap. As I was saying, I began to wonder about Major Hamilton earlier. His suggestion that they leave me alive was a bit too disingenuous. Double agent, I thought, and prayed, rather... But it never occurred to me he was... His voice cracked. Uh, Uncle Sethos? Emerson had gone white. You were the boy in the snow. My father's... Your father's bastard, yes, Sethos whispered. Did you never suspect why I hated you so? The sight of you that night, the young heir and master in your handsome coach, while I struggled to help a fainting woman through the drifts. She died a week later in a charity ward in Truro and was buried in a pauper's grave. She loved you, Emerson said, in a voice that cut me to the heart. You had that at least. It was more than I had. I am mean enough to be glad of that, Sethos said in a stronger voice. You had everything else. We are more alike than you realize, brother. You turned your talents to scholarship, 
I turned mine to crime. I became your dark counterpart, your rival. I tried to take her from you, Radcliffe, but I failed in that, as in all the rest. Listen to me. Emerson leaned forward. I want you to know this. I tried to find you that night. After my mother told me what she had done, I went out to look for you. She sent two of the servants to drag me back and lock me in my room. If there is anything I can do to make it up to you. Too late. Just as well. We would all find it a trifle difficult to adjust to these new relationships. Emerson said gruffly, Will you give me your hand? In a token of forgiveness? It seems I have less to forgive than you. His hand moved feebly. Emerson grasped it. Sethos's eyes moved slowly over the faces of the others and then returned, as if drawn by a magnet, to mine. How very sentimental, he murmured. I never thought to see my affectionate family gathered round me at the end. Uh, fetch the light closer, Radcliffe. Uh, my eyes are dimming, and I, I want to see her face clearly. Amelia, will you grant me my last wish? I would like to die with your kiss on my lips. It's the only reward I'm likely to get for helping to save your son's life. Not to mention the Suez Canal. I lifted him in my arms and kissed him. For a moment, his lips met mine with desperate intensity. Then a shudder ran through him and his head fell back. Gently, I lowered him to the ground and folded his bloody hands over his breast. Bid the soldiers shoot, I murmured, and bear him like a soldier to the stage, for he was likely, had he been... Amelia, I beg you will leave off misquoting Hamlet, said my husband through his teeth. I forgave him his harsh tone, for I knew it was his way of concealing his emotions. The scene did rather resemble the last act of the drama, with bodies here and there and soldiers crowding in to assist and to stare. Sethos and Percy were removed on litters and carried to the ambulance Emerson had commandeered, just in case, as he had explained. Ramses kept insisting he could ride, and Nefret kept telling him he could not, which was obviously the case. Even Risha's smooth gait would have jolted his back unbearably, and the ropes had cut deep into his wrists. He was still on his feet and still arguing when Emerson and I left them. But two of the soldiers were closing in on him, and Nefret assured me they would get him to one of the motor vehicles, with or without her active participation. Emerson and I took the horses back, leading the one I had ridden. We went slowly, for we had a great deal to talk about. When we arrived at the house, we found the others already there. Ramses had insisted on seeing David, who was still deep in a drugged slumber, but Nefret assured us no longer in danger. After Emerson had left for Cairo, she and I got to work on Ramses, and a nasty job it was. None of his injuries was life-threatening, but there were quite a lot of them, ranging from bruises and cuts to the bloody marks of the whip. It wasn't long before Nefret told me to leave the room. She was very nice about it, but I could see she meant it, and the look I got from Ramses indicated he was of the same opinion. So I went to my own room and sat there for a time, feeling very odd. I supposed I would get used to it. There comes a time in every mother's life. Ramses slept most of the day, and I snatched a little nap. It felt strange to lie down with a mind at ease, vexed, to be sure, by a number of unanswered questions, but free of the anxiety that had tormented every waking and sleeping moment. I do not believe Nefret slept at all. 
I managed to persuade her to bathe and change her crumpled, filthy, blood-stained garments. I'd barely time to adjust the pillows that propped Ramses on his side and inspect his back. It was, as I had expected, green, and indulge myself in a few small demonstrations of maternal affection, which did not disturb him in the slightest, since his eyes remained closed throughout, before she was back. She had left her hair to hang loose, and she was wearing the pale blue sprigged muslin frock, which I now realised someone other than Emerson must have admired. So I took myself off again, without having to be told, and whenever I chanced to look in, which I did from time to time, she was sitting in the chair by the bed, her hands folded, her eyes fixed on his sleeping face. Since it was obvious I was not wanted, I went to sit with David, relieving Fatima of that duty. She was not at all keen on being relieved, but when I asked her to prepare a tray for Nefret, she bustled off. David was awake. He gave me a smile and held out his hand. Thank you for rescuing me, Aunt Emilia. Every time I opened my mouth, she tried to shove a spoon into it. He was full of questions. I answered the most important, knowing that nothing would better assist his recovery than the knowledge that those he loved were safe and the danger over. So it was Nefret and you who saved the day, he murmured. I shook my head. It might be described as a joint enterprise. If you hadn't made a heroic effort to reach us, if Nefret hadn't known where to go, if Emerson hadn't convinced Russell he must not delay, and if Sethos had not acted when he did. I don't understand that part, Aunt Emilia. Who later, my dear? You must rest now. It was late when Emerson returned. He refused my offer of dinner with a shake of his head. I had a bite with Maxwell. Let us see if Ramses is awake and fit for conversation. He and Nefret will want to hear the news too, and there's no sense in repeating myself. Ramsay's door was ajar, as I had left it. I tapped lightly before looking in. He was awake. Whether he was fit for conversation was another matter. Nefret knelt by the bed. He held her hand in his, and they were looking into each other's eyes, and I do not suppose they would have cared if the Turks had been shelling the city. However, I felt certain they would be anxious to hear Emerson's news. I coughed. I had to cough several times before Nefret tore her eyes from his. Until I saw her do it, I'd always thought that a somewhat exaggerated figure of speech. A touch of Qatar, mother? Ramses inquired. Very amusing, my dear. I am glad to see you yourself again. Near enough. Nefret won't let me get up. Certainly not. I settled myself comfortably in the chair Nefret had left since it did not appear that she intended to return to it. I want to see David again, Ramses insisted. Perhaps in the morning. What he needs now is rest. So do you. But your father thought you might want to know what has been going on, I added pointedly. He wouldn't tell me anything. How very inconsiderate, Ramses said. Please, sit down, sir. I presume the canal is safe, or you would have mentioned it. They got across, Emerson said, at Serapeum and at Tusum. Our reserves didn't arrive until a few hours ago, but by then a counterattack had cleared most of the enemy off the east bank. It was the Indian infantry brigades who saved the canal. You knew they would, didn't you? I thought they would. Well, that is good news. Have they had any luck tracking the Turk and his friend? Emerson shook his head. No, they got clean away. Presumably, Percy made such a nuisance of himself that they abandoned him and headed for Libya. They won't want for help along the way. You were right about the chap in the yellow robe. It was the Sheriff Elson who see himself. I cleverly deduced that after the Turk called him by name, said Ramses gravely. They've got a line on the Turk too, Emerson said. He fits the description of Sahin Bey, who's been missing from his usual haunts recently. Good God. Ramsay's eyes widened. At least one of them did. 
The other was half closed by purpling bruises. He's become something of a legend in Syria. One of their top men, and high in the envers' favor. I can't believe he'd take a personal hand in our little affair. Little? Emerson's brows drew together, and he spoke with considerable vehemence. The entire Turkish strategy was based on their expectation of an uprising in Cairo. Without it, they hadn't a prayer of crossing the canal. You and David. What are you smiling about? Something Sahin Bey said to me. Doesn't matter. So, are we in line for parades? The cheers of the populace and the personal thanks of the sovereign? David deserves all of it. Ha! Ah said Emerson eloquently. However, David will be on his way to England, vindicated and pardoned as soon as he can travel. I was sorely tempted to telegraph Leah this evening, but I didn't want to raise her hopes until... The boy will be all right, won't he? The prospect of seeing her and being present at the birth of his son is the best medicine he could have, I said. No one spoke for a while. Emerson got out his pipe and made a great business of filling it, Nefret had settled down on the floor beside the bed. She was still holding Ramsay's hand. He didn't seem to mind. I suppose we were all reluctant to talk about the rest of it. Great issues of battle and war are remote, almost impersonal. But the other unanswered questions cut too close to the bone. Nefret was the first to break the silence. Percy? He died on the way to the hospital. Emerson said. Lefret, it wasn't you who killed him. No. I meant to, you know. A shadow of that remote, inhuman look passed over her face. Her blue eyes were clear. Guilt over Percy's death would not come back to haunt her. She had stopped him in the only way she could. And if ever an individual deserved death, it was he. Women are much more practical about these things than men. Oh, Emerson said. Um, well, he'd been hit twice in the chest. A heavy caliber bullet would have killed him outright. One of the twenty twos must have nicked an artery. He bled to death. And Sethos, I sighed. He redeemed himself in the end, as I had hoped he would. A hero's death. For the second time, Emerson's well-cut lips curled in a snarl. It's getting monotonous. Why, Emerson, I exclaimed. It's not like you to play dog in the manger. Yes, it is. Emerson got a grip on himself. Peabody, please don't provoke me. I want to do him justice. I am trying my damnedest to do him justice. I discovered the truth only three days ago. And it hasn't sunk in yet. But you must have known earlier that Sethos was Major Hamilton, Ramses said. I thought I detected a certain note of criticism in his voice. Emerson looked uncomfortable. I didn't know for certain, but my suspicions of Hamilton were aroused by the letter he wrote us. Curse it, I exclaimed. Don't tell me you recognise the handwriting. After all these years... Emerson grinned. If it makes you feel happier, Peabody, and I'm sure it does, that was a clue you never possessed. I was the only one who saw Sethos's farewell letter to you. Yes, you ripped it to shreds after you'd read it aloud. I told you at the time you shouldn't have done that. It was an extremely annoying epistle, said Emerson. You were right, though. I couldn't be certain the handwriting was the same, since it had been a long time. But when I remembered how assiduously Hamilton had avoided us, my suspicions increased. Having better sense than some members of this family, I took those suspicions to Maxwell, instead of acting on them as I might once have done. You can only faintly imagine my astonishment when I learnt that Sethos has been, for several years, one of the war office's most trusted secret agents. He was sent to Cairo by Kitchener himself. He knew about your little sideshow, Ramses, 
but his primary mission was to stop the leaks of information and identify the man responsible for them. It was he who exposed Mrs. Fortescue, whom he'd been cultivating in his characteristically flamboyant fashion. Maxwell told me all this. He had to, to keep me from going after Sethos myself. But he coolly informed me that Sethos was considerably more valuable than I, and that he would have me put up against a wall and shot if I breathed a word to a living soul. I knew the truth when we stopped by the barracks on our way into the desert. Maxwell had told me Sethos would be there, and ordered me to stay away from him. But, well, damn it, I was curious. He's good, Emerson admitted grudgingly. I'd never have recognised him. Of course, I hadn't the intimate knowledge of the scoundrel that some persons... Nil nisi bonum, Emerson, I murmured. Ha! said Emerson. It is a pity, said Ramses, who'd been watching his father closely, that there wasn't time for him to satisfy our curiosity about other things. How did he find out about Percy? He didn't. Emerson's face was transformed by a look of paternal pride. That discovery was yours, my boy, and yours alone. Russell wasn't entirely convinced by your reasoning initially, but after he'd had time to think about it, he concluded that you had made a strong case. He decided he had no right to take the full responsibility, so he went straight to Maxwell. I gather it wasn't a pleasant interview. Russell stuck to his guns, though. And after storming and swearing, Maxwell agreed to cooperate until the matter could be settled one way or the other. Maxwell informed Sethos, who volunteered to have a look round the place himself. Lucky for me he did, Ramses said. Yes, Emerson agreed. I... I owe him for that. And for other things. If you'd rather not speak of it, Nefret began... I would rather not, but I must. I had believed that that part of my life was over, forgotten, obliterated. I was wrong. One never knows when a ghost from the past will come back to haunt one. He was silent for a time, however, his head bowed and his countenance grave but calm. He hadn't been so unmoved when he told me part of the story early that morning as we rode back to the house. My mother was the daughter of the Earl of Radcliffe. Why she married my father, who was a simple country gentleman, without title or wealth, I never knew. There was, one must suppose, there was an attraction. It must have ended early in their marriage. My earliest memories are of contemptuous words and bitter approaches from her to him for failing to live up to her expectations. As I was to learn, that would have been impossible. Her demands were too great, her ambitions too high. He had, I believe, no desire to improve his position in the world. He was like Walter, gentle and easygoing, but with an inner core of firmness. While he lived, life was not entirely unpleasant. He died when I was fourteen, and then... She had already decided... I was to be the man my father refused to be. When I resisted, she tried various means to control me. The worst was what she did to Walter. We'd been at the same school until then. You know what they were like, even the best of them. Brutal discipline and legalised bullying were thought to make men out of boys. I was big for my age and ready to fight back. But Walter would have had a bad time if I hadn't been there to take his part. She separated us. He was becoming a mollycoddle and a coward, she said, and it was time he stood on his own feet. When I came home for the Christmas holidays, the year after my father died, I hadn't seen Walter for months. He wasn't even allowed to write me. That night it was snowing heavily, and it was in the snow I saw them. A woman and a boy struggling through the drifts. I caught only a glimpse of his face, so distorted with strain and anger it was unrecognisable. When I reached the house, I told her, my mother, 
that we must find them and offer them shelter. And that was when I learned the woman had been my father's mistress, that she had come to her former friend asking for help and had been turned away. You heard what happened. She kept me locked in my room till the following day. Well, to make a long story short, there was no way I could trace them. I had no money and no power. Matters went from bad to worse after that night. I was about to go up to Oxford when I discovered she was arranging a marriage for me with the vapid daughter of a local aristocratic imbecile. And then, like an answer to prayer, I inherited a small amount of money from one of my father's cousins. It provided enough income to enable me to pursue my studies and take Walter away from his hellish school. For years he'd been torn between his fear and dislike of her and what he considered his filial duty. She made it clear to him that he would have to choose between us, that if he came to me, she would never see him or speak to him again. So that settled that. Much later, I did make an attempt to mend matters. He smiled at me, his blue eyes softening. It was because of you and Ramsay's Peabody. Caring as I did for you, I thought perhaps she regretted losing her sons and would be willing to let bygones be bygones. I was wrong. She wouldn't see me. She did not send for me in her last illness, though she knew how to find me. I heard of her death from her lawyers. They told me she tried with her last breath to keep me from inheriting. But she had only the income from her father's money while she lived, in accordance with the patriarchal tradition. The capital went to her eldest son. I haven't touched it. It is yours, Ramses, as is the house that has been in my father's family for two hundred years. So, if you are thinking of... Um, Settling down and, um, um, uh, well, you are now in a position to support a family. He looked hopefully from Ramses to Nefret. When the true state of affairs had dawned on my dear Emerson, I could not be certain, but he would have to have been blind, deaf and feeble-witted if he misinterpreted the nature of their affection now. Of course, he would claim, as he always did, that he'd known all along. There was one aspect of that relationship of which he was certainly unaware. Ramses would never have mentioned it to his father, and Emerson hadn't been present when the fret broke down and confessed, finding, I hoped, a greater understanding than she had dared expect. It was not likely Emerson would be as sympathetic, I decided on the spot that it was none of his business. Ramses had been as startled as the rest of us by these revelations, but he had sense enough not to refuse the offer. Thank you, sir. But Uncle Walter's children must have their fair share, and another of my cousins. There was no need for him to explain. As soon as I knew Sethos and Hamilton were one and the same... I had realised who Molly might be. We cannot be certain, I said thoughtfully. Bertha was Sethos's mistress, but the child she was carrying fourteen years ago might not have been his. Fourteen years? Emerson repeated. Good gad, has it been that long? Then it can't be the same child. This girl is, uh, what did you tell me, twelve years of age? We had only her word for that. I think she was remarkably mature for her age. What do you mean? inquired Emerson, staring. I carefully avoided looking at Ramses, who was carefully not looking at me, and decided to spare him public embarrassment. He'd been through quite enough in the past 24 hours. You were misled by her dreadful clothing on the occasion of our first encounter with her, I explained in a kindly manner. Even for a child of twelve, they were old-fashioned and out of date. But then so was Miss Nordstrom. I thought nothing of it at the time, but later she was dressed more suitably for her age. And I couldn't help noticing 
Women do notice such things. So do some men, and I am pleased to find that you are not one of them. It's all conjecture, said Emerson stubbornly. Sethos probably has a dozen. Oh, very well, Peabody, I apologize. Whoever her parents were, the child is not our responsibility. He made all the necessary arrangements for her several years ago when he entered the service, and Maxwell assured me she would be well provided for. You asked about her? It was Ramsay's who spoke. His face was even more unreadable than usual because of the bruises. Of course, Emerson grumbled. Well, I had to, didn't I? Couldn't leave the child alone in the world. I admit I was relieved when Maxwell told me Sethos was... told me the matter was taken care of. He does not know about the um, family relationship... And unless one of you can give me a reason why I should, I do not intend to tell him. I saw a reason, but I did not speak of it. Perhaps one day, when Emerson was in a softer mood, I could persuade him to bring his courageous and unfortunate brother back to the home of their ancestors, to lie with them in the family plot. In what unknown spot would he now be laid to rest? What would be his monument and what his epitaph? I had already thought of a suitable inscription for the monument I felt certain Emerson would wish to erect some day. It was a quotation from an Egyptian text. Then Re Harakti said, Let Set be given unto me to dwell with me and be my son. He shall thunder in the sky and be feared. Like his ancient namesake, Sethos had redeemed himself and become one with the divine ruler of the cosmos. This did not seem a propitious time for such a suggestion. You could not have prevented it, Emerson, I said. Prevented what? Oh. Emerson gave up the attempt to light his pipe. No, Russell had his men ready, but I had the devil of a time convincing him we must act without delay. I could hardly tell him, could I, that my urgency was based on... Uh, Woman's intuition, said Nefret, turning her head to smile at him. I can imagine how Mr. Russell would have responded to that, especially when I was the woman in question. How did you persuade him, then? I rang through to the house, as I had promised, Emerson explained. When Fatima told me about David, that settled the matter. I was, to put it mildly, somewhat distressed to hear that you two had gone herring off by yourselves. But there was nothing I could do but wait for Russell to get his caravan together and notify Maxwell of our plans. When we got there, the place was dead quiet, not a sign of life except a lighted window. We found Risha and the other horses, and I didn't know where the devil you were or what you were doing, and I was afraid to risk an open attack. When we heard gunfire, we had no choice but to move in, and I fully expected to find you, both of you, all of you, dead or hideously wounded or... Calm yourself, Emerson, I said soothingly. It has all come out right in the end. No thanks to you, snarled Emerson. I beg to differ, father, Ramsay said. The events got a bit out of hand, but then they always do, don't they, when we're all involved. We may not go about it in the most efficient manner, but we get the job done. Nefret turned to look at him. You will keep that in mind, I hope. If you ever do this to me again, or you to me, what in God's name were you thinking of, letting him take you to that place? Letting him... I didn't let him do very much. How much? Nefret's cheeks were crimson. Stop talking like some damned ancient Roman. Are you suggesting that my so-called virtue is worth more than your life? I'd have done anything, anything to trap him. Did you? What would you do if I said yes? Ah. Oh. Ramses let his breath out. You didn't. I don't know that I could have accepted that. I'd have had to spend the rest of my life trying to make it up to you. Groveling gets to be hard on the knees after a year or two. 
How good it was to hear them arguing again. However, there was a good deal more I wanted to know. How did you know it was Percy? It? Nefret gave me a quizzical look and laughed. I didn't know what he was or what he was trying to do. But when he began praising Ramses to all and sundry, I knew he was up to no good. And when he had the infernal gall to come round smirking and fawning at me, as if I would be naive enough ever to trust him again, I got really angry and frightened. I was aware that Ramses was playing Wardani and that David was backing him up, that Mr. Russell was party to the scheme and that it was horribly dangerous. But I didn't realise how dangerous until that night after the opera. She broke off, biting her lip. She was still holding Ramsay's hand. He raised the other hand and brushed her cheek lightly with his fingertips. That was all. But it was enough to assure me that they had come to terms with that misunderstanding and others. I had pretended I didn't know how badly he was hurt, she went on unsteadily. I did, though. I always do. You arranged it very cleverly, all of you. But when the professor came up with that ingenuous lie about sending Ramses to Zawyat, I understood what you were doing. And of course I recognised David that evening, even with Aunt Amelia doing her damnedest to distract me by wriggling and squirming. I tried to keep out of the way to make it easier for you. My dear girl, I said, much moved as I recalled several small incidents that had meant nothing to me at the time. Your deliberate and, if I may say so, uncharacteristic obtuseness did make it easier for us. But it must have been horribly difficult for you. Yes, Nefret said simply. She gave her lover, for so I must call him, a tender look, and he smiled at her. Even the distortion of his classic features could not spoil the sweetness of that smile. I didn't understand fully why it was so important that no one else should know, Nefret continued. But what else could I do but play along, since that was what you wanted? I am filled with admiration for your forbearance and fortitude, I exclaimed. It was high time, don't you think? I had to prove to you and to myself that I'd learnt my lesson. Underneath, I was wild with worry. I encouraged Percy, since that was the only thing I could think of to do. But it wasn't until after our encounter with Farouk that it dawned on me that Percy might be the traitor Farouk had proposed to betray. From whom else could Farouk have learnt about the house in Mardi? I had no proof, though. So you set out to get it, I said. Good gracious, my dear, it was very courageous of you. If somewhat foolhardy. Not as foolhardy as you might think, Nefret insisted. I knew he was completely unscrupulous and vicious, but so long as he believed I was attracted to him, I was in no danger. It didn't take much to make him believe it. My money was the chief attraction, of course, and the only way he could get at that was through marriage. So I didn't think he would... Think, Ramses repeated... His voice was glacial. Nefret looked from him to Emerson and got no help there. His chin was jutting out and his face was turning red. You understand, Aunt Amelia, she cried. You'd have done the same. Emerson could contain himself no longer. Would? She did do the same. Straight into the lion's den, armed with a parasol and that damnable self-assurance of hers. I suppose you thought he wouldn't take advantage, Peabody. It wasn't the same at all, I exclaimed. No, said Ramses, in an oddly muffled voice. He didn't want to marry you. Are you laughing at your mother, Ramses? I demanded. I'm trying not to. It hurts when I laugh. He did, though. I gave Emerson an approving nod. His little outburst had cleared the air wonderfully. So, I said, after Ramses had stopped laughing and Nefret had tenderly wiped the blood from his cut lip, how did you find out about the old palace? 
She sat back on her heels. From Sylvia Gorst. That, Aunt Amelia, dear, was another of my penances, making it up with Sylvia. You'd have been proud of me if you'd seen how I apologised and fawned on her. She's the worst gossip in Cairo, and I felt certain that if she knew anything to Percy's discredit, I could get it out of her. He'd never taken her to his little love nest. He only took married women. He assumed they wouldn't talk about it for fear of blemishing their reputations. But of course they did, in strictest confidence, to their closest friends. Sylvia pretended to be shocked, but it was such a juicy bit of scandal she couldn't keep it to herself. So I confronted Percy with the information. First he denied the whole thing. I'd expected that and was prepared for it. Eventually I convinced him that I understood about men having special needs and... Ramsay, stop gritting your teeth. Your lip is bleeding again. Perhaps you'd better um, edit your narrative, Nefret, I suggested. I understand how you went about persuading him to take you there. That was the afternoon you came home late for dinner. I could see you had had an unpleasant experience. I turned bright red like some silly schoolgirl, Nefret muttered. I could feel my face burning. It had its unpleasant moments, but I didn't let him... It's all right, Ramsay said softly. I'm sorry. Unselfconsciously, she bent her bright head and kissed the hand she clasped. I never was in real danger. I know how to defend myself, and I had my knife. It was a wasted afternoon, though... He never left me alone for a moment. I didn't even see the rest of the house. Only the bedroom. Nefret, I said quickly, it's not necessary to say more. Your sacrifice, for it was nothing less, my dear, whatever happened or did not happen, was not in vain. I doubt we could have got directions from poor David. He was in no condition to converse at length. Yes, as Ramsay's wisely remarked, we work well as a family. Perhaps we've all learned a valuable lesson from this experience. Emerson's expression indicated that he doubted such was the case. Before he could mar the felicity of the occasion by expressing that doubt, I went on. Ramses should rest now. Good night, my dear boy. In case I neglected to mention it earlier, I love you, and I am very proud of you. Leaning over him... I found an unmarked spot on his face and kissed him. Uh, quite, said Emerson emphatically. Thank you, said Ramses, wide-eyed and red-faced. Nefret rose in a single graceful movement. She came to me and put her hand on my shoulder and kissed me on the cheek. Turning to Emerson, she stood on tiptoe and kissed him too as she had done when she was a girl. Good night, mother, she said softly. Good night, father. My dear Emerson was so overcome, I had to lead him from the room. The door closed behind us, and I heard the key turn in the lock. Emerson must have heard it too, but he was in such a state of emotion we'd almost reached our room before he reacted. Here, yeah, he exclaimed, coming to a dead stop. What did she... What are they... You heard her. I would think you'd be pleased. Pleased? I've waited half my life to hear her call me father. I suppose she felt she couldn't until she'd earned the right by... Good God, Peabody. She locked the door. She isn't fit. Really, my dear, I don't think you are in a position to determine that. I tugged at him, and he let me draw him into our room and push him into a chair. After considering the matter for a moment, I went back to the door and locked it. They're going to be married, aren't they? Emerson inquired anxiously. When we get back to England... Oh, Emerson, don't be absurd. They'll be married as soon as I can make the arrangements. I don't suppose she'll want a conventional wedding dress. 
I began unfastening my gown. One of those lovely robes of hers, perhaps, I continued thoughtfully. Fatima will insist on making the cake. Flowers from our garden, if the camel left any. A small reception here afterwards, uh, for our closest friends. We will hold the ceremony in David's room, if he's not able to be out of bed. They will both want him to be present. Neither of them cares much about the formalities. It was clear from Emerson's expression that he cared more than I would have supposed. He started up from his chair. "'They aren't married yet!' he exclaimed. "'Good heavens, Amelia, how can you allow your daughter... "'Oh, Emerson!' "'I put my arms round him and hid my face against his breast. "'They love one another so much, and they've been so unhappy.' <laughs> "'said Emerson. "'Well, but if it's only a matter of a few days... "'Do you remember a night on the dear old Filey, "'the night you asked me to be your wife?' "'Of course I remember, although,' Emerson said musingly, "'there is still some doubt in my mind as to who asked whom. "'Am I never to hear the end of that? "'Probably not.' said Emerson, holding me close. Do you remember what happened later that night? How could I ever forget? You made me the happiest of men that night, my love. I would not have had the courage to come to you. So I came to you. Did you think less of me for that? Are you blushing, Peabody? He put his hand under my chin and raised my head. No, of course you aren't. I loved you with all my heart that night, and I have loved you more every day we've been together, and I will go on loving you. Um, <coughs> did you lock the door? Yes. Good, said Emerson. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript. H. Nefret pushed Seshat out onto the balcony. For a breathtaking moment, she stood silvered by the moonlight before she closed the shutters and came back to him. First thing tomorrow morning, I'm going to speak to Rais Hassan about having the Amelia ready for us when we return in April, she announced. Is it Mother or Seshat you want to avoid? Both of them. All of them. She laughed softly and turned her face into his shoulder. I'm afraid the poor dears were scandalized when I shut them out. People of their generation would never violate the conventions in this way. His voice muffled by her hair. Ramses murmured ambiguously. He'd learned never to make a dogmatic pronouncement about either of his parents. I don't care, Nefret whispered. I don't care about anything except being with you. Always. Forever. We've lost so much time. If I'd only... Nefret. Darling. He took her face between his hands. It was too dark to see her features, but he felt the wetness on her cheeks. Never say that again. Never think it. Perhaps we had to go through the bad times in order to earn... Good gad, you sound just like Aunt Amelia. She kissed him fiercely on the lips. He tasted blood, and so must she have done, for she lifted her head. I'm sorry, I hurt you. Yes, and you're dripping tears all over my face. Stop it at once. Mother would also say that the secret of happiness is to enjoy the present without regretting the past or worrying about the future. I know she would. I've heard her say it at least a dozen times. Does this seem an appropriate time to talk about your mother? You were the one who... I know. I wish I hadn't. I love her with all my heart, but I won't let her or anyone else come between us now. My dearest girl... She'll hustle us into a church as soon as she can make the arrangements. 
Not more than two days, if I know mother. Oh, well. In that case, perhaps you'd prefer that I leave and not come back until after... Just try it. I've learned my lesson, too. Someday I will. So you can crush me in your arms and overpower me, Nefret said dreamily. I think I'd like that. So would I. Give me a few more days. She let out a little cry of distress and pulled away. I keep forgetting. Your poor face and your poor back and your poor hands and... I keep forgetting, too. Come here. She moved lightly into his embrace, and he smoothed the silky hair away from her face and kissed her temples and brows and closed eyes. Uh, you did lock the door, didn't you? Yes, my love. Good, said Ramses. That concludes this excerpt from Manuscript H. The following is an excerpt from Letter Collection B. Dearest Leah, we'll be with you shortly after you receive this. We sail from Alexandria in two days' time. I've so much to tell you, I'm fairly bursting with it. But I can't do the subject justice in a letter. So why am I writing? It's because I want you to be the first to whom I sign myself with fondest love, Nefret Emerson. That ends that excerpt from Letter Collection B. The End You've been listening to He Shall Thunder in the Sky by Elizabeth Peters, narrated by Barbara Rosenblatt. If you've enjoyed this book and this performance, Recorded Books recommends Moment of Truth by Lisa Scottolini, also narrated by Barbara Rosenblatt, and Poison by Catherine Harrison, narrated by Barbara Caruso. You'll find a wide selection of titles in the Recorded Books catalogue, including bestsellers, mysteries, classics, histories, and more. So to order another recorded book, or for a copy of our latest listing, please call us using the toll-free number found on the back of the book. You can order by phone with any major credit card, or by writing to us, or by faxing us. Don't forget to ask about easy 30-day rentals by mail. On our website, you can browse the catalogue, hear about the latest releases, place orders or tune into narrator profiles and author interviews. So visit us there at www.recordedbooks.com. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader. <laughs>